Thank you. 
Good morning, afternoon, evening. Hello, everyone. How are you? Uh, wherever you are, thank you very much for tuning in. Um, my name is Simon Scriver. Uh, I am going to be your host here on stream two uh, for the day. So, so you're stuck with me for the next six hours. Um, but you're very welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. I know everyone is going through very difficult, strange, um, unusual times. Um, and I hope you're all managing OK. I hope you're all getting through it. Um, I know it's a mixed bag of emotions uh, for me and, and for my loved ones. So um, so thank you for making time for us today. 
Really appreciate you tuning in. Um, so let me just, uh, I'm gonna spend a few minutes talking you through um, what today looks like and and as I suppose how this works if you've never been to a Fundraising Everywhere event or an FE Plus event before, uh, just to just to show you around your room, if I will. Um, and so so you're, you're watching this on fundraisingeverywhere.com, I presume. Uh, we've set up a side live stream uh, on YouTube as well, just in case um, there's any technical issues we're expecting. Uh, a few thousand people here today. And so, you know, obviously the whole internet is beginning to break uh, as so many people start to do video calls and stuff that they haven't done before. Um, and so there might be some slowdown, there might be, you know, who knows what happens online. Um, so just if you're facing any problems with your uh, stream or with what, what you're watching, just try refreshing your browser. Um, and then worst case scenario, if anything goes wrong, we'll drop you an email uh, or we'll send you across to YouTube or something uh, like that. So what have we got to get through today? Um, well, let me think. First of all, the first thing I have to do is just thank everyone um, that has been involved. Uh, everyone has been so, so good to us. Let me bring up um, some of the people who have helped make this happen. So obviously salesforce.org um, um, have sponsored us through this, have partnered with us to, to make this happen. Um, and they have just been amazing. They have just been totally um, um, on the ball with us and just really, really helpful. And actually all these people here that you can see, the Resource Alliance Institute of Fundraising, uh, the Fundraising Association of Austria, Chronicle of Philanthropy, Third Sector Magazine, uh, EFA, Michelle Flynn Coaching, Charity Digital, um, and then the face-to-face -face Congress, which is still currently scheduled for November. Um, all of these people have gone out their way, um, you know, really worked their butts off uh, to prepare content, to help us get stuff and send it across. You know, this whole conference was only conceived, well, a week or two ago. Um, so for all these speakers to come together, really amazing speakers um, and everyone behind the scenes making this happen, we're just really, really grateful that, that people are coming together. And I suppose that's one of the lovely, beautiful things about um, these strange times around COVID-19 is I found people being, you know, especially uh, caring, especially helpful, um, and and especially generous with their time and knowledge and everything. So it's been wonderful. Um, I can see in the chat box, so there's a chat box below on the Fundraising Everywhere site. Um, you can go into that. You can log in or go in as a guest and chat to other people around the world. I saw people from Moscow, hello. I saw people from South Africa. Um, people from all over Europe, all over Ireland. I saw people speaking Irish in this. So that was great. Um, so that's lovely. So please do go ahead and chat. You are in room two. Um, and above this video, you will see a link to room one. Room one, over in room one, is my um, co-founder of Fundraising Everywhere, is Nikki Bell. If you don't know Nikki Bell, she's amazing. And you're going to enjoy watching her much more than you enjoy watching me. Um, but she's over there hosting all the sessions on, on stream one. But I will be with you here on stream two. You can flick backwards and forwards as much as you want. Um, and so depending on what sessions you want to get, they'll be there. But remember, you get access to all of the downloads um, and all of the recordings after this. So within um, 24 hours after this finishes, we will send you access to uh, everything. Some of it might come through next week, but most of it will be available within 24 hours. So don't worry if you miss anything. Don't worry you know, about what's going on on the others, others track, the other stream. Um, you'll be able to get access to all of that. And again, thanks to all of our partners um, for allowing us to provide all of this. It's been really, really good. What else do I have to say? Yeah, so if you're not uh, familiar with fundraising ever again, we have some uh, video networking rooms as well. Um, if you if you get bored of the stream, you're not going to, but if you get bored of the stream, if you get sick of my face, uh, you can go over to fundraisingeverywhere.com slash rooms. Uh, we have some networking rooms there. We have Salesforce Corner, um, and there'll be some uh, Salesforce representatives in and out of there throughout the day. So if you want to chat to anyone from Salesforce about what they do and how helpful um, their .org site has been through all of this, then please do head over to fundraisingeverywhere.com slash rooms during this or after. They're always open, so you can always um, pop in. I think that's it. I'm going to bring on, um, in a second, uh, Leanne from Salesforce, um, because she's been really supportive of this, and she's just going to tell us a little bit about what Salesforce does um, uh, and how they're helping at this time. And then in about three and a half minutes, we're going to be popping across um, to the opening plenary. The opening plenary is going to be uh, from Louise Chester, and she's going to be talking about mindfulness at work and especially you know mindfulness and resilience and just kind of uh, self-care at this time is especially important um so i'm actually going to be like fully submerging myself in this session um and i might not come back afterwards so there we go um so let me see if uh, uh leanne is around i'm going to pull in leanne uh and there she is hello leanne hi simon how are you doing you all right 
thank you. I'm good. Thank you. Yeah. Are you managing through all this on a personal level? How are you surviving? Yeah, good, good. I mean, I'm adapting to the new normal. I think we all are. Um, yeah. And just looking to looking forward, looking to the future. But yeah, yeah doing well. well that's good. Yeah, I mean, I think everyone seems to be adapting. Um, well, they have to adapt, don't they? Uh, we don't yeah. really have a choice, and so that's been um, that's been helpful. Uh, and how's Salesforce getting on? How are you guys coping in general? I mean, I have to say um, the response from from our leadership team, from our CEO Mark Benioff, has been incredible. I think everyone seems to feel really, really supported in, in what we're doing, um, and and it's been a big change. So the, the change now is really just figure out how we can support the the, the sector. And not to think of commercial goals, you know, how do we support the sector and help everyone get through this? So great, great leadership um, and then the right messages to, you know, make sure that we're, we're focused on um, the positives. Yeah, well, that makes sense. I mean, you guys are always pretty on the ball in terms of the nonprofit sector, in terms of how you donate time, how you donate money and things like that. So is this um, is this a huge change for you to be coming come, kind of coming out and supporting charities? Are there unusual challenges and, and, and clients coming to you with stuff? that's brand new to you guys? Well, I mean, the, the innovation that's coming out is, is incredible. Um, supporting the nonprofit sector is not new. We've been doing that since Salesforce was set up 20 years yeah. ago. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, some people might know that we, we um, from the inception of Salesforce, the, the pioneering approach was the 111 model. Um, yeah. And so that is, 1% of our time is given to the nonprofit sector and that's that's equated so far to 4.8 million hours of volunteering. Jeez, uh, 1% of our profit, so we give out grants and about just over $300 million in grants have been given out over that time. Um, and then the other important one is our product. So we give 1% of our product. Um, every nonprofit around the world can get access to 10 free licenses um, as a way wow. to, to give back. And so today we support just over 45,000 nonprofits. Um, and I work in salesforce.org um, and so salesforce.org is really just the it's the it's the social impact center of Salesforce. We call it the heart of Salesforce. Mm. So we're the specific team that that um, provides technology and partnerships to nonprofits, education institutions, philanthropic organizations, and there's an amazing community out there. You know, the, the people on the call today are part of it. I think we're over three and a half thousand people registered. Wow. Um, but the innovation time is the big thing. You know, everyone's trying to figure out how to work from home, of course, and how to deliver services and still fundraise. Um, but the 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 sort of the new normal and the new demand for trying to do things in different ways has really brought some fantastic ideas and innovation, particularly from the sector. Yeah, well, that's great to see. And you guys, as always, you seem to be kind of towards the front of that innovation. You always seem to be getting mixed up in it. Um, and we really appreciate you, you making this happen, you know, making this event today happen, which is, I suppose, slightly innovative and, and definitely has impressed me how quickly everyone's come together. Um, so thank you very much for being involved, Leanne. Thank, no, thank you. And you know what we wanted to do was figure out how could we quickly um, put something in place that would support the global community. And mm -hmm. I think we've also the LinkedIn posts about I've worked from home for ten years. Give, let me give you some advice. You know, lots yeah. of that data out there. Um, but what what can we do that's tangible and, and can really bring together um, you know some, some leadership, some insights, some resources? Because um, there's so many different types of nonprofit out there, and everyone is facing um, different challenges, similar challenges. So, and um, we hope that by bringing together all these these topics and all of the content, we'll, we'll give some positivity and, and and some really positive direction, so we can all get through this together. So, I think the last comment I would make is, let's get through this together. Um, we're here to help. We stand with the sector, um, and so if there's anything else that we you know we could help with, whether that's thought leadership, sponsorship. Mm. Um, have some innovative ideas around technology, then uh, please let us know. That's thank you well, to yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you so much. And thanks to all, all the attendees and everyone um, um, for um, for being in here. So I hope you stick around for the day, Leanne, um, and we'll chat to you again. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to head across now to our opening plenary. So I'm going to say goodbye to you, Leanne. Look after Bye, everyone. Um, so over to our opening plenary, which is starting straight away. And this is Louise Chester um, from the Potential product uh, Project. Here we go. Hello. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining this incredible conference. I'm here to talk to you today about how we can be more resilient and also how we can connect with each other better and than ever, despite this extraordinary environment we find ourselves in. So I'm Louise Chester of Potential Project. We are the world's leading provider of um, performance, resilience, and innovation training, all based around our research around the mind. 
And today I'm really going to dig into how we can all um, use uh, insights, tools and techniques to be more resilient and connected in the best possible way. So first of all, what I'd like to do is invite you to just connect in with yourself. So maybe closing your eyes for a moment and choosing to let go of the business of the day so far and any thoughts of the day ahead. Take your awareness from your head down into your body and start to notice what it feels like as you connect in with yourself. Notice the contact of your feet with the floor. It is the contact of the chair, of your clothing. And start to be aware of your breathing. Notice the tide of the breath in and out of the body. And taking the next five breaths or so, scan the body on the in-breath. And relax as best you can on the out-breath. And if you haven't done so already, maybe you'll close your eyes as you do this. And now incline towards yourself with a, a warmth and a curiosity and ask yourself, how am I feeling right now? And not that, how are you, that we exchange with people in the corridor when we're in a rush and we're not really waiting for the answer, but ask yourself again, you know, really, how am I right now? And wait for the answer. And then slowly release the practice and open your eyes. How are you feeling? This is a word cloud that we prepared earlier from a range of programs that we've been running recently. Maybe some of those words on there resonate with what you found for yourself. What's so interesting is, is often there are several almost conflicting experiences that we're having at the same time. We might be tired, but we're also calm. We might be anxious, but also relaxed. We're worried, but there's a peacefulness there as well. So what we're gonna explore is, is how we can hold these experiences, these often paradoxical experiences in a, in a wider ocean of awareness. So you've checked in with yourself now. After this, I wanted to just share with you a little parable, the parable of the second arrow. It's something that I found incredibly helpful. I've been um, doing this work for many years now, but that doesn't mean that challenges, big challenges don't come up in my life too. And I had a particularly big one last year and uh, wasn't really sure whether I was gonna be able to even get through it actually. Um, but I was able to remember um, some things from, uh, from my teachers. Um, and those are the things that I really want to share with you today. Because I think we're all facing incredibly challenging times in one way or another. So if we think about um, our experience of our life um, from our mind, our mind that creates our reality, we're experiencing um, the first arrow often of, uh, of an experience that is unavoidable Currently, I think we can probably say top of that list is the coronavirus, but it might be other things as well. So this is our experience, this is our reality. But interestingly, there's a second arrow, and that's an arrow that is mind-made. Yes, it's really important that we experience the emotions that are um, you know, the right ones for an experience we're having. So fear, anxiety, frustration. Yes, we absolutely want to to have those experiences and, uh, and they are appropriate. But so often with our, with our mind, with our mind-made arrows, 
we have those experiences and we continue with them and we go down a rabbit hole with them and we start to catastrophize, we start to ruminate. And we find that these uh, second arrows are really the ones that we are causing pain to ourselves, uh, which go often way beyond the arrow of the reality. What we attend to in every moment is our reality. Where we focus our mind, it's almost like it's a spotlight. Where we focus our mind is what we see, what we experience. So if we're focusing on you know, our, our Twitter feed, what's going on on social media, um, the news, um, the fall in the stock market, you know, worries about our health, about the virus, about you know, how life is going to be in the future, what happens is, is that that becomes our reality. There are other things going on as well, which are positive. You know, we are able to um, often enjoy um, a, a walk, um, out in, in nature or some time uh, with our family. Um, we also have um, a really important job to do with the work that we're doing more now than ever, especially if we're going to be um, helping others uh, with what we're doing. Um, the problem is, is that the, the, the mind is, is, is like, um, it's like Velcro for the negative. Um, one of the reasons why we're the most successful species on this planet is because we're hardwired to scan for danger all the time. And that's what we're doing when we're placing our attention on the negative. And this is the area that, um, that, that we really can get stuck, up, stuck in um, as though our mind is Velcro for these negative events. And our mind is kind of Teflon for the positive. You know, we might notice a beautiful flower or a smile from a friend or member of our family but that it's it's almost like our brain doesn't really fix on that and, and and lock in that experience so i wanted to ask you now just to take a moment to reflect on one activity or thought that's probably not helping you these days and i think uh, there'll be quite a few of them um, but I think the media and, uh, and events um, that are, are fed to us through, through the media channels, um, it seems to be one that's really coming up very strongly. Um, that activity just doesn't seem to be helping us when we, we experience that in, uh, you know, in, 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 and, and allow it to pervade too much of our day. But I'm sure there's many other things that you can think of. And then I'd like you to think of one thing that would be helpful for you to give more attention to. And now I'm going to really share with you some ideas about how you can actually um, become the master of your own mind so that actually those helpful activities and experiences um, can become uh, the areas that you get hooked on, the areas that you can actually allow to uh, resource you during your day rather than the more negative. Because actually resilience can start in the mind. You absolutely can be the calm at the eye of the storm, both for yourself and for others. So let's test your resilience now, shall we? I want to ask you to think of one thing, um, something very simple, maybe, um, a colour, your favourite colour or your pet or something that's just not too complicated to think about. And I'm going to ask you to focus your attention on that one thing just for 30 seconds. And if you notice that your mind has become distracted, just maybe raise your index finger to yourself just to, to mark that distraction. I'm going to mind the time. Let's go. 30 seconds starting now.
Okay, your 30 seconds are up. So most people, when we ask them uh, to do this test, um, realize how much the mind wanders and how distracted we are. Maybe this sounds a little bit like your day. You're at your new work workstation and trying to um, be on a webinar with colleagues or finish that proposal that you need to get off uh, to some high net worth individuals. And actually you're thinking about, oh my goodness, um, is there any food for lunch? Um, when am I gonna take some time off to feed, feed the kids? Or you might be thinking I've got an, an aged parent who, who needs me uh, to collect some food for them and when am I going to do that? So maybe you're not able to give your full attention um, to the job at hand. And so you're not able to get into flow and do that deep work um, and frustration can come in. So there's a, a second arrow there of frustration um, at yourself. Then of course you're having lunch, um, but is your mind really on the food? Is it on who you're with, who you're having lunch with? Or are you thinking, oh my goodness, you know, what is the weather going to be like later on this afternoon? When should I take that, that walk I'm allowed to take? And um, am I gonna get a chance to? And you know, my, uh, you know, is it going to rain? So you're, you're thinking ahead um, to this walk and you're, you're kind of spoiling this, this downtime that you've given yourself, which is probably a very short amount of time. We're all feeling so very pressured at the moment and taking some time off can make us feel very guilty. It shouldn't, but it, but it does. You're on the walk, but then where is your mind? Your mind is back at your workstation, at your desk, either at the uh, circling back to the, uh, the webinar where you were distracted earlier or, or thinking of, of what you've got to get done later. The problem is, is, is our mind is depleting us throughout our day and more so than ever when we're in these extraordinary situations and times that we find ourselves now. One of the problems is, is we have a default mindset. This is, um, this is where we trend to um, most of the time unless we train our mind and to, uh, to be different. Um, it's a wandering mind. It's a mind that gets hooked on negativity and it's a mind that can get easily unbalanced. What we can do though is, is we can train our minds to be much more resilient to be present, to be able to unhook from um, adverse um, experiences and, and emotions and to rebalance so that we can bounce back from setbacks and be ultra resilient as much as we can through our day. And the way we do this is by training our mind in a certain way. And we did that at the beginning of this session when we became present with our body, with our uh, sensations in our body with the with the breath and then noticing what feelings were present for us when we choose to place our attention on one thing in particular we start to train presence our mind wanders we notice the distraction we bring our attention back we build gray matter in the prefrontal cortex that executive function that enables us to focus on the right things to make the right decisions to get the right things done and we train in awareness, that ability, and there's areas of the brain that enable us to, to be master of our own mind. And what we're doing is, is we're training presence, we're training unhooking from the negative, and we're training rebalancing ourselves. So let's try this again very quickly, now that we know what we're doing. So again, close your eyes, and drop your awareness into the body, noticing your feet on the floor, noticing the support of the chair, and choosing now to place your attention fully on your breathing, either in the nose or in the belly. You're choosing to get present just with one thing. And for the next 10 breaths or so, keeping your attention as best you can on the sensation of breathing. And every time your mind wanders, see if you can unhook your mind from that distraction and bring your attention back.
and releasing the practice. So even in that short practice, you've rewired your brain slightly and exercised areas of the brain that really help with presence and with unhooking. So increasing your resilience already. And as well as this, mindfulness can help in so many other ways. Not only can it help to have a greater ability to face adversity, but it can help with sleep quality, decrease stress, and a reduced negativity bias. So many different pieces of research now um, that are peer reviewed um, that show uh, that training our mind um, in this way can really enhance our resilience and enable us to to have a to optimize ourselves as best we can and increase our happiness, profound happiness, and our ability to be of service um, in our lives. So if you'd like to practice this more, um, you can download the Potential Project app. Um, just look in the App Store. Um, you'll see a Potential Project there. Um, and there's another couple of things that you can do as well. Is One is, is just press that pause button every now and then through the day. Most of the time we get so gripped in um, you know, what's going on um, on our screen, on our computer, in our inbox. Um, we get caught in fight or flight and our um, and tunnel vision, our peripheral vision goes. So see if you can schedule in some times in the day to just pause, come off autopilot reaction, stand up, you know, shake, shake, shake things out as though you're a, a, a duck that's just had a, a little to do with another, a uh, little fight with another duck on the pond. Uh, you see them have this little um, contretemps, and then afterwards they they swim away. They shake their feathers and and they they swim off serenely. So shake out that cortisol um, and uh, stand up, look out the window, see if you can get a little bit of a more spacious outlook. Um, on your day. And another thing you can do is really look to connect with yourself and with others with compassion. So when you connect in with yourself, how am I feeling? Just incline towards yourself with a little bit of warmth and compassion. So pause and get present with yourself. And then when you're with others, do the same. We are in this together. You are not alone. And the more we can affiliate with others, the more we can actually have the mammalian soothing um, hormone of oxytocin released into our bloodstream, which can help balance out the stress hormones of adrenaline and cortisol. So you, we're, the more we can connect with each other on a really deep and meaningful level, whereby we can be truly honest with each other and, and share our feelings um, in a safe environment, the more we can create that for ourselves and others, um, the more that we can connect. And so making social distancing, although it's a physical thing, let's not make it an emotional thing as well. So whether it's with your colleagues, with your family, with your clients, with your donors, see if you can continue to have that emotional um, presence with them um, that enables that deep connection. And also, and you're very good at this, all of you, but, and this is your jobs, but ask yourself, how can I help others? Because actually, when we are kind to others, when we bring compassion, which is empathy for their situation, plus the intention of wanting to, to, to alleviate that suffering, it can be incredibly resourcing for us. That sense of agency, whether we can actually do something or not, that comes from that intention, setting that intention um, can really benefit us. So I wanted to say thank you very much um, for your attention and your presence during this time together. Enjoy the rest of the webinars this afternoon. Um, I think you all do an amazing job. I am so grateful and privileged to be here to kick it off for you and share some ideas and, and some tools and, and techniques and, and insights that, that might help you through these challenging times. Keep up the amazing work you do. Um, and I look forward to connecting with you all at another time in the future. Thank you. Hello, awesome humans. I uh, hope you're doing well, um, considering. Sounds like a really trite thing to say in the circumstances, but I hope you're all um, fair enough as well as possible. Um, 
My name is Wayne Murray. I'm Strategy Director at Audience Fundraising and Communications. Um, I'm just going to spend some time today talking about how you can pivot or kind of re-pivot your strategy um, based on what's going on with the current crisis. Please excuse my cat who's making noises in the background there. Uh, maybe he'll make a surprise visit. Hello, Ed. Um, so, um, my name's Wayne. Um, I'm strategy director um, at Audience. Um, Audience is uh, an agency that works solely with uh, the charity sector. Um, we are a creative and strategy agency, so we think and we do. Um, I head up on the strategy side of things, so the thinky stuff. Um, so my focus is predominantly on strategy, innovation, product development, um, overarching propositions, um, that sort of jazz, really. Um, I've been in the charity sector for over 20 years in fundraising, communications uh, and brands. So charity side roles, I've been the head of individual giving at Amnesty International. Uh, I've been director of fundraising and communications at Prisoners Abroad. Uh, and I've been head of fundraising and brand um, at Refugee Action. And charity sides uh, work with over a hundred um, charities, um, helping them to uh, transform, um, to do things better, uh, and to uh, scale up when when needed. I suppose the golden thread that's gone through the last sort of three or four jobs that I've had um, have been organisations that want to make um, quite a dramatic step change. Um, so that's kind of what I specialise in and what I focus on. Um, recently, um, we've been doing a lot of work uh, and a lot of blogs that some of you may have seen about how the sector has to has to change. Uh, and my goodness, over the last couple of weeks, we've seen some quite dramatic um, changes um, going on. So um, I just want to talk about the sort of strategy side of things. Um, and sorry if this is a, a bit shonky, I'm having to do this on my phone because my um, video capability on my laptop is kaput. Um, so that's really great timing, isn't it? Um, so to sort of set the scene, when things really started to kick off um, with the virus, the first thing that I did was really just um, talk to charities, talk to as many charities um, as I could. Um, I think it's really important at the moment that charities keep lines of communication um, as open um, as they possibly can. Uh, and a few things struck me quite immediately uh, in terms of the mood of the, the sector, as it were, um, in that there was a lot of confusion. Um, a lot of that confusion was around the fact that this situation that we're in now doesn't seem to um, be something that's going to end um, anytime soon. Um, and obviously that led to a lot of worry throughout the sector, quite understandably. Um, and I suppose my biggest fear when I was talking to um, what turned out to be over 100 organisations over the last sort of week and a half um, was that there would be two kind of polar opposite responses um, from the sector. Um, at one end of the scale, there would be um, a lot of knee jerking and a lot of decisions made really quickly that perhaps weren't um, the best or the most strategic decisions. Um, and then at the other end of the spectrum about um, kind of almost lockdown or hibernation for the sector, especially with um, different ways of working and re remote working and people getting to grips with um, technology that perhaps they've not um, used before. Um, and after hearing a range of these issues uh, and backed up on all of the ongoing conversations that we've been having over the last sort of six months or so with a range of charities in terms of what's going on in the sector, what needs to change, um, where we need to get to, what is the roadmap for how we get from where we are now to where we need to be. It sort of crystallised a lot of my thinking. Um, I'm not saying that I'm right or that I have any of the, the answers. I don't think anyone has any of the answers at the moment, but um, what we do have is a lot of kind of similar issues that a lot of organisations are facing and a, and a similar mindset. Um, so I pulled together sort of 10, well, it's actually 11, it's really annoying, I hate that when that happens, um, 11 points to kind of keep some kind of 
focus and, and momentum. Um, and we're going to focus on um, sort of short term, medium term and long term as well. Though obviously don't hold me to ransom for any of the long term kind of predictions or, or thoughts that I have because things are changing on an hour by hour basis. Um, so it's sort of like a roadmap for different organisations in terms of their thinking as well as their doing will be at different um, points uh, or different steps of that roadmap as well. So I, sp I suppose the first point, point number one, is to kind of, charities need to have an acceptance, um, at a, a sort of unilateral in, in internal acceptance that your current strategy is redundant. Um, it sounds really obvious, but there's still a lot of charities that I've been speaking to that think it's going to be business as usual again quite soon. And it, it won't. Um, and also, I'm not really sure what business as usual is going to look like in the future as well. So the landscape has completely shifted um, and organisations need to kind of pivot their strategy um, quite a lot. Uh, and it doesn't mean that you need to have all of the answers. I think you just need to um, acknowledge internally that things have most definitely changed. Um, if there isn't consensus all around um, within your organization, then there needs to be, and there needs to be quickly. Um, and I think the single most important thing that you can do now is to get everyone pointing. Sorry, my cat's just come to say hello. Say hello, Ed. Right, make your dinner soon, off you pop. Um, the single most important thing that you can do now is get everyone internally pointing in the right direction uh, because from that you can you can build a way forward so that's point number one uh, point number two and this is kind of where i'd say sort of 60 percent of the organizations i'm speaking to at the moment are is you need to work out what has changed and the single most important place um, to start with that is in terms of the the financials and have a really clear understanding of what different scenarios could look like for your organization going forward. Um, even worst case scenarios are really helpful if you have a really clear head um, when you're approaching them. Um, I always find that the, the knowns and especially the, the financial knowns um, are easier to deal with than, than unknowns. Um, so the advice that we've been given to a lot of charities at the moment is particularly from a financial planning point of view is that you've really got to have a good hard look at what's in place or was in place for the for the next 12 months and strip out an awful lot of activity and finance um, so that would be um, at the moment the big ones are kind of retail um, events uh, face to face and a lot of direct dialogue channels strip all those out and get a really clear understanding of what your potential deficits are because once you know that um, you can start to kind of focus on that a bit more clearly and a lot of charities even though they're quite scary and substantial numbers floating around um, actually knowing what those numbers are um, is one of the first steps to kind of to, to, to sort them out and stepping forward um, and then moving on from that point three um, and this, I've been speaking to a lot of um, boards and um, especially trustee groups as well, is that you really have to just focus on the important stuff um, and absolutely drop everything else. So, you know, if you're still wor worried about board reports, um, don't. Board reports can do one. Um, really, any reports or reporting um, can, can really can really stop now. The only important reports that you need to be running are the financial ones. Um, and the only sort of three things that you really need to be focusing on directly now is um, your financial plan, um, your internal comms and your external comms. They're the three most important assets um, that you have at the moment. Um, and in terms of your programs, just take a machete to absolutely everything that you can't do um, you think you can't do or that isn't working at the moment and what that will enable you to do is to free up not only time um, but also capacity and headspace um, and there are three things that you're really going to need going forward um, as we enter this 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 next phase um, point number four 
Um, I would say that it's really, really important to keep communication lines open at the moment. Um, personally, in terms of my, my well-being and my understanding uh, or, 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 or slight understanding of what's going on at the moment, lines of communication have been the single most helpful thing for me over the last week or so. So keep talking. Um, you've, you've got you know, tech hopefully set up at home now that enables you to talk to colleagues um, and, to, and to function as a remote organisation. But don't just speak to colleagues, um, speak to other organisations, speak to external agencies, you know, the issues that you're facing whilst they, there might be peculiarities to them that are specific to your organisation, there's a huge raft of issues that we're all facing uh, and we're all grappling with and trying to understand. So collectively, uh, we'll have a much better um, way of doing that and, and solutions will come quicker. Um, and, uh, and also um, our well-being um, will be better as well if we're communicating and sharing and talking through our issues, our woes, um, how we're feeling on an hour by hour basis because I don't know about you but my feelings go up and down um, with the wind almost so it's really important to uh, keep talking um, and get out of your bubble too. Um, you know I've made a, a commitment to myself um, to speak to at least one new person a day and if ever there was a time for you to kind of reach out and speak to people it's now you know the great thing about our fundraising community is that um, we're empathetic and we're really good at sharing um, so you know use that humanity that the sector has um, not just to to help you with your um, strategic planning um, and your your tactical planning um, but also with your well-being as well um, I found that really useful um, so point five this is kind of where some organizations are but not not everyone and I think what you have to do is that you need to devolve um, especially if you're a senior leader in a lot of cases you need to devolve um, a, a, a certain amount of your decision making and kind of get out of the way um, where where we're going um, and the period that we're gonna we're gonna enter now which is a period of flux really for the sector um, is that we don't we don't have the luxury of being able to have kind of convoluted sign-off processes uh, especially as things are changing quite quickly so you know in the, the organizations that have focused on um, emergency and, and, and disaster um, work both overseas and the UK are kind of quite geared up to this but a lot of other organizations have never had to, to act in this way before so you know there's some really simple things that you can do so get core messages agreed um, get an agile working group together it doesn't necessarily have to be the most senior people in the room you know it's it, it's about the people who can get the job done um, and who can actually um, make the difference. So get your working group together and, you know, in some cases, just get out of their way and let them do their job. Um, this is not about hierarchy at all. Um, this is about clarity uh, and it's about efficiency. So, um, you know, think, think in those terms as well. Um, it's really quite interesting that, you know, a lot of the seminars that I went to this year about how a lot of digital fundraising success had happened where they'd grasped onto a moment um, or you know ridden um, the the media wave for events that were happening uh, especially stuff that happened over the summer um, a lot of that happened because you know SLT were on holiday and things just had to happen so that working environment um, kind of kind of really work for those situations and it's going to really work now so think less about hierarchy and think about efficiencies um, and how you can have clarity of thought and actually get things done quickly um, the next one um, you know I'm a I'm, I'm a trustee for a, a hospice down here in Brighton um, an amazing organization and this next step is kind of where they are at the moment, so you know we're, we're all quite um, heavily involved in this. And this is about redeploying staff. You know, um, one thing that I want you all to remember is that humans are really awesome, and they're also really surprising. Um, and that goes for staff, volunteers, um, trustees. People have skills that you never knew that they had. 
Um, you know, we're, we've got um, instances with some of the clients that I'm working for at the moment and even just ones that I'm in touch with where, you know, staff are being redeployed to the front line um, where they may not have worked for years or may not have worked at all. But, you know, pointing um, staff where the need is, is greatest and people genuinely rise to that challenge. So you don't necessarily have to think of what you do as an organization based around the hierarchy that you have at the moment. What you've got is a community of people um, who are very committed to the organization, who want the organization to do well. And as things change, there's absolutely no problem in kind of trying to redeploy people um, to where that need is greatest. Um, so for example, we're seeing things of where staff are, you know, if you're cutting retail, if you're cutting community if you're cutting a lot of direct dialogue channels especially if they were internally um, managed there's capacity um, and there's uh, there's capacity for people to do things that you've never been able to do before so you know staff being redeployed to work within communications to gather stories and content um, to man your social media accounts um, as one organization at the moment who are really proud of the fact that because they've got such cover on their social media channels, they're able to respond personally to every single social message, social message, that's quite difficult to say, um, that they receive. So imagine in this climate with a lot of you know, uncertainty, but people at home and people using social media more than they probably normally do, just imagine what that personal engagement, that personal experience, people can get by up in the ante in terms of your social media monitoring can do so redeploy where possible it really does make a difference um, so now moving on from that I'm going to make a few comments on kind of short term medium term and longer term though obviously longer term there are huge caveats around um, you know we don't really know how this is all going to pan out but this is kind of I'm speaking to a lot of charities who are at different steps along this journey and kind of um, just thinking about my, my personal belief as to how this could pan out as well, just some, some ideas there. So in the short term, um, and we've seen a lot of it this week, um, both done very well and, and, and not so well, is that the focus really needs to be on the channels that you can get shit out on really, really quickly. Um, so the focus has to be email and social for the for the short term. Um, and that point about stuff changing and, and, and keeping connected, um, the same goes for your external audiences. You know, people are trapped in their homes. Um, they're, they're away from their loved ones. They're, you know, we're social animals. We're not really meant to, to live in, the, in this kind of environment and people want to be connected. So be connected. Um, to your your current audiences and your potential audiences, um, emergency appeals are are flooding out in the last week or so, and and a lot of them are doing really really well. Um, so emergency appeals are really important, but it's 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 not just a, a one a one trick pony. Um, what what we're seeing, for example, is that with some um, organizations who are sending out sort of regular emails that all have a financial ask attached to them to a, to a sort of longer and unfolding story that's happening it is for example one charity the third email brought in a hell of a lot more money than the first email so don't treat this as we've got our um, email appeal out that's it let's sit back and see how much money um, it, 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 it makes it's about a much longer story arc so just keep people connected keep um talking to people uh, about news that's breaking within your organization um be really honest about what's going on um whatever you do and i've seen a lot of this this week and this has been backed up um by um response rates as well is that don't launch appeals online appeals that are about plugging a gap uh, or an income deficit um, nobody cares about your income deficit but you know what people people don't give a shit about that what people care about um, is the impact on your services and ultimately your beneficiaries 
So you must, you know, if there's one thing that you take away from this, you, you must focus your storytelling around that and not about you as an organization. You know, people are really worried about their own finances. I'm sure there are people um, watching this who are, who are worried about their own, their own money. But the thing is, what, what we all have is that we have humanity. Um, so connect to that humanity. Um, don't just put a financial argument together about how there's going to be X amount whole um, deficit in, the, in your organisation. Focus it much more around around the commonality and the humanity that we all that we all share. Um, you know, and it's really interesting that if you see what's happened with the upscale and the rise, the the massive surge of volunteer support for the NHS is that in in crisis we shine we we really do you know the the best of us is shown so so focus on that people people really do want to help um you know there are caveats to that at the moment in terms of you know financial instability um but this is a long game so keep people keep people connected um be truthful um be relevant in terms of your messaging um and get stuff out quickly so that's in terms of the short term. As we move to towards the more medium term, then you know we can start looking at channels that have um, longer lead times and kind of how we use them. So you know, think about mail, inserts, press, um, phone, which is having um, quite a surge at the moment, which is which is great to see. So on the one hand, um, there's stuff like that that you can be be getting out. Um, but really your focus um, should be very much similar as your short-term focus so you know focus on compassion focus on shared humanity focus on the fact that you know we're all in this we're all experiencing this um, but some um, communities or um, some organizations are feeling this a lot harder um, than the the, the 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 average within the populace as well and also don't let don't let bad habits slip in terms of fundraising and communications. Um, already, I'm seeing there's a lot of stuff going out that sound that sounds really institutional. It's very us and them. Lots of um, talk about we do this and we do that. Um, you know, really old school. And the, the last thing the sector needs at the moment is to slip back into that kind of um, us and them type storytelling. Uh, what you need to focus on is the fact that. What you are as a charity is a is a sort of inclusive community of individuals who all have a role to play, and that's you know we all have a role to play within that. So give people options in in the way in which they can they they can help. Don't keep them at arm's length. You know, bring them into the fold and into the community rather than outside looking in. Um, and then in terms of longer term. Um, oh no, back up a bit as well. In terms of medium term still, as well as the activity that you're doing as well, if you have capacity um, and headspace that's been freed up from some of the activity that you're not doing, use that opportunity to focus on some like really key foundational stuff that's going to set you in really good stead going forward. So, you know, well, after the initial kind of maelstrom calms down a bit, there's going to be an opportunity to kind of reflect a bit more and to focus on kind of what the organizations need internally and externally so that could be things like you know uh, that inside piece of work that you've always wanted to do that you've never had the time um, that research that kind of overarching proposition or that that comms mapping um, for, for the year you know there's, there's stuff like that that you can kind of start focusing on not now it's the last thing anyone's thinking about at the moment but as we shift more into the sort of medium term um, and then longer term, who knows? But, you know, there's going to be some really, really key um, insights that come out of this that change um, the sector that we all work in um, forever. Um, and I think the one thing that I've got clarity on now um, is that things aren't ever going to be the same again. Um, so longer term we're going to have to think really robustly both as individual organizations but also as a sector as well um, in terms of how we how we actually structure ourselves um, how we organize um, how we 
communicate with each other, um, with other organisations, with the general public, with, with government, as we're, uh, we're finding issues with at the moment. Um, there's going to be big discussions about kind of how and where we work, you know, this remote working opportunity that we all have now um, is really going to change things and, and fundamentally um, make us rethink, I think, structurally um, how, how we work as a sector as well. You know, I, it's really interesting. I wrote a blog, what, three, four weeks ago um, about how sector leaders um, need to focus on cross-sector issues as well as their own causes. And that, you know, the ideal job description would be 50% of your time is working on transforming your organization and 50% of your time is working cross-organizationally to change the sector and civil society as a whole. And wouldn't that be a really amazing way to think of how um, sector leaders operate um, in, the, in the charity world? Um, <laughs> what's what i'm finding is that this is happening now you know i'm talking to charity leaders who are really thinking outside of their box and their organization and thinking about um the sector as a whole so whilst this is all fucking crazy at the moment um i think what it's going to do is we're on a sort of trajectory for transformational change as a sector anyway um and now we're in this time of kind of chaos and panic but what's going to come out of that is that it's going to truncate that trajectory quite significantly and I think there's going to be a lot of innovation and um, product development and brilliant things um, that, that fall out of that but obviously that's that's way away at the moment and the last thing that we, uh, we want to be thinking about right now but a nice positive for the future. Um, moving on to point number 10 um, I think it's really key that we trust and we support everyone. Um, you know, as I said, hour by hour, um, people's emotions are, are fluctuating quite drastically at the moment. Um, and this is new for absolutely everyone, from CEOs to volunteers. You know, we're all experiencing something um, that's a first. You know, there's no precedent for this. There's no um, solution. There's no off-the-shelf package that we pick up when this happens and, and roll out across the sector. Um, so connect, you know, be really flexible, look after each other, you know, um, this is a real marathon and not a sprint. So we, we all need to lean on each other and there'll be times where, you know, you're feeling quite strong and buoyant, but someone else isn't. So use that time. And, you know, alternatively, when you're feeling really low, reach out, you know, I've done it and it, it's there, there, you find solace in the most amazing and you know um weirdest of places so keep doing that um and you know my overarching thing for for this point is that you know sod hierarchy this is about humanity so you know if you're a ceo and you're struggling talk to someone you know you're not you're not on your own in an ivory tower somewhere we are all in this together um and then my final point really is to is to just remember that philanthropy will bounce back humans are amazing if you look throughout history after really awful times really great things have happened um, and whilst there are some short-term opportunities to help with fundraising and engagement you know i genuinely feel that going forward there is going to be an enormous groundswell of public support so as your personal organization as well as the sector as a whole you really need to be ready for it um you know just look around you even on my street last night with everyone clapping uh, in support for the nhs um it was incredibly touching just looking you know in my local community i'm seeing really breathtaking acts of individual and collective kindness um yeah, no, last night was amazing. My entire street was ringing to the sound of people clapping and, and cheering. Um, so just imagine what will happen when that individual kindness and empathy is, is amplified collectively. Um, you know, I keep saying it, but humans, humans are awesome. Um, and so are you and you and you and you, not you, obviously. No, I'm joking. You're, you're, you're awesome too. But keep talking breathe focus when you can and uh, no gin before 6 p.m
All right, take care. Thanks very much. Thanks, Million Wayne. Let's count how many times today I forget to turn my microphone on between sessions. Uh, my money is on six. Um, that's great from Wayne. Uh, really lovely to hear that. Such a such a um, kind of, like first two sessions were really calming for me. I don't know if I'm like particularly stressed or something, but I needed those two sessions. Uh, I'm going to bring Wayne on in a second um, to chat to him. If anyone wants to ask him any uh, direct questions, then please do um, throw them in the chat box now underneath, and I'll keep an eye. Um, and I can present them to Wayne. Um, but it's really lovely to see people talking in the chat box. We've got people uh, over the UK, um, people in North America and South America starting to wake up and starting to log on. Um, and I can see people across Europe and everything, uh, and some Irish people, so that's great. Uh, hello, everyone. I hope you're all doing well. I hope you're all managing. Um, so yeah, so let me, let me uh, get Wayne. Um, and this is interesting because I've known Wayne for a long time on Twitter, and I've never met him. So you're gonna, you're gonna, um, you're gonna actually see the live meeting. Hey, 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 Wayne. You're real. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? Yeah, good man. How are you? Yeah, you all right? You're managing? Just yeah, hour by hour. Yeah, you know, balancing work and homeschooling. Um, yeah, which is like free, free form jazz in our house at the moment. So yeah, yeah just. To, doing the best we can yeah still find your feet well i really appreciated you um being involved in this and that session really appreciated some really um human moments in it um because you oh, look like quite a quite a rugged bearded insensitive person um, yeah, I'm, but, a, I'm a renaissance man underneath yeah <laughs> underneath this rugged you know sculpted exterior definitely <laughs> well that's good um come here your your session um you said some some really interesting stuff in there and and i loved how it was so kind of realistic you know that we're humans you know you, you i think i think one of the things people are stressing out is about the expectations that's put on everyone to suddenly be a teacher to suddenly you know work from home and, and all this stuff and your session you were very much kind of talking about doing what you can do at the moment and just you know understanding that people are human and it's not it's not going to be easy for everyone yeah no absolutely and i think my approach to kind of recording this was very much this is not the time for gurus do you know what i mean this is mm. this is the time for shared humanity and collective compassion do you know what i mean and there is absolutely no blueprint for what's going on but what there is is talent and we just don't mm. know which way to point that talent at the moment or or what's expected of us. But we will work it out. And, you know, as I said, philanthropy will bounce back big time. So we kind of need to be ready for that as well. Yeah. Do you think like, I mean, obviously, I know you don't know the future, but it seems like um, this idea of people being, you know, people are always caring and generous and giving. We always had that. But it, it almost feels like this is coming, kind of going up to a whole new level where Everyone's looking out for everyone. Um, you know, so much is going out for free. So many people are just checking in, checking in with you. Do you think that's a, a permanent change? You know, in, from what you feel, do you think it's going to be like this is a good, positive change in terms of how we approach each other all together, or is it going to be business as usual one day? Uh, well, I hope it will change things. No, I'm a, mm. I'm a, I'm an idealist. I couldn't do my job if I wasn't an idealist. But I think, I think. There'll be a there'll be a definite residue of the this huge compassion that we're having now that will that will carry forward much like mm. there was after the Second World War. Do you know what I mean? That great yeah. things were built. The Human Rights Act came from that, for example. You know, yeah. there's there's a period of reflection when collectively we've gone through something that's really bloody horrible that will hopefully bind us together. I just think there's sort of stages of compassion, isn't there? Do you know what I mean? At the moment, yeah. everyone cares, but. They may not be putting their hand in their pocket because they're worried about their own finances. But you know, once that settles down, there'll be a different level of compassion, and then there'll be, yeah, you know, hopefully that's the trajectory that it'll be on. There's still uh, horrible people in the world, but you know, we, yeah, we well, we've, them, I think. we've always got that, don't we? Um, <laughs> the, there's a lot of questions in the chat box where a lot of people kind of talking about their own organization from small organizations, so people who have only um, six, five, four people, or even smaller. Um, what, do you have any initial thoughts? People like Deb in the comments box who, who are wondering what, where does small charities start? How do they manage when when they don't have this this pool of staff to draw upon? Yeah, well, I, th I think the first thing, even though it's no solace, um, is that whether you're large or whether you're small, you're still facing problems. They're just different problems. Um, so some of the larger charities, even though they may have 
massive infrastructure and uh, you know a financial safety net they're also going to hemorrhage money a lot quicker than than some of the smaller ones so it's mm. that's not that's no solace to any small charity at all but it depends what your what your yardstick is but i, t- I still believe fundamentally that there's there's a real strength with smaller charities you know and for me coming from Amnesty International, for example, to refugee action, one of the things I noticed is that you could pull everyone into a room, make a decision, come out, and things have fucking changed. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. There's something really powerful about... Very changes. nimble and fast. And... Yeah, and I think a lot of organisations, big organisations over the last sort of five years or so, to actually become agile have had to mimic the, the mechanics of a smaller organisation by having these sort of cross-organisational ninja working groups and whatever so whilst there are inherent issues that a lot of small charities are facing at the moment and my my you know my focus at the moment is with the small to medium-sized charities that's who mm. who are my bread and butter i think there's there's an agility that those guys have that can kind of outstrip some of the the bigger organizations yeah. you know, a lot of the email and social stuff that we're putting out at the moment you know we've got one small charity that we nailed everything in under three hours and then we've got another larger organization that it took best part of a week to get anything out so yeah you know that's, yeah yeah that's probably no solace to anyone but it's just an observation from my my side yeah it's a fair point um another question from holly here um she's asking about the charity strategy that they had for 2020 um and what what should they do with it and do they need to create a new one now you said about board reports that i can they can quote can do one um would you say the same about 2020 strategies can they do one also i think yeah i think what you need at the moment is a tactical plan rather than a strategy do you know what i mean because so you need to like i said you need to strip out everything that's non-essential you need to work out exactly what your financial deficit is you need to do all the redeployment and stuff you need to get all that all that foundational stuff sorted and then really you need a tactical plan that's based around opportunity for the next sort of three to six months i think and i think that's a sort of rolling monthly tactical plan just to make sure that everyone knows what they're doing everyone knows mm-hmm. that might change tomorrow but you know just focus just focus like that there's absolutely no point having a strategy for this year and that's coming from the strategist so you can do what you want <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah i mean um I was, if you want I, one. <laughs> I was talking to um scott in charity water and he was saying basically every charity should be um almost like writing a, an, an emergency budget as if you had 50 percent income as if you had 25 percent income even 10 percent income what yeah. what does your service look like at that level yeah you're absolutely right and that's the sort of discussions that i've been having with a lot of charities it's about scenario planning do you yeah. know what I mean? and even though some of those scenarios are absolutely terrifying genuinely knowing those figures makes things a lot easier to handle do you yeah know what i mean when it's unknown and it's just this completely dark cloud that's that's over you that things are terrifying so yeah yeah all right um another question from chris and this is a great point we were talking about this on my live stream yesterday um charities that have suspended services because obviously, you know, this came up very quite quickly for a lot of us, um, and we suddenly had to close doors and and go home or whatever. So small charities, especially, maybe don't have the infrastructure for remote working for co- conference call. I mean, they might not even have um, you know their own computer at home. It's like one of my sister's staff doesn't says she doesn't have a phone or a computer, so she can't work from home. So for the organisations who um, you know are not built for remote working what what could they do at this stage what what would maybe be a priority for them jeez if they can't remote work I, mm. I, that's more a question for you than it is for me simon yeah with your, with your global technology um i don't i, I genuinely don't don't know yeah. you know zoom has been just a complete lifesaver for our organization yeah um, and you know one thing that i've been amazed by i was speaking to a colleague in a larger organization of you know a 50 um personnel agency about how they switched everything in a day and it was fun. yeah you know yeah. And that to me has been incredible especially when i commuted from bright to london for seven years and you just think i pick up my little metal box and sit on yeah. the train and then go to my office and look at my little metal box for eight hours and then get back on the train you still it's, think hmm. it's 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 mad how like impossible it all seemed just a few weeks ago like it would have taken yeah. years of talking about it and planning and then just suddenly in a week most of us just did it yeah. um it's pretty incredible 
that also when I was talking about that arc of transformational change, do you know what I mean? Like I've been banging on for years about how charities need to do things differently and, you know, the machine is broken and all that sort of stuff. Mm. And there's been a lot of sort of tinkering around the edges of sorting that out. But that trajectory for change was so long and so such an uphill struggle. And then something like this happens and you think that's really going to truncate now. Do you know what I mean? Like mm. anything is going to be possible after this. You know, if we've dealt with this, that, you know, our complete working methodology changed overnight and we coped yeah. with it, then what does that show for the future? It's pretty amazing. I mean, yeah, I mean, the, going back to the question about people who can't, you know, who can't remote work, it is a tough one. Obviously, there's a lot of free tools out there which small charities can start using to communicating. I mean, if you can't access your donor details, like phone numbers and emails, that that's a real struggle. Um, but obviously, a lot of charities are using web-based email programs, so we can still access those and still reach out to people. Um, but if anyone else has any suggestions, it would be good to hear in the comment box below. Uh, anyone else who's in that same situation where this remote working has snuck on, up on them and they just don't kind of have the resources, um, please do offer your suggestions. There's a, there's a lot of questions, Wayne, about your cat, Ed. Ed, um, yeah. It's quite wow. popular here. Um, I was going to bring him in, but he's so popular now. He's got his own Instagram account next door. Yeah, so we have to go know, to his agent. Yeah, he's he's tweeting Nicki Minaj or someone. Like <laughs> <his tweet now>. <laughs> <laughs> um, how are things going for audience? How have, how have you guys adapted in, in this? It's, it's tricky. Um, you know, it's. I think we're all in a in a similar kind of um, space in that you know, a good percentage of our planned work was cancelled pretty much like that but then mm -hmm. it kind of filled up with a lot of this emergency response stuff that we're doing so you know it's we're, we're busy um you know we, we've got capacity as well but we're just kind of you know our our sort of business plan you know the question before about what should your strategic plan be for 2020 you know our our business plan has kind of been shelved and it's much mm -hmm. more about just you know my philosophy has always been talk to people be free with your knowledge and the work will come um mm. and that's that's that served me well for for 20 years in the sector so that's kind of what we're doing at the moment and you know i think i think talking and communicating and being on the phone and talking to a range of people outside of your organization is just the way forward so everyone should do it so um yeah it's 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 tough as, as i'm sure it is for you as well yeah but yeah you're right i mean i think that communication and that opening up is um is is the key to all of this and i think um you know really appreciate you sharing your knowledge and sharing your time you've been so generous with everything there's a few more questions for you but to be honest we we don't really have time um so if people want to reach out to you afterwards wayne where's, where's the best place for them to find you totally um so i'm i'm sort of omnipresent on twitter um so if you want to follow me there that's um at wayne the murray um and i'm also if you want my work email is wayne at audience fc Com. That's brilliant. Thanks a million, Wayne. And um, really nice to, to see you, to meet you. And, oh, geez, uh, you too. And thank I, you for setting it up. This is just, thank you. you know, this is the future. <laughs> Thanks for coming, man. Uh, look after yourself and uh, sure, we'll be chatting again soon, I'm sure. But I'll, I'll say goodbye to you now. Thank Thanks you. a million, Wayne. That's Wayne Murray. Very helpful. And yeah, sorry I didn't get, we didn't get to all of your questions. So please, if they haven't been answered, um, head on um, over to Wayne's contact details. Uh, if you didn't grab them, obviously the recordings of these will all go out to you afterwards. Wayne's contact details are on the slides and you'll be able to find him. I follow him on Twitter. He's a great, great man to follow. He's a very interesting, lovely guy. Um, okay, so we're coming up now to the next session in about a minute. Um, and so over here in room two, uh, we have Sam Laprad, who's talking about engaging your board, um, which I know is, is a really important one for everyone at the moment. Over in room one uh, with Ms. Nikki Bell hosting, um, we have Adapting Your Message. Uh, for COVID-19 with Jasmine Adams. Um, so that'll be an interesting one. Uh, I know some people are having trouble going between room one and two. Basically, we had 4,000 people register for this and people are still registering for it. And obviously the internet is kind of overwhelmed uh, at the best of times right now. Um, so there's just a bit of traffic. So just if you have any trouble getting between rooms or, or your peers are having trouble getting in the first time, please just try refreshing the page. It will come up. Um, there's just it's just a bit overwhelming, um, but I appreciate your patience for this and obviously you get all the recordings and downloads afterwards So now we are going to go over to Sam Laprade. Sam Laprade is a lovely lovely person She's going to be on here to chat to me afterwards. Um, so please put in your questions, but here's Sam 
Hello, everybody. I'm Sam LaPrat. I'm coming to you from Canada, and I'm just so happy to be here with you today. And I'm hoping today that we can find ways for you to engage your board, especially during this challenging time. Board members really do want to help. Sometimes they struggle to find out ways that they can help. We're going to walk you through ways that maybe you can engage them, strategies and tips on how you can get them involved in your important mission. Um, I'm so happy to be here. I know many of us are feeling this way. The world came together as the people stayed apart. And uh, today, more than ever, uh, we will work together, especially in this sector, to move the important missions forward, not only for you, uh, but for many nonprofits around the world. Life right now, you might be in a situation where you are working more intensely. Are you working at a food bank? Are you working in social services? Are you working trying to get those important blood donations? Now more than ever, uh, we are thinking about health care. We're thinking about mental health. You might be in a very intense time right now and working with your board on anything but the necessities might feel very, very daunting. So just take a breath. We're in this together. Really important that we know what situation you're in. If you are working less intensely, maybe you are working for the arts or maybe a children's camp, youth mentorship or education. We think about this really as Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Right now, many people are worried about food, shelter, clothing, the basics of human needs. And those people are working extremely intensely right now. Not that you're not busy, believe me, I know this, if you're working in the other sectors, it's just a different kind of busy right now. What type of board do you have? And do you have a fundraising committee? Many people have a governance board, which really looks after governance issues. Uh, they may not be as familiar with the fundraising side, or that might not have been the reason that they were established. If you have a fundraising board, they're used to uh, you asking for those appeals and the case for support and all of those pieces uh, that are so important in your fundraising world. Governance boards might need a bit more uh, hand-holding right now. They might need to sort of understand the fundraising a bit more right now. So we have to be patient with everybody as we walk through all this together. Your fundraising board might be of two different minds. They might be saying, do not appeal to anybody right now. The world's too uncertain. Uh, we know that we still need to be communicating with our donors. We know that that's more important now than ever. You might have another board where they say, go for it. Let's really ensure that our donors know that we're here and, and know of the work we're doing and know, quite honestly, that we need funds more now than ever. I know locally here in Ottawa, Canada, a homeless shelter has already incurred just in two and a half weeks uh, close to $500,000 worth of extra expenses. Donors are going to be needed more than ever now. Knowing what board you have is a really important piece, part of this puzzle as we move forward together. Our governance board, our fundraising board, really determining that is going to be key. Your board members, they definitely want to help. Trust me, they want to help you. They may be unsure of how to help. They may feel like they're going to get in your way. They may feel disconnected. You know, as so many of us are self-isolating, we're connecting this way, which is a great way to connect, but they may feel disconnected. Uh, they may feel a bit guilty. They may feel, especially if they're working uh, as a board member in a social service, they might be in a home with plenty of food and all of those things and really feeling guilty that their circumstances are very different than the people that you serve. They may be feeling, um, you know, a little bit uh, shy about uh, how to get involved. They may be fearful about their own situations. Everybody has incredible stress on them now. They may be feeling nervous about their own job and being a board member, they can't even think about that right now. Uh, they may be worried about a family member. They may be ill themselves. They may have sadly lost someone um, to this deadly disease. 
we don't know how board members are feeling. And that's why it's more important than ever to reach out and connect with them. What can we do now? As board members, we know that they're thinking, as we all are, first and foremost, what is the impact to people? Our clients, our patients, uh, whatever term you use for the people you support, what is the impact to them? Are their programs closed down? Are they not receiving some of the services they're used to receiving? Um, is there less of those services? What sort of situation are they in right now? Your staff, how are they feeling? What's the impact to them? Have you had to lay off people already? Have you had to ask them to work overtime? Your board needs to understand the impact to people first and foremost. Really, really important. They're also going to want to know how donors are feeling. They're going to want to understand how are your funders feeling? Are people already uh, corporate donors already saying they can't support an event that maybe has been pushed to the fall? The impact to people, the impact um, to these types of um, situations and relationships is really, really important. This is why fundraising is relationships, is because at times like this, it is never about transactions. It's about people. The actual impact to your own board, as we talked about before, they're human too. And through all of this, all we are, are human, all of us together. We're in this together. So how are your board feeling? Can you do a virtual Zoom call? Can you check in with them? Is that how you're doing your board meetings right now? And if it isn't, it's a great way to connect. Really deciding on how that board is going to communicate is going to be key as well. Your stakeholders, your partners. I can't tell you how many times over the last few weeks I've heard about organizations that were really sort of maybe in competition with each other that are collaborating. That collaboration is going to be more important than ever. Your board needs to know that collaboration, partners, other stakeholders, friends of your organization, your local political leaders, what are they saying about your organization? Make sure we understand the impact to people. Are they in the forefront of, uh, are you at the forefront of their minds as they work towards all of the very, very important information that you'll be sending them. People first. Let's really keep that as a very first lens. And of course, revenue. Revenue is such an important piece of this. So many people uh, that are probably watching right now had that heartbreaking decision of having to cancel. Maybe it's your gala, your run, your walk, your bingo night, your, your, your special event that you worked so hard, the impact to the revenue, the sponsors, the ticket sales, we see you and we know how hard you've worked on that. They want to know the impact. Is that event going to be postponed? Is that event going to be rescheduled? It's so uncertain right now. So they're going to want to understand the impact to revenue. They're going to want to understand Maybe you have a direct mail that should have gone out by now and it hasn't. Explain maybe why or explain why the key messages have changed. Keep in mind, board members want to help, but we have to keep them informed. Monthly giving. Have you received people who have increased their monthly gift and said, listen, we see you. We want to make a difference and we want to increase our gift. We want to double it for the next year. But have you seen people cancel their monthly gift? It's always heartbreaking when we get those calls from donors saying that they need to cancel that monthly gift. Tell your board these important pieces that you're hearing and seeing. Major gifts. Are you connecting with your major gift donors right now? Please tell me you are. It's a really important time to connect with them. The impact to revenue, the financial strain that will be on your organization. Are you receiving funding from governments? Are there bubble payments that are going to be coming down to you? Keeping in touch with your board and keeping them informed is going to be really important. What are the impacts to your bricks and mortar? 
Are there going to be maintenance issues because of this? Is there going to be extra cleaning? What are the expenses that are going to come out of bricks and mortar? Maybe you require more protective equipment, more cleaning supplies, and many of those are at an all-time high premium right now for purchasing, which absolutely breaks my heart. Speak honestly and openly about the impact to revenue with your board as well. Really key, more than ever, to share qualitative and quantitative information with your board. What do we mean about that? Well, we mean that we need to talk about numbers. We need to share the numbers of people uh, that we're helping, or maybe it's the numbers of people we can't reach out to that we would normally have involved in our program. But we also need to share stories. We need to share stories about hope, we need to share stories about how the communities have come together. Maybe it's a note your donor wrote. Yesterday, one of my clients received a $1,000 gift and the note said this, mental health is more important than ever. Please use this gift to help more people today. I, I mean, such simple message but so important for us to be hearing and to be sharing with your board how board, how donors, my apologies, how donors are feeling. The qualitative and the quantitative, the numbers and the emotion side. Our brains need both. If you're not already doing this at a regular board meetings, please do this. Start your meeting off with a, with a really important emotional story. We often treat boards very much from a fiduciary uh, experience, from a budget perspective. We're not treating them like the humans they are. The reason they wanted to get involved with your organization to begin with is because they care and because they care about your important work. So this is more important than ever that we look at the qualitative and the quantitative. Communications. I cannot say enough about how important it is that we have regular communications with our donors and with our board members. We want to manage expectations. If your board was normally meeting every Tuesday and they were getting their board package the Tuesday before, you may not be able to do that right now for them. So managing expectations is really key. You want to provide that avenue for two-way communication. This is not a time for just information to be coming one way. Let's be honest, there's never a good time for that. Two-way communications is really important. Allow for questions. That's why your board is there. They're there to ask the tough questions. And we cannot be taking any of this personally. The board is looking out for everyone's best interest. We need to ensure that we see this through a lens of, um, of them taking care of us and advocating for us. Really important. Our mission. This may be foggy right now. There are so many different pieces of information coming to us right now. This may be getting lost in all of the news we hear. Reminding people of our mission. Very simple message to your board that may start off with, Today, I needed to bring us back to what we're doing. If you remember, our case for support said X, Y, and Z. Just a very simple message of what your mission is. We're going to be talking about things that we thought we'd never speak about. We need to come back to the basis of why we do the work we do. Remind people of your mission. Once again, it can be foggy for many of us right now. I can't speak enough about vulnerability. I think uh, this is an opportunity that many of us will uh, require um, a vulnerability uh, opportunity to speak with our board. This is not a weakness, it's our greatest measure of courage from Brene Brown. Vul vulnerability in a very challenging time that we're in right now means maybe putting our heart on our sleeve a bit more, saying that we can't do X, Y, and Z that's been asked of us. Uh, normally something might have taken us a couple of weeks to complete. We may not be doing that a particular task right now. Being open and honest with our boards will serve us well. 
And if our boards are not looking through this as a, as a patient and kind lens, we need to remind them everybody is vulnerable right now. Every single one of us. The people that we are caring for are vulnerable. Them as people, as, as families, Everybody is vulnerable in this situation, and we need to ensure that we can have very, very honest conversations right now. We hope that we've been having those with our boards all along, of course, but right now we might have to have those conversations that we don't want to have with them. We might have to tell them that we're laying somebody off. We might have to share with them that we've lost funding. Those conversations of honest uh, total activity of what's happening in your organization right now are, are going to be some of the most challenging conversations you have. And, uh, you know, you're working with, with people and with causes that uh, are really the basis and the heart of our organizations and our societies. And these conversations you're going to have with your board are very, very important. We have to think about a number of words right now that are going to be critical. Collaboration collaborating together, whether it be with other partners, government, business, we all need to come together. Flexibility. We all have to be more flexible than ever. Asking your board to be flexible, uh, to ensure that they've got everything they need to do their jobs is going to be key too. But let's not forget to give everybody some hope. A day will come when we'll look back on this and we want to make sure that everyone has had hope through it there will be challenging days, but rest assured, we're going to get through this together. We want to ensure that your board knows that you have these three words at the heart of, their, of them and what the work that you're doing. What can board members do now? We would love board members to thank donors and to thank staff. Doing those thank yous to these important groups are important. It doesn't have to be a fancy video, a 30 second video telling your staff and your donors that they are incredible heroes through all of this. Sending messages of hope to those that you uh, are caring for. Explaining, I'm a volunteer board member and we see you and we're doing our best right now. Our staff is doing our best to ensure that you have what you need. Thank you notes, calls, using social media to give thanks and kudos, being creative. I've seen a couple of board, uh, board teams come together here locally, providing food and care packages for staff that are working under very challenging circumstances. I encourage you to encourage your board to do these things. These are just some examples that I found a beautiful thank you message uh, to, to workers, little notes uh, that people can write, and of course, those social media thank yous. These don't have to be fancy, just from the heart and authentic. Board members will be your biggest advocates. As we ask them to do, we ask them for time, talent, and treasure. Remind them of that in crucial, crucial message right now. They may not be able to do all three. They may be running a major corporation with hundreds of employees. They may have some family struggling, as we mentioned earlier. They may be retired. They may be nervous about their own financial situation. But if you can ask them to look through this lens, it's a, the most important lens we're going to look through right now in terms of boards. They want to be your biggest advocates. They are your ambassadors in the community. This is a lens we want them to look through. Thank your board too. Sending them a note, thanking them for their leadership will go a long way. Uh, this is an important time for everyone to realize the crucial roles we play. And when this is all said and done, we can absolutely analyze how everybody handled the situations we're in. But those thank yous will go a long way. As we know, this is going to be a marathon and not a sprint. We want to get to the end of the finish line and be respectful of one another and still have an opportunity to communicate and communicate more uh, more than ever and better than ever. And finally, I'm going to ask everybody to look through that kindness lens when you're working with your boards, working with your staff, the people you care about. And honestly, you need to look through the kindness lens at yourself. We are all working 25 hours in a 24-hour day right now. 
be kind to you, please. This is a very challenging time. However you work with your boards, please ensure that kindness comes first. This is me. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. I know I have an opportunity now. If you have questions moving forward too, I'm happy to work with you. Thank you so much to everybody for watching today. It has really been my honor to spend time with you, sending you all love and positive vibes. We're going to get through this together. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Sam. Um, I accidentally got rid of myself. Uh, so you can see how, how I'm multitasking and also because maybe because I'm a man and I'm not very smart, uh, I'm not very good at multitasking. But anyway, that was Sam Leprad, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, and she's going to come on in a second to answer some questions and have a chat. And I'm really excited because I haven't seen her since all this happened, so we get to catch up as well. Um, we've got a bit of time until the next session, so please do put your questions in the question box for Sam, um, and I will ask her. Uh, in a second, um, just to let you know uh, that obviously we have another track going on in room uh, one. You're in room two currently. Nikki is looking after room one. I am here in room two, um, but you can feel free to go backwards and forwards. Now we we've had um, I think we've hit four thousand people registered for this, and it's it's people are still register registering for it. And obviously North America is beginning to wake up. So if you have a bit of trouble getting between the rooms, um, if they have trouble loading up because we're just getting so much traffic, uh, just give it a second and then refresh and it'll come through. Um, otherwise, we've also started sending the stream to YouTube. Um, so you should be able to see it there, worst case scenario. Actually, the worst case scenario is remember with all of this, you get all of the recordings, uh, a whole bunch of bonus downloads. I was looking at them yesterday and there's some amazing stuff in there. That's all gonna be sent out to you um, within 24 hours after the end, end of the conference anyway. So you're going to get it all anyway to watch in your own time. I know it can be really overwhelming with so much information being sent to you. Um, so just dip into it um, as and when you feel comfortable. Um, OK, now I am going to bring in uh, my friend Sam, if she's here. Hey, Sam. Hello. Hi. You're wearing your fav are my you? favorite shirt. Are you wearing that you like shirt? This? Yeah, this I love that shirt. It's it's kind of the goose and look i'm drinking from my camp ooch mug uh I'm just to it. impress you i'm, 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 I'm canadian uh how are you are you coping are you managing well, i'm better now that i'm seeing your face ah that's sweet yeah. no, that's is it has it been stressful tough yeah um head? I don't know if you know but i've been hosting a radio show here in ottawa on 13 mm -hmm. news every day yes i've been on I, i'm uh, entering into my 18th day straight um, of a radio show, really trying to show the positive side um, to the challenging times we're in. So that gives me a lot of hope. But, uh, you know, I've got, I, I consider it a lottery win. I'm healthy, we have food, and we have a warm home. It's a lottery win these days. Yeah, good. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Um, thanks very much for your session. I imagine you're getting a lot of contact from clients and from other people looking for advice and engaging boards. I mean, you, you do a lot of work with data and everything. Um, but yeah. I'll just focus on uh, on the board stuff. Um, what's what's the vibe out there with your clients and with people you you're in contact with? It really is from from everything that I'm hearing. Uh, people have been quite good about the fact that uh, you know maybe not meeting the deadlines they were normally meeting and all of that. Uh, but boards uh, are both. There's two kinds. <laughs> there's ones that are in there ready to take action, and there's ones that are petrified. Um, so that's kind of what, what I'm seeing. I'm trying mm -hmm. to help some of my clients through the ones that are like, don't do anything. We're, we're not a homeless shelter. So don't talk to anybody or we're not a food yeah. bank. And I'm like, that's not true. Like just, you know, like, um, so we're pulling out fundraising plans. We're adjusting them. Um, but overall people have been really good. Um, you know, 99% of people have been fantastic. Yeah. Um, they, I mean, the, the, you kind of touched on boards there and I think I've seen this as well that, um, there's kind of two camps. I mean, there's camps who are who are like, you know, put the head down, don't disturb right. people, let it go. And then the other camp is communication is good. Um, and obviously in the last session, Wayne was talking about that. We've talked about, about it a lot. And then I, I heard you mentioning it in there. Um, why, why do you think communication is so important right now? Well, I think it's really important to communicate. I, I, there's one thread that I think is brilliant. They're sort of building on this thread. So it's kind of, and they're dating it. So you know, as things change, because, you know, as I just mentioned, I'm working in a newsroom, I can't even keep up in the newsroom about what's happening. So when mm -hmm. they have a thread like this, where they're just building on it, people can go back and see maybe 
Um, you know, they're going to close a program on this day, but now they've gone virtual so they can read this thread. The communication is going to be more important than ever because when you communicate with people, they feel included. Mm. The minute they stopped hearing from you and boards stop hearing from you, one, they don't think they've got a role anymore. Two, um, they feel like, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're being left out and something's happening without them. Yeah, sure. The truth is, I mean, as I said, people are working 25 hours in a 24 hour day, Simon. I mean, I'm getting emails from clients 1130 at night. I had my earliest call a couple of days ago with a client that said, could we speak at 630 in the morning? I'm like, I'm in, you know, so yeah. people are just tapped. So those normal, beautiful little packages they might be getting for their board probably isn't happening now. Um, mm -hmm. They may not be receiving all that, but I'm really encouraging people to step up and have that conversation um, uh, about stories that are happening, whether it be those, in an example I used about the thousand dollar gift we got, share that donors still want to give. <laughs> mm. Yeah, and I think, I mean, you you kind of touch on um, appeals and still asking, and, and I've been, you know, in, in a lot of circumstances, I've been saying it's still okay to ask. Um, but for the people who still feel very uncomfortable with the asking right now, you know, for, for, for fair enough reasons, justified reasons, yeah. they can still communicate without asking. And there's, and there's value in that, isn't there? Sharing information, what's going on, trying to share resources. So because it's all about people, this is all about relationships and people. So, um, you know, you still need to remind people you're there. There's so much happening, like, uh, in terms of uh, information coming at people and even just, uh, you know, emails to, to check in and say, this is what we're up to. It doesn't have to be an appeal. You know, if you don't feel like it's right right now because you're an mm -hmm. arts organization, et cetera, um, but definitely communicate for sure. I mean, are there any um, causes or charities that aren't affected by this? You know, could you argue that they, they all are in a place to appeal because everyone's been negatively affected. Everybody. And sometimes like in the government, for the government here, we've uh, just had some funding in Canada brought down that if your revenues were 30% lower, you're going to get a, a pay subsidy. I okay. mean, but that's not going to be in every country as we know. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's really, really important to, to uh, do that. Now the first couple of weeks were very intense for people. But I think the plan, you know, work with whoever you're going to work with in terms of your plan and make sure you've got something that allows you to do some sort of appeal within the next six weeks. Mm -hmm. um, because it's going to be real. This is a long, this is a long road. I mean, we're hearing, we're hearing that this is going to be, you know, a long road. Yeah. Yeah. It's the, I think it's definitely going to be longer than um, it feels like sometimes or that people are admitting to themselves sometimes. Um, and there's going to be permanent changes. Um, there's some questions here, if you don't mind me asking, from the question box, um, and everyone, please feel free. So, uh, oh, Jen Love. Uh, I'll meet you Jen. So she's asking if you have any tips for um, board member thank you calls, and even I'll, I'll extend that into kind of um, um, writing communications. You know, how do you how do you get your board members because they're they're petrified a lot of the time of talking to donors. They are. I love giving people five people to call. <laughs> so start yeah. them with five. And yeah. uh, I use a silly little diagram. Everyone, you know, every cheesy uh, PowerPoint has it, but, you know, a little um, stool, you know, a four legged stool. And I always say to do four things to thank the donor, to uh, ensure you show some sort of accountability. So if you're saying to the donor, uh, you know, thanks so much for your thousand dollars, sharing what that money's actually did. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't have to be, you know, and board members, I think I, I've trained a lot of board members on doing calls and I think board members think they have to know everything. It's okay to say, yeah. I don't know that, like yeah. I'll get back to you, but then do get back to them. Right. That's yeah. the so the, so first of all, the thank you, um, then the piece, uh, in terms of accountability and showing vision. So, you know, we know uh, this time last year we served 1,200 people um, a meal and we expect that to grow by 15%, 20%. Mm -hmm. um, or just even say we, we know that's going to grow. So showing that we know that there's going to be need in the, in the future. And then the most important thing that they can do is listen to the donor. And I always have uh, a question that I, that I write down on, on my scripts for them. And that question is what inspired your very first gift or what inspired mm -hmm. 
when we listen to the donor, that's the sweet spot. Then we're asking board members really, you know, to make a few notes. They don't have to be in your database. Just write a few notes down, share that so that can go into the database because we know that's the legacy we leave. Whatever we put in the database is the legacy we leave for fundraisers a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now. That's such a data, that's such a data nerd. I know, to, like, I know. You, you've given yourself your away that. Like, yeah. It's a good, good one there. It's good advice. Here she goes. Um, but yes, yeah, so I think that's a really important piece. Um, but just have them call five people. Get them to start with five. Yeah, nice little bite-sized thing. Yeah. I think that's a great idea. And I, I love I love your suggestion about saying I don't know. You know, I think that's yeah. Yeah, the truth is most of us don't know lots of things right, right. now. Um, and I think, right. you know, there's something very human, very vulnerable, very honest about saying, look, I don't I'm sorry, we don't know what's gonna happen or we don't know the answer to your question, yeah. but let's find out and I'll, I'll come back to you if that's okay. I received a call yesterday and yeah. I was just so shocked. I saw the thing come up and of course I'm thinking that they're needing help, right? Like I, I made a gift to them. Oh uh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, they, they're calling me because they need some some fundraising advice. And I'm like, hi, we're just calling to thank you. I was like, so uh, donor, I'm like, you're welcome. Yeah. Yeah, I was. That's, uh, that's smart. I mean, that's one of the smartest things you can be doing right now is thanking past donors and just saying, because yeah. of your gift, it means we can keep this up. Yeah, we're struggling with this, this, and this, but it means that this is still happening, or, and that's because of your previous donors. So that's that's a great thing to report back. Isn't and you it? know what I love? This is where old school meets new school. This is where that old school telephone comes in handy, but using the technology we have to be able to connect, you know, and pull up those names yeah. to pass them to to don't to uh, board members to do that, right? So yeah. that's the beauty of it, and. You have to be shy. I, I sometimes say that the phone is 500 pounds. It's not. It's okay. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it, it is really intimidating. And one of the bonus downloads um, that's putting in is actually my own session about using mm. the phone and, and kind of handling that fear because it is an intimidating thing. And I hate talking on the phone. You know, I train people to use the phone. I used to run a telephone agency, but I hate the phone. Um, but there's things you can do. There's ways yeah. you can manage it. It's about preparation and about structuring it in your head, isn't it? Right, right. Yeah. Um, there's lots of people commenting. Um, hello, hello, Galway Tim. How are you? Um, we've got, I think that's Bernard Ross. I think there's a few other people. Um, Darcy, I'm going to say hello to Darcy. She mentioned she's the chair of a board um, and she's feeling like that, you know, from the other side that she needs the CEO to communicate, you know, um, because they're all wondering what's going on. They need that constant communication. So from a board member's point of view, they're like, board members, they're just humans, aren't they? They, I mean, sometimes they're yeah. annoying as hell, but they're generally yeah. human, aren't I they? I always picture after a board meeting, because I know this has happened to me, where I'll leave a board meeting, I'll walk into my office and I'll throw my binder and think, they don't know what I do. And meanwhile, the board member's driving away going, what does she do all day? Yeah. Yeah. You know? So it's yeah, yeah. that, you know, that piece I think is is kind of interesting that, you know, that there is kind of this, um, you know, kind of interesting d dynamic between fundraisers and board members. And a couple of years ago, I did a session called what every board member wants every fundraiser to know and what every fundraiser wants every board member to know. And yeah. like, this was packed because they're like, you know, tell yeah. us how can help, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I do. I do a session for boards called um, fundraising for people who hate fundraising. <laughs> and it, it's really it is just about like figuring out their priorities and there, there is a divide. And I moan about board members a lot. And when I worked in nonprofits, I used to moan about my board. Um, but they are just human beings, you know, that they, they have other things to do that's paid. They've got their family. And, and so, you know, they are volunteering their time and we have to, we have to remember that. Um, Darcy has said, um, oh, Darcy, I, got, I don't know if it's Darcy or is it Darcy? Uh, and anyway, um, but they've said as a board member, it can be difficult to hear from the fundraising team. I would love to be asked to make the five calls. And I think that's a really excellent point by you that it's like by making these bite-sized things, because it's tempting to ask your board to say, can you ask everyone you know, can you, you know, whatever you can do, like keeping it broad and vague. But when you do that, they don't do it. Whereas you're, you, what you're saying about, you know, if you give them very specific five people, really hold their hand through it, they're going to be much more likely to do it. And you're going to get them, you're going to get some momentum out of it. They'll, they'll go back for, um, for more. For sure, absolutely. I think it's a really, it's a really good way. I've I've done it. That's how I've trained board members, and for them to have their own story to share. You know, a lot of the times they feel like they need to tell this big giant story, and something simple as why you joined the board can be your story. That's that's a story, 
right? Why, why you felt out of all the boards and all of the nonprofits um, that you wanted to join that particular board. That's your own story. And the story you share, it can be something as simple as, you know, walking into the building for the first time. It can be something as simple as that. So I think those are good opportunities to, um, uh, to make sure people are feeling connected. Nice one. The um, are you okay to stick around for a few minutes? I just I'd love um, to. I, yeah, you, I wasn't sure how busy you were this morning. Uh, okay. Are you up early to talk to us? I am, but I'm. I, I, I'll admit I'm not wearing pants. Um, <laughs> uh, it's about ten to nine in the morning, uh, but I look cute up here. Yeah, you look fantastic considering there's like a global crisis. I mean, look at me. I'm I'm falling apart, but you look like you got it together. Here's the funny part is is I'm the only person I think right now that's doing radio and TV. So they have me uh, broadcasting because the TV station had to shut down. So oh, they God, have yeah. okay. picking up uh, my radio show as a as a TV show. So I actually have to shower and you know do my hair and stuff. So yeah. Well, you look great. It's working. Oh, you're sweet. Uh, ex except for the lack of pants. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Did so, I just um, that? Just a second. Did I just what? said that out loud, right? Yeah, you said that out loud. But don't worry, it's been recorded. There's only 4,000 people registered. It's fine. <laughs> um, come here. One of the things you touched on, which I, I, I'd love to have a, a bit yeah. of a dive on, is vulnerability. Because um, I, was, I was talking to Jen Love about this uh, yesterday. She's in the comment box. This, you know, we feel, well, Jen, Jen, Jen taught me this. But it's like it's going to be the next big thing, isn't it? Like this idea of people just being human, mm -hmm. real, open about their mental health struggles, open about this stuff going through. Is is this where our fundraising is going, or what? What's your take on vulnerability well, in, I, in in fundraising? I absolutely think it is. I I think I think we have to go there. I don't think I think I think this is going to push us in places. Uh, that we've only dabbled in before. I think vulnerability is one of those places where, um, you know, a lot of people uh, will go with their closest confidants, um, but they would never say, you know, sort of openly, I forgot, or I yeah. missed a deadline, or, um, you know, here's what's actually happening with me, or, you know, yesterday something happened and I, I thought, oh my gosh, like I need to tell this person that I need to move that back by an hour. And normally it's like, you know, you try to sort of, you know, kind of have this, these airs about you that, that you've got it all together. But the reality is I don't know who has it together uh, right now. Um, <laughs> yeah. Does anyone? Does anybody? I don't think so. I mean, I think, you know, I think when we think about it, like, we'll just take, you know, I'll just be selfish for a second. I'll take myself for example. So, you know, I have eight clients. I have a daily radio show. I've got a beautiful 12 year old. I don't know grade seven math. Um, you know, she's trying to to battle that. Our house has become some sort of big giant drop box for everything that is on the planet, I swear. Um, you know, it's just all of that. Um, I'm being asked to be pulled into all of these different meetings, uh, high level meetings in terms of philanthropy here in Canada. Uh, there's no time, there's no clock anymore. Like yeah. I just feel like it's all one big day. I, um, so from that perspective, and there's a lot of people that have got littles at home and they're trying to do this kind of meeting and little ones are asking for juice and goldfish crackers. And, um, you know, they're grumpy with their husband because they've, you know, spent 17 days with him now, uh, or wife or whatever. So I think there's a lot of just a lot of, uh, normal, regular pressure and then we add all of this on top of it and and let's be honest Simon this planet was having a mental health crisis before COVID-19 um, and if anything I hope that uh, people realize all the work that's been done particularly over the last 10 years to bring mental health um, to the forefront um, I'm hoping that we all benefit from that now and that we are gentle with each other um, because if we're not um, I, I really do fear if we're not, to be honest. And as fundraisers, um, we really try to be that, uh, you well, you and I have talked about this. We try to be that everything to everyone. And when do we start caring for the fundraisers? Because mm. sometimes, well, as you know, many times we're caring for so many different people and it's hard to kind of put our hands up and go, I got to be honest with you, I can't go to that event tonight or, yeah. you know, I can't do X, Y, and Z or I can't take something else on. And our personalities in many cases are, are people that are, um, you know, just wanting to, to do and be, and we're very empathetic people. So mm. I think at some point um, we have to sort of put our hands up and say, I, we need help too.
Yeah, and uh, yeah, you, I mean, you've been quite vocal about that. There seems to be more and more people speaking about um, mm -hmm. fundraising mental health, I suppose. You know, I, I, I suppose I've spoken more and more over the last few years about my own challenges with mental health. Mm -hmm. And I suppose this stuff going on, it could, I mean, it could kind of push you over the edge, couldn't it? Or, you know, for a lot of people, it's it seems like it's almost going the other way, that this has made them slow down. Mm -hmm. and made them you know n you know realize that some things are out of their control and and um you know so so i mean there there's a lot about how we process what's going on mm -hmm. um but i don't really know how you how you say that to someone else you know how you tell someone else to kind of accept the change go with it it's it's yeah. difficult isn't it it is very difficult and i know a lot of people right now i have received a number of calls over the last couple of weeks about imposter syndrome people remember i did that session and they may not have thought about them as as someone that would have gone to that session like do you have any resources from when you did the session on imposter syndrome because yeah. you know right now there's a lot of imposter syndrome people are like Oh my heavens, like I might be the director of a food bank or I might be a, you know, somebody running a shelter right now, but I wasn't, I wasn't prepared for a pandemic. So yeah. then it yeah. makes me feel like I'm not a good fundraiser or I'm not a great yeah. D and that the truth be known is, is who could have ever guessed Simon? I mean, yeah. you and I were supposed to be together in like six weeks. Yeah. Um, I'm just looking at my calendar. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah. you, you expected me to walk through the door. Is that exactly, what you Exactly. That's fine. Uh, but we were supposed to be together and, and, you know, those were heartbreaking decisions to make yeah. and they weren't our decisions to make. Um, yeah. And I think I, that's a really good point though. A lot of this isn't our decisions to make too. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, a lot of it's out of control, but yeah, I mean, I feel like the sadness because, you know, I'm not going to see you um, this year, like almost certainly people like Jen Love and John Lepp, who are, who I was going to see at the conference soon. I'm not going to see them. And, and there's a, you know, there's a bit of loss in there, um, especially because we don't know, when the end of that loss is we don't we can't we don't know how temporary this is it's interesting you mentioned that because yesterday on my radio show on 1310 news and you can go and listen to it anywhere you just type in 1310 news you'll see all my shows there i had a grief uh analyst on yesterday someone that uh specializes in grief and he talked about the fact that we're actually all grieving right now and no one's talking about it and i love well. that you brought that up as a loss because a lot of people are grieving, whether it's the grief of, of us, to your point, not seeing each other, the grief of, of regular day. Like one of the examples I used uh, was, you know, I was running around, I'd be taking my daughter here and taking her there. And sometimes that all feels overwhelming on top of everything else we're doing. And I would love to take that kid to soccer today. Yeah. Right. And so it's almost that loss as well. Um, and I said to him, I lost my father four years ago. And I said to him, is it weird that I'm thinking about my dad right now? Yeah. And he yeah. said, 100% normal. Because grief is compounded. I don't know. I won't pretend I'm not the specialist. He is. But he said, grief is compounded. And I thought, boy, did that make sense. That really hit me. Um, knowing that, you know, you do think about, you know, how would my father have handled this? And he had kind of a wicked sense of humor. So he would have made some sort of joke about it. But um the reality yeah. is, you know, that it's something to think about that, that the grief, the loss, everything that's kind of um, been shoved way, way down, um, it's bubbling in all, yeah. in all of us. And we have to be gentle. And, you know, I find, I don't know about you, but I'm going to tell you right now, I love you because I've been telling everybody how much I love them. Um, I love you too. I think so. it's time, but I think it's time. God, the, the word grief, like it's just, it kind of hit me there. I feel, actually feel like I teared up a little bit because it's like, yeah, that's exactly what, and I've been thinking about my dad who I lost about 10 years ago and um, you do, you've, we have just lost so much and I hope it's, I hope we fill that's, that gap anyway. Mm -hmm. um, Sam, we've only got like about a minute and a half before the next session. Uh, just quickly, um, and you're used to this because you're a radio person. Where <laughs> where can people find you? People, you know, there's more questions coming in. Where where do they find you? Uh, so Sam Laprad, CFRE. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, on LinkedIn. You can find me Facebook, Instagram, Carrier Pigeon. Uh, anyway, uh, you can find me uh, on social, and I'm happy to be connected. Uh, SamLaprad.com uh, is another great way of finding me and uh, Look forward to connecting. That's that's great, Sam. Uh, I'm going to say goodbye to you, and uh, we'll have a private chat soon. I look and, forward. To uh, yeah, lovely to see you. Thanks lovely. for doing this. Really appreciate it. Bye.
That's Sam the Pride. Uh, amazing, amazing woman. Love her. Um, do get in touch with her, and she, she's very, very helpful in everything. Okay, we're about 50 seconds away from the next session. Um, on this stream, in this room, room two, we have Louise Morris uh, from Summit Fundraising, and Louise is going to be talking about engaging with high net worth individuals. Um, so talking about major donors, um, talking about ma major gifts at this point, you know, where are they going? So Louise is speaking here. Um, over in the other room, while I begin to speak slower, um, as I try to find out what's in the other room. Over in the other room is Nikki Bell. Um, she's going to be uh, uh, introducing shortly Alex Lloyd Hunter, who will be talking about digital mobilization during all of this. So digital mobilization over in room one, um, or stick around here if you would like to see uh, Louise Morris talk about engaging with high net worth individuals. Okay, so we'll get ready to start. Um, I will be back afterwards. Please do put your question and answers in for Louise um, because she's gonna try and pop in. Up. Hi there, I'm really delighted to be joining you all today. I'm Louise Morris. I've been working in major donor fundraising for about 13 years, mainly with UK charities, small, medium and large. I'm a former director of development or director of fundraising. I'm a trustee of a small charity and my focus over the last three years has been through Summit Fundraising to help charities set up their programmes and improve their major donor fundraising. I coach a range of major gift fundraisers and I interview a number of philanthropists. So that's enough about me. You're all here from all over the world, which for me is such a wonderful display of everybody coming together, which is happening a lot, one of the good things of COVID-19. So please do type into the chat box your name, your country, let your other fundraisers know maybe whether you're on lockdown or not. I'm based in the southeast of England. I'm lucky to have a lot of space around me. This is a common in Surrey near where I live outside London. And this is my sanity at the moment is getting out on a bike ride or a walk. Most of you will be aware we're on lockdown in the UK. Most of my experience I've mentioned is from UK charities. But my thinking is it's really relevant for wherever your nonprofit is in the world right now and wherever your donors are. I'm going to use a few different terms, but know that if I talk about major donor fundraising, major gifts fundraising, philanthropy, high net worth individuals, I'm talking about exactly the same thing, which is rich people and raising larger gifts. So I mentioned I've coached a few fundraisers and I've spoken to a number over the last few weeks. And it's really tough right now. And these are some of the comments I've had back anonymized, obviously. You are all adjusting to a new way of life. We all are in the world. A lot of us are working from home when we were used to being in a really bustling office. We're worried about our loved ones. We're adjusting to change that was never really very conceivable. A number of us might have little people at home right now. I have my two boys who are eight and five and are very loud. So you may hear a little bit of noise in this. I've also got an elderly cat who coughs a lot. So hoping you don't hear him either. But I suppose one of my key messages to start with is just to be really kind to yourself. If at the moment in your role as a fundraiser or if you're working on fundraising as part of your role, if you are feeling demotivated, if you are feeling like, where do I go next? What, what does remote fundraising mean for me right now? Know that you are not alone and know that that is okay. The session today, hopefully, I'm going to give you a bit more confidence to get some momentum back, a few more tips. If you're already engaging your high net worth individuals really well, getting gifts in post COVID-19, then awesome work. Hopefully you might pick up a few things, but you might be doing a lot of this anyway. You might be thinking, oh, that sounds a bit obvious. But after the session, do share in the comments what's worked for you with other fundraisers so we can all learn from each other. 
and there is a questions box as well so please do pop your questions in and at the end we'll have time for those so i certainly don't have all the answers there are no rules to fundraising in a pandemic of course we had the global crash of 2009 but this feels quite different it might be quite different and certainly in way of life it's hugely different but as i said hopefully you're going to go away with a little bit of a different mindset because there are opportunities and i want you to be able to make the most of the opportunities that coronavirus brings for your organization for your donors and for those relationships so you might think I'm a little bit mad talking about opportunities. I know many of you will be in organisations where you've had to cancel a range of your events, where you maybe had a number of meetings in the diary that have all come out. But there are opportunities and hopefully we can go through some of them and you'll see where some of those are for your charity by the end of the session. And now is exactly the right time to be engaging your high net with individuals now is the time to be building those relationships and why is that there are some things some truths that just haven't changed since covid19 or if anything they've become more exaggerated your charity your nonprofit needs funds it did before the pandemic and it does now. I mentioned you'll all be working in a range of causes. Some of you will have actually had to cut your services as a charity. Some of you will be directly on the front line of COVID-19 response and increased your services. And then you might be thinking, where's this money gonna come from to pay for it? You might have increased need, increased funding. Quite a few of you might be in causes that you think are completely unrelated to COVID-19 or fairly unrelated, but you've still got an income hole. And you're thinking, you know, how, how is that going to be? Something? Human connection is incredibly important. We don't live as hermits for a reason. And I think if COVID-19 has shown anything to us, it's how important that is. That is the same now and has actually been amplified and exaggerated now. And as a nonprofit, you've provided that to your donors in a range of ways and to your high net with individuals before. You might have shown your work, shown that the people you help, what difference their funds make. You might have brought them into that before, either through an event, through a visit, through stories you've potentially got to know some of them quite well. You've given them that connection. You've made them feel a part of something bigger than themselves. And that today is more important than ever. And lastly, our high net worth individuals care. They cared before this crisis and they care now during the crisis. Some of them may have given to you already and if they've given a large gift oh my gosh they've invested in your organization in the people or the things that you're helping to make better they've made that commitment because they care and if they haven't given to your organization already maybe they came to an event maybe they took your call when they were about to board a flight and they were incredibly busy maybe they agreed to meet you for a coffee all signs that they care they don't stop caring because of COVID-19. And if this pandemic has proved anything, the outpouring of care, community spirit and emotion is huge. But I did mention we're being kind to ourselves. And if this is your to-do list for the moment, I can understand it. It's hard to know where to go next, where to pivot. So I'm gonna come on to some tips for that. If you're thinking, why would my donors want to hear from me right now? They'll be worried about their own health. They'll be worried about their loved ones. If you're thinking, well, it's not that easy just to get a virtual meeting. I get that. But the really good news is that as 
a fundraiser, if you can even move partly towards some of the stuff we're going to be talking about, it will make a really transformative difference. So these are some of the quotes from fundraisers I'm coaching who've really moved their fundraising programs forward quite quickly at the moment with COVID-19. And the fascinating thing for me is not just what that connection is doing for their major donor programs and for their relationships with their high net worth individuals. It's what it's done for them as fundraisers and how it's got them motivated because we need that connection too. We are not outside of all of this. And a lot of them have been talking about having that purpose and having that momentum once they've started engaging more with their high net worth individuals. So I'm gonna talk about picking up the phone and speaking to your high net worth individuals. I want you to think of one high net worth individual, one donor, maybe potential donor who you've engaged with. If you've got someone in your mind, keep thinking of them. If they're a couple, think about them together, what you know about them. And I often talk about as really thinking about where our donors come from. And now is such an important time to do that. A pandemic is an incredibly great leveler. This is not affecting people that differently of course the vulnerable are more vulnerable but actually your donors are experiencing so much right now just like you are if they're older what are they going through are they worried about their own health do they have underlying health conditions that might be mean, mean they're quite fearful do they have grandchildren in their life and are they really missing them because they can't see them right now What's their portfolio of companies or their role in business? Are they having to furlough or lay off staff? They must feel a huge responsibility right now about that. There might be guilt there. And like a lot of us, they may be working remotely at home. They might be bored. I don't know about your social calendar, but mine's not looking particularly interesting right now. And... One of the ways I look at it in terms of picking up the phone and speaking to your donors is thinking about some of those things and making contact and showing that you care. If you're finding it tricky to give yourself the momentum to make that contact and to engage with them, remember, you're not calling to ask for money, you're calling to show that you care. If I'm one of your high net worth supporters and I get a call from you to say, Hi Louise, you've cared so much about the people we help that are non-profit helps in the past. I just wanted to check in with you and see if you're okay. How are things for you at the moment? What's not to like about that? We know that over half of communication is done, done non-verbally. So if you are on the phone having these conversations, if there's a possibility to FaceTime, then do ask if you can FaceTime. So please take the time to contact them. And again, it's not always that easy. Some of you will be, yes, I'm on it. I'm phoning. I've had these amazing conversations. Brilliant. If you're not quite there and you still need a bit of something, this is a technique that may work for you. I don't know if you're Harry Potter fans. Me and my whole household are my boys, five and eight, absolutely love it. And there is a bit in The Prisoner of Azkaban, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, where Harry has to summon his Patronus, which wards off the Dementors. So if we think of the Dementors as the fear and anxiety that we have right now, the kind of lack of them, the draining of our energy, and to summon his Patronus, he has to think of the deepest, happiest memories. It's worth just thinking, without taking the analogy too far, of what's making you happy right now. There might be something that's connected to your charity, a really heartwarming story. And before you pick up the call, get that in your mind and get that. So you're in the right frame of mind to really engage and pick up your donors. So mine is this which is super mummy, cape and all, that my five-year-old made for me for Mother's Day, which was a couple of weeks ago in the UK. And I have this on my desk and it just gives me a bit of a pick-me-up. 
The point being, you can't engage confidently and happily with your donors if you're not in the right headspace. So just think about what can put you in that headspace. So picking up the phone is a good way to start. And my belief is that for, and it's proven with a lot of fundraising, that for high net worth individuals to give those bigger gifts, you have to have trust and you have to have a strong relationship. And most of the time we get that through engaging face to face. You're not just gonna get that over an email. And that doesn't need to stop right now. It does need to stop physically, but you can still engage your high net worth individuals and you can do it online. So we've talked about putting ourselves in our high net worth individual shoes. They're likely to be at home. They've got more time. These hectic schedules when they were traveling around, they're not doing that anymore. They might be quite bored. So one of the most positive things that you can do is instead of canceling things, move them online. Obviously, some physical events did have to be cancelled, do have to be cancelled. And that's OK. But when I see we've cancelled this, my heart just sinks. It's another thing not happening at the moment. Whereas if you can communicate, you have this evening in your calendar. Unfortunately, we can't do it in person, but we're moving it online. Well, that's great. I've got time that evening. I'm not out. I'm not travelling. I already had it in the diary. So have a think about how you can still keep up that face-to-face -face momentum. There is a charity I'm working with who are going, was going to have an art gallery cultivation event with some really nice drinks with their donors. And this fits their donor type, their high net worth individuals really well. They can't do that anymore. What they're going to do is they're going to ask the artist to do a live demonstration on webinar They've still got it in the diary for their high net worth individuals, and they're hoping that a number are still going to be able to join them. They're going to be asking the artists some questions, but they're also going to find out what the charity is doing now in COVID-19. You can provide that connection in a way that other organisations can't right now. Fundraisers, we have a real role to connect people to our work. And the social distancing actually means there's that gap to fill. There is some amazing stuff happening right now. You'll have seen it online. There is a museum up in the north of England who have been doing this World War II educational pieces on the internet. My kids were watching it this week. There is a, an aquarium, quite a few charities who rely on visitors have been very creative about what they can do online. So I would really have a think about what you can offer online, but it doesn't have to be particularly complicated. It really doesn't. If the next step for someone you're engaging with, a high net worth individual, was to have a meeting with you and your director of services, then carry on, ask. Check in with them and ask and do it by Zoom webinar, however you'd like. If the next step was that you were gonna have a cup of coffee and a chat, edit in the diary, have a virtual cup of coffee. Try and see them where you can, as I've mentioned, because actually being able to read people and make that connection person to person is better than on the phone. But don't assume it has to stop, it doesn't. You're providing that connection and you're making them know that you care. There was a charity I spoke to recently in the UK, a dementia charity. They've been trying to get a meeting with a venture capitalist for over a year. He's very high net worth, ultra high net worth, but had only given smaller gifts to their cause in the past. They emailed from the chief executive of the charity and said, we'd love to get a meeting with you, a video meeting, and they made it quite clear in the email that actually they wanted to talk about how he might be able to support the charity at a time when the need has really increased. Because of COVID-19, people with dementia are not in their normal routines. They might not be able to be visited by the same people. And they've got a meeting within a week, within seven days. 
So within seven days of the email going to that high net worth individual, they hadn't been able to track down There are so many wonderful, incredibly motivating, heartwarming, I can't even describe it. There are so many things happening in the sector, happening with nonprofits right now. Tell your stories. Sometimes we're so close to it when we're in our organisations that we don't realise the lengths that actually we've gone to. So working with a hospice recently, they've gone to incredible lengths for their nurses and the people that they care for to really, really make sure that they're still getting that end of life care. They are making sure that people aren't going into hospital and into the NHS at a time when it's overloaded. And they've got some wonderful personal stories of the nurses. Tell them, tell the stories. Another fundraiser I'm working with their charity supports adults with learning disabilities. They're really concerned because they're small that if too many of their care workers go off sick, they might not be able to continue the care that's so needed. So their fundraisers have been having a load of training. And I spoke to this fundraiser, she said, I've been so busy, I've been in all this training. I said, what training is it? And she said, well, under supervision, We've been being trained up to offer some of the basic care to the adults with learning disabilities so that we can carry on looking after them. And I was like, that's amazing. Another charity, two of their fundraisers have gone back to nursing. They were registered nurses years ago to help with the COVID-19 response. So get those stories out. They're always going to be more powerful than this is our COVID-19 strategy, which can be quite dry. You're providing that hope, you're providing that connection at a time when your high net worth individuals really need it more than ever. You can play that role. And fourth, even though it can help to make that first contact and not think this is for money, you know, it's touching and it's checking and you care. Make sure that you ask if you need funds. Be prepared that not everybody is going to say yes, and that's okay. One fundraiser spoke to one of their donors last week and was talking about how if you are going to support again this year, now would be the best time because you will be able to make the most impact. The lady turned around and said, I'm really sorry, my Investments are in free fall at the moment. I don't really know how much I'm going to be able to give or when. And that's okay. You know that and you can then move that relationship forward. But for everybody that does that, there will also be other high net worth individuals who feel that they need to make a difference, that they want to make a difference. They might have put a certain amount aside. Don't be the charity that doesn't ask. Don't be the nonprofit that sits on the back line. You are giving people an opportunity to make a difference, to care, and to do something incredibly positive at such a traumatic time for so many. So, to sum up, 
if you are struggling with motivation, you know that that's okay. Find out what your pick me up is to create that Patronus and to create that positive energy. I would really encourage you to pick up the phone and make five calls to high net worth today, or if it's coming towards the end of the day where you are tomorrow morning, to show that you care, to touch in, and it will uplift you to have that connection. If you had a meeting in the diary, don't cancel it or an event. Or if you have cancelled it already, go back to that person and say, actually, let's do it virtually. And find a compelling story, one or two, and really get to know it and tell it to your donor so you can make them feel the lengths your charity is going to. And don't be afraid of asking. It's all right if people say no. Make sure you accelerate your asks because I guarantee you, you will get money in. People really want to help. And last of all, be kind to yourself. It's tough right now. It's tough for our high net worth individuals. It's tough for us. You are doing a grand job. Thank you so much for listening. We're going to come on to some questions now, I think. There we go. What's that? Two? Two times I forgot to turn my microphone on. Who had two in the gamble? Uh, I reckon I'm estimating we hit six by the end of the day. Um, that was Louise Morris, who's going to come on in a minute to answer questions. Um, I see some questions coming through in the question box. So please do feel free to put any questions in the question box and I will read the, relay them uh, to um, Louise. Uh, you may have noticed anyone who was watching um, room two um, that we flashed off for a second there. Um, that is the gremlins of the internet. Obviously everything is um, suffering at the moment. So we just had a little off there. I apologize. I take full responsibility. It is 100% my fault. I am the problem here. Um, but if you refresh, if you have any problems like that, just hit refresh. And then within a within a minute or two, it'll, it'll be back on for you. Um, so that's all good. Did you see my fundraising everywhere, Mark? Let's just let's just have a pause and just have a nice calming sip of tea. Okay, so we have about um, maybe fifteen-ish minutes to the next section um, uh, session. So you're welcome to um, go to the bathroom, make a cup of tea. Obviously, uh, you can take your phone to the bathroom and continue watching. Please do not message me if you're sitting on the toilet uh, watching this. Um, that is entirely inappropriate i don't want that um and also make sure you wash your hands um obviously so now i am going to bring on uh louise if he if she's here so please welcome louise morris uh from summit fundraising hello louise oh i can't hear you louise oh maybe it's me or maybe it's you um uh, this we could be doing the whole thing in in sign language i hear some noise there i hear a beep but i don't hear your voice um, I could definitely hear you in the session, so that's okay. So while we have a look at Louise's um, microphone or what's going in there, these could be these gremlins again, just um, just catching up on us. Um, but please do um, come into the question box and ask any questions for Louise. Um, one of the things that I really liked about um, Louise's thing, one of the one of the quotes in there, she said was about major donors. Um, the quote, now is the best time to donate because you can have the most impact. Um, and actually, I think that's such a um, such a good spin on it because obviously it is, it does feel like, you know, there's the urgency there. And obviously when we create urgency in our asks, um, then it's going to, um, it makes such a big impact to people. But people want to have impact. They want to have ownership of what they're donating to. So if we can provide that to them and show them that now is the time to have such an impact, that's a great little phrase. So I really like that. Um, and then hopefully we can we can I want to delve a bit deeper into these conversations because because it can be intimidating to call uh, major donors or high net worth individuals, especially when you're in unusual circumstances. You might be used to um, you might be used to talking to major donors in person. You might be used to you used to talking to uh, major donors, uh, you know, arranging meetings for them. And so suddenly we're all into um, into unfamiliar territory, you know. So we have to kind of figure out what is the best way to interact with them, um, what is the best way for us to to actually have that conversation. Um, and so I'm going to try Louise again and just see if her mic is is working here. No, I can't hear you, right, Louise. Can can people at home? Yeah, no, a couple of people are saying you're silent as well, so it's it's not my side. Oh, that's a shame. Um, there might just be some issue here with um, with how it's recording, so I'm just going to leave Louise to try and 
see if we can fix that at the moment. Um, so I don't know what's happening. It's very strange, um, but I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, so what I'll do is I'll just kind of look through the questions. If we can get Louise uh, back in, um, then that'll be great. Um, well, let me see. I'll tell you what we do. I'll tell you what we do. If you take these two, three minutes to go and make yourself a cup of tea, make yourself a cup of coffee, whatever it is you need to do, I'm going to try and get Louise um, on the phone. I'll try and get a phone number for her. Um, and what I'll do, if I can get her phone number or WhatsApp or something like that, I'll contact her directly, uh, and then we'll we'll stream her in um, from there. Um, so yes, go make your tea, go make your coffee. We have about 15 minutes to the next session. You have about two or three minutes before we get Louise on. So go make your cup of tea, all right? Okay, we're gonna try this. We're gonna try and bring Louise on and see how we go. Uh, let's go for it. Hi, Louise. <laughs> I can't hear you. Yeah, do you wanna try and log in on your mobile? Um, so if you if you go to the same link we sent you, Louise, on your mobile, um, and then I'll bring it in, and then that'll definitely be working. Um, so there you go. I mean, these are things that happen in virtual events, and we have to we have to be prepared for that. It's not the end of the world. Uh, it means I can look through the comments and I can chat to you a little bit. Here's a question here from Katie, uh, who's saying, you spoke a lot about high net worth individuals who you had an existing relationship with. What about communicating with colder prospects who haven't necessarily spoke to you? Best to hold off or still plan initial contact? And I think that's a great question. You know, it's one thing checking in with existing um, major donors, but what's the story with, with um, acquiring new ones now? Um, I think that's definitely something that we want to ask. Uh, Louise when she comes in um, and because that's an interesting one because yeah I mean cold acquisition the other day you know I've heard mixed opinions about this some people saying cold acquisition is not the way to do it right now because um, pe so much uncertainty people are kind of staying loyal to where where they already were but having said that other people um, chimed in and they were saying that they've been doing acquisition mailings and acquisition campaigns and they've been getting great results someone I think someone yesterday said they got um they got double um, double their usual result. Um, so yeah, very strange. So I mean, it's worth testing. It's worth testing. I mean, obviously in fundraising, our existing supporters are always going to be a priority because they're going to give us the best um, return on investment or they're going to be most likely to respond to us. Um, so yeah, so all right, I'm going to, um, I'm going to, I think Louise is dialed in on her phone. So I'm going to try and do it. Um, but at least we get to see her again. Hi, Louise, can you hear me? And then, okay. Oh, hello. I hear like a beeping every time you speak. Okay. That's tech, baby. That's tech. Um, oh, wait. Okay. Here's Louise. Louise is coming in on her phone now. Sorry, I'm going to pull it. Hi, Louise. Are we on? We're on. Ah. Yes, oh thank you for I, your patience. I assumed, I thought you were going to have like a really strange voice because I've never, I've never like <laughs> spoken to you in person before. I thought like there was something weird going to happen there. How are you? Sorry, Sorry about, about that. That's missing. all right. These things happen. Yeah, I'm all good. Thanks for having me. These are tech issues, you know. We got to be realistic. We got to be Indeed. human. Everyone's all right. Indeed. But, um, thank you so much for being involved with this. Thanks to Summit no for um, for completely volunteering to be part of this and and being so quick in the turnaround time. We really appreciate that. Um, how are you how are you getting on on a personal I'm level? All right. um, I've, I'm homeschooling with working. Um, yeah, we're we're managing. There's yeah. some moments of joy and some moments I really wish my kids were at school and I was just at work. But you know that's life right now. We're lucky. Yeah. We're healthy. We're all good. Family are all well. So I, yeah, you've a, it's you've all a good. five year old and eight more? year old. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I've an I've an eight year old. Yeah, mm. it's um it's good fun. Them. 
Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> um, that was a great session. That was a great session, and lots of stuff jumped out of me. But I was just, I was saying while you were connecting there, um, that that quote you were saying about to talk to major journalists and talk about how now is the time to really have impact. I think that's a really excellent point. Um, how are donors responding to that? Do they see this as the time for them to step up, or or is it mixed? I think, I think yes. I mean, most high net worth individuals already giving. They're philanthropists. They have their own motivations for making the world a better place and for giving back, and that's going to be very individual. Mm -hmm. That's not going to stop because of the pandemic. If anything, it's increasing, and you know we've seen funds opening day after day. Yeah. Um. So from different philanthropists wanting to do different things and it is going to depend on individual circumstances if they still feel certain enough about their wealth to give and to give big mm. but yeah definitely definitely all right good there are a few questions in the box um about um and you touched on it about kind of acquisition as opposed to care of existing mm. donors What's your thoughts on acquisition? Is that grinding to a halt or is it, is it still open for business with some people? Um, cold. So going to high net with individuals that don't already know your charity. Mm. Frankly, it's always tough. Yeah. If you don't have a way in and one of the ways lots of charities would get around that is to really put on an experience or an event that's particularly special. Yeah. Um, you can't do that right now. And I am um, advising all the charities I'm working with to focus on who knows them already or who they know. So who yeah. their trustees know, maybe there's a donor who can't help now, but they know someone else who might be interested in your cause. And that's, I think, as far away, my opinion is, as, as how kind of cold you're going to go. Because actually the philanthropists who don't know your charity right now and the high net worth individuals, they've got other causes and yeah. if they're on it, they'll be calling them up and saying this is a really tough time for us. It's going to be really hard for you to cut through that if they don't know you as an individual and if they don't know the charity already. Because building that trust takes time. I mean, even at the best times you're talking, it could be a year or two to tr to, to build that trust. So you got to mm. start with people who know you or people who know your board, your staff, like pe people who, who you can you can almost leapfrog that trust building because you've already known exactly. them. No, exactly. Nick. All right. Um, you talked about not cancelling events, and obviously, myself and Nikki at fundraising everywhere. We, you know, we've been saying to everyone, don't cancel events. There's virtual alternatives <laughs> to everything, and we've been trying to help as many, many people as possible. Um, but people are still cancelling events, aren't, aren't they? Like, is it what is it? Is it a fear of technology, or is it just um, you know, let's just shut everything down and regroup? What are, What are people thinking? Well, there was a definite panic, and I think we've all been there. We can call it panic. Um, particularly, you know, guidance has come out at different times for different countries. But if you've got, if you've had a physical event coming up within a month and all of a sudden there was lockdown, what do you do? You cancel it. You try mm. and people haven't had the headspace, I don't think, to think at that point in time about moving it elsewhere. I think people are getting more headspace now and people are starting to think more about doing live webinars. There are charities already doing it. Um, I was speaking to a hospice yesterday and they want to do a kind of peer-to-peer -peer event where one of their yeah. trustees gets in contact with his high net worth friends and they're gonna make that an exclusive webinar where okay. they have got contact to the consultant at the hospice they're doing some really interesting stuff around COVID-19 mm -hmm. so I am seeing it move a bit but then I also think it's what mindset you're in and as I said it's no what not it's not any fundraiser's fault if you're thinking I don't I just cancelled it and I'll just yeah. wait till things get back to normal because it's hard yeah. um so I think you've got to change the mindset into what are the opportunities and actually people might be around in the evening now more mm -hmm. than maybe they were before and and just not being afraid to fail i think i'm seeing so much more innovation that we didn't have before that's one yeah. of the great things i think in in all yeah. walks and if they can just just try it if you get three people there you get three people there it doesn't matter yeah. if you get 30 brilliant yeah i think i think that's a that's a great point about not being afraid to fail you know i think we're we're afraid of running things because 
the tech might you know crash the microphone might not work i might forget to turn my microphone off the whole thing went out for a second you know all stuff. but pe people are very forgiving aren't they if you're if you're mm. kind of open and honest about it like we i mean i'm not Hopefully. only great, it, yeah it's just like like i mean i i just think our sector we don't necessarily have to be at, at a level where um you know that that they're kind of that we hold hollywood to in terms of production values in terms of efficiency mm. it's just about seeing the human side of the work we're doing isn't it and and anyone can do that if there's mistakes along the way failure we learn from failure right yeah and you know my pilates teacher did her first online class on monday night and she said i've been worrying about this all day but she got on yeah. there early she had a husband to help her behind the scenes and if you're really that worried do a run through yeah. you know to put your mind at ease if you really are very anxious and technology problems is another great leveler as well as the pandemic you know what ceo has not had zoom calls or whatever platform they're using yeah. in the last week that haven't frozen and people go i can't hear you i can't hear you. <laughs> everybody's had it so yeah. you know again in a way um it's it's the, it's the human side of what you're yeah. doing and you're trying to bring it to them i don't think anybody would you know be negative for you trying to bring what yeah. you're doing to 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 a high net worth audience i don't think the high net worth would be thinking that way at all yeah 100 percent. i think that's an amazing point and i think kids running in and i think animals coming across the screen and stuff like that you know we get really embarrassed about it and feel really awkward mm. but i don't know anyone who gets annoyed by it like no one's like oh god the kids come in again like everyone understands everyone kind of mm. laughs along with it again it's exactly. like it just brings humanness to it doesn't it exactly um can i ask you you for high net worth you um high net worth individuals major donors you know in my fundraising career it's generally of the 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 ilk that you're not asking on the phone you know you're generally trying to get a meeting or you're tra generally trying to get them to the event or something like that because face-to-face -face works so much better we Ooh. don't have a face-to-face -face option now so is there anything we need to think about in terms of making an ask in a video chat like is that is that crazy awkward or is that is it just we just carry on as, as we were no absolutely not there's you know, a lot of evidence that suggests, you know, we all know that over half of our communication is visual. So don't do it on the phone if you can at all avoid it. It will mm. be tougher. It will be more yeah. difficult for you. It will be more difficult for them. And I don't think it, if, you, if you're if you having a more formal meeting and you can get some time, then yes, set up a Zoom meet. But actually, if you're calling somebody and you realise they can FaceTime or you're WhatsApping them, you can actually ask to switch yeah. to video then to yeah. see them and I think people are so much more used to that I called my mate down the road last night she was on whatsapp sending me a message and I just video called her I would never have done that two yeah. weeks ago I would yeah. have messaged her back and I started messaging her back so we are all craving kind of more human connection yeah and you know you can you can use that as an excuse if you want you're my first meeting today can we please see each other rather than just speak you know i'm stuck in my house with my dog or whatever yeah um so i i think making the ask like this brilliant i think mm -hmm. it's really hard to do it's difficult to do on the phone but if you know the donor very well you'll be in a better position without having a video link to do it on the phone mm -hmm. but i think that's a great point like if you only have a video uh, a phone number to actually start the conversation there as you would have and then move it move it into a virtual setting straight away and people seem to be used to that it's funny you're talking about your friend we me and my friends from school we taught we did a vid group video chat it's the first time we've done it in 20 years you know we could have done it a year ago nice. we could have done it before but suddenly it's like all this virtual chat like people are just into it um just we have a couple minutes just this question and actually this is a big question so you, you probably Ooh. need more time um but robert, <laughs> robert d is asking um, about the future, you know, so so are philanthropists still making major gifts? You know, there's some out there that mm. are, it's, you know, people are still regrouping. But what do you think is going to happen long term? You, I mean, are you the only person <laughs> well who knows? Because no one, else, no one else has a clue. Well, fortunately or unfortunately, I'm not an economist. Um, I don't know. There, there's a school of thought that says everything bounced back after 2009. There's yeah. no reason why it won't this time. Yeah. Uh, my personal feeling is this is quite different, but I think yeah. there will still be wealth. And I think you have to be aware of your individual major donors and their prospect situations. You should be following the companies they're CEOs of. You should know if they go under, you should know if they're furloughing staff, you yeah. should know what they're up to. Um, so, you know, put Google alerts or whatever you can on those. So you, you need to be aware of what the individual circumstance is, but, the wealth the wealthy before now are getting wealthier 
I don't see any sign of that changing afterwards. We know the most vulnerable in our society are still the most vulnerable and are rapidly getting poorer through this pandemic. Mm -hmm. So I think it's going to be very much individual, high net worth to high net worth. Make sure you know what's going on. So you yeah. don't call someone and ask about their company when it's just been in the headlines for going under. Um, but there will be wealth out there and people will want to give because the need is going to be greater, not just now with the COVID-19 response, but the aftermath of it. I don't want to depress anyone too much, but it's hard. It's, it's hugely difficult for a lot of societies. Some charities are going to be going under. They have gone under already. So what you're doing as a charity, if you're surviving, is going to be needed more than ever. Mm -hmm. So that that need is not going to go away and the wealth isn't go, going to go away. So mm -hmm. your role is to put the two together and inspire those people to give. Perfect. All right. Listen, thanks a million, Louise. Really appreciate you taking the time out of your um, your busy Pilates schedule. <laughs> to come. I know, it's tough. <laughs> Um, but really nice to see you. That was really helpful. And um, thank you for answering questions and stuff like that. Thank you. And Look. thanks for your patience with the tech. Yeah, that's great. Look after yourself. Thanks, Melian. Um, so that was that was Louise. Please do go find her, do follow her. Um, the great stuff from Summit Fundraising. That was a great session. Again, like all sessions, um, it will be available within 24 hours after uh, the conference uh, for you to watch back or or do whatever you want. I don't, I don't, I don't mind. Um, so coming up now uh, in less than a minute, on this track, we have um, a section about face-to-face uh, -face teams around the world. Um, so the the first face-to-face -face fundraising conference was scheduled scheduled to be happening in November. Is scheduled to be happening in November. Obviously, you know, um, there's a lot of talk for face-to-face -face organizations. What do we do now? Charities that relied on face-to-face -face fundraising, what's happening? So we've got a really special session coming up here um, where a number of different face-to-face -face fundraisers uh, and agencies from around the world will be sharing their opinion. We won't have time for a Q&A because it's a slightly longer session. And, and in fact, you'll see the sessions a little bit clipped at the end, um, but you'll get the full version uh, in your Dell notes. Um, so yeah, we're gonna head over here, uh, over to that in, in a second. And then over on track one with Nikki Bell um, is crafting digital campaigns with Madeline Stanionis. It's a good session also worth checking out, um, but let's head over to the face-to-face -face crew and see. So hello, I'm Peter Steinmeier from the Austrian Fundraising Association. I'm organizing the first international face-to-face -face fundraising congress in November in Vienna, Austria. And today I've invited uh, uh, four guests, uh, international fundraising experts. It's my first online panel discussion. I hope everything uh, goes well and the internet connection of us uh, is good enough. And let me introduce you, Daryl Upsall, international fundraising expert and consultant. Uh, he will moderate uh, this session. Thanks, Daryl, very much. And the floor is yours, Daryl. Thanks, Peter. Um, welcome, everybody. And it's my pleasure to welcome Elspeth Ritter from Save the Children International, Roland Kasker, Kaski. Uh, from WWF International and Daniel McDonald from UNICEF, uh, all of them working at the international headquarters, all of them with international responsibility for face-to-face -face and a wealth of experience to draw upon. Clearly, we're in extraordinary times. Face-to-face uh, -face fundraising always seems to have extraordinary moments, whether it's the economic crisis or criticism in the media sometimes, but it's also the world's most powerful and most successful tool in the last 20 years at recruiting monthly donors. So really when something like uh, COVID-19 hits us, it really affects us and ultimately our beneficiaries for the, those organizations in terms of slowing down our income. The great Thing about the panel today is they're going to share with us some fantastic innovations the way they're handling it and hopefully they'll be learning for everybody listening to this uh, broadcast so over to you the panel um would you like to introduce yourselves briefly or just wave to the audience <laughs> <laughs> uh, yep <laughs> Um, yeah, happy to introduce. You've already done a great job on that, Daryl. Uh, but yeah, I'm, uh, I'm Elspeth, work for Save Children International. I'm the global face-to-face -face fundraising specialist. And I look currently after um, 26 face-to-face -face markets globally. Thanks, Elspeth. Roland. So I'm Roland Chackey from WWF International, heading a small team called Global Development Center. 
we're helping our offices to go with their fundraising programs. And I've been involved in face-to-face for over 15 years now, currently in Hungary, experiencing the first lockdown measures exactly today. Thanks, Roland and Daniel. Uh, yeah, I'm Daniel McDonnell. I'm the uh, Global Face-to-Face Specialist uh, for UNICEF, currently working from home in Manchester, like most of you uh, watching this. Uh, not working from home in Manchester, but working from home. Um, and uh, <laughs> I oversee uh, UNICEF's face-to-face um, uh, operation, which uh, uh, works in 48 countries globally. Thank you very much, all of you. First off, uh, how has COVID-19 or coronavirus impacted your international face-to-face programs around the world? Has this varied sort of region or continent? What are the, what are the differences to one of your experience? Uh, let's see, let's see. Um, Daniel, tell us more. Yeah, um, so I think it's it's probably fair to say that the impact of COVID-19 on face-to-face for UNICEF has been pretty devastating. Um, we uh, we were the largest, I believe, the largest face-to-face operation on Earth up until uh, probably mid-February, and uh, and then we started to see uh, shutdown in markets. It started off in uh, Southeast Asia, so um, South Korea, Hong Kong, Japan first, uh, and then um, Italy came after that. Strangely. Um, and then we, uh, Europe pretty much followed uh, soon after that, so all countries in Europe. Then we bounced back to Southeast Asia where we started to see shutdowns in um, Indonesia, Philippines, Malaysia, India, Thailand. Then over to the Americas, the US, Canada followed pretty swiftly by South America. So out of 48 face-to-face markets, um, uh, all of them shut down uh, over over the course of about eight weeks. Now three are back up and running. Um, funnily enough, the ones closest to where the outbreak started, so Japan, South Korea, and Hong Kong are back up and running. Um, slightly lower productivity uh, because there's less people on the streets, but they are back out and fundraising all the same, which is kind of the light at the end of the tunnel and uh, shows that there is, there is hope. Um, and uh, and yeah, I mean, the, yeah, the impact's been absolutely huge. I could go into more detail, but that's probably the, the top line for now. Thanks, Daniel. Elspeth, how about you? Um, very much, very similar to Denny and UNICEF. Um, same thing for us. South Korea was my first market to call me that they were suspending. And to be honest, it's like that came as a, um, you know, it, it just happened so fast. We're like, oh, I didn't think of that. And then it literally snowballed around the region. Um, it was like the first ones were South Korea, Japan, Hong Kong. Uh, Hong Kong reduced activity, then they were fully closed. And then it went on to Europe and then it bounced back to Asia, like Denny was saying, and then the Americas followed. Um, so it's very, very similar um, situation. Um, I think about a week or two ago, literally changed by the hour. Um, there were markets updating me like we're closing, we're looking to close and now we're closed. Um, it, it literally like updated by hour. It's like I couldn't even keep up with the messages anymore. Um, so right now everybody closed, um, <laughs> except as UNICEF as well, um, Southeast Asia and um, South Korea has opened again, which I'm very excited about. They've um, opened again as of 60% as of yesterday um, or end of this week. So that's good. Hong Kong is open, but on the verge of closing for possibly a few days, reviewing the situation. Uh, for us, Japan is still closed and every other market is still closed. So very, very similar. Thank you. And Roland, what about WWF? Well, the situation is quite uh, similar to the organization, to the other organizations, obviously. Um, we, most of the markets, uh, we had to close down, uh, suspend the operations, but there are some exceptions. We never really fully closed down in Singapore and Philippines, strangely, though the team numbers went down significantly. So it's only a couple fundraisers out there on the street. And again, similar to the others, uh, Korea is coming back. uh, And I believe a few other uh, Southeast Asian markets might do the same thing. Europe is completely out for the moment. And Latin America just recently did the same thing. And the only market in uh, in Africa, South Africa, which we believe might survive without a suspension, actually, they had to due to a government decree. 
Well, thank you for that. I mean, the, the, like you say, all of you, there's light at the end of the tunnel. That's um, that's quite encouraging for the rest of us who are in closed down or entering closed down. I appreciate that. And and what about trends in other channels? Has COVID-19 therefore led to a change in the way your organizations are using and the kind of results you're getting from other channels like telephone, digital, threat response, TV? Let, let's hear more. Elspeth, how about you? Um, yes, at the moment we're all looking to minimize or uh, the risk or mitigate um, our risks away. So we're looking at um, increasing activities in other channels like DRTV and like digital lead conversion. Um, we're also trying to move all our teams from face to face into telemarketing um, for a number of reasons. First of all, retention of the teams, um, the, the contingency of the face to face channel for after this crisis as well working together with our agencies on this. But yes, at the moment, we're definitely in pretty much all markets are focusing on how can we reduce the risk and the impacts on our overall fundraising activities um, by looking at other activities like DRTV, digital leads, telemarketing, anything really <laughs> that's working at the moment. Um, it changes by market as well, like what the public is still accepting. Um, some markets telemarketing is working, some markets is not working. Same with DRTV, it depends on the topic of DRTV. So at the moment it's a market by market basis, but globally we are looking to, um, to work with the other channels and reduce budget and uh, move budget over and reduce risks. Thanks a lot. Danny, what about you to say? You've got a lot of countries there. Yes, on? yeah, we have. Um, I mean, again, not too dissimilar to to what the Save, Save the Children are trying to do. Um, uh, obviously, the, we've got a lot more people at home um, uh, in this situation. So, uh, and also UNICEF have a, a big uh, global fundraising target to achieve because we're uh, literally providing supplies to uh, countries around the world, uh, wash supplies mainly. Um, and uh, and so drtv uh telemarketing um uh, digital facebook um although actually uh, facebook have said that we can't uh, can't do uh, covid-19 uh, marketing um uh and we're seeing good results in some markets in in some others so we've seen some some countries where uh we've received complaints from people who are, are being asked and uh other countries where we're seeing a fantastic response actually spain where you're based right now daryl you probably know unicef have been working um, on the ground there and um, we're getting a fantastic response from the public because we are supporting the public but uh, it's a mixed bag but yeah i mean drtv digital tm is is pretty much where we're trying to put all of our resources right now thanks a lot roland is uh, wwf seeing switching in resources or changes of response to different channels I think it's really depending on on the area the organization is working on. Uh, so what's the subject that we fundraise for? Uh, what I can see is that uh, organizations working with, on humanitarian, especially health issues, they probably connect better to the current crisis and they have something to say about it. For us working on the environment, this is a really distant topic. Right, and obviously our topic is not on the top of the mind of people today. So, of course, we did the same thing, shifted budgets, um, went for TV and, uh, and digital. But as far as I can see, like single donations immediately vanished in, in critical markets like Spain and Italy. Basically, as soon as, interestingly, as soon as the lockdown, the curfew happens, the single donations disappear. Mm, Luckily, uh, existing face-to-face -face donors are still still with us, so we don't experience an, an increased attrition rate so far. Obviously, this is only a few weeks into the crisis, so the situation might change when the economic downturn, when the unemployment will really hit people, right? But on the short term, for us as environmental organization, the, the shift uh, to other channels is more limited, I believe, than, for example, for UNICEF. Thanks a lot. That's a good point to raise there, Roland. Um, in terms of preparation for the future economic impact, have any of you put in place anything that will kind of help build loyalty or deal with donors who are coming to you saying, I've lost my job or my income's just crashed? Are you putting in 
I don't know, donation holidays or potential downgrade campaigns on the back burner ready to go? Who wants to jump in there? So, so I think that's partially what you can use face-to-face -face fundraisers for at the moment, right? As soon as it's impossible to work on the street, but you don't want to let them go. Uh, also, because you want to be, you want to be with them. They are part of your family, but also be, because you want to preserve them for the eventual restart of fundraising. So you immediately move your fundraisers to telemarketing. This is the closest kind of operation that they know about. Yeah. And doing a lot of uh, welcome, uh, sorry, not welcome, more like thank you calls and, um, and upgrades and downgrades. Everything is possible still. We still experience even upgrades, interestingly. Of course, in a selected audience. Uh, and then it, I think you just have to be flexible. Mm. Giving breaks, giving downgrades, everything is better than, than breaking up with the donor. Similar experience? <laughs> Are you having the same sort of experiences? Yeah, definitely. I think uh, I think uh, Roland uh, summed it up nicely. Actually, um, you just have to be agile. Um, uh, I think it's really important that we're going out to donors right now and letting them know that they're more more important now than ever, um, and uh, and and using this extra resource in face to face fundraisers who would otherwise be idle, um, and and getting them to support us in that, especially when you've got call centres as well, TM call centres that are being shut. Uh, all over all over the place and so um, getting fundraisers working from home and, and calling donors but also you know potentially doing emergency cash cash reactivations um, trying to re reactivate on hold donors um, and uh, and just wherever possible trying to make sure that we we're looking after the donors that we have and and um, and getting new donors in um, uh, as and where you can also Similar? It's exactly the same for us. Yeah, um, we've got we're looking into moving all the teams into telemarketing as well as some of them have already started in some markets. <clears throat> so it depends on the market as uh, both Ronald and Danny were saying as well. It depends on the market. It depends on what situation that market is in. Like here in Spain, we're in complete lockdown. Um, so the ask might be different here as it would be, for example, in Holland or in wherever. Um, but yeah, it's like we're doing an, a mixture of like loyalty calling, thank you calling, gratitude calling, also upgrading, also um, people that never made payments and see if we can reactivate them or sort of bring them on board. So yeah, it's a mixture of all of that. But in these times as well, we're also um, looking after donors and making sure that they know that we're, we're on the ground as well, that we're working on it and that we're showing that as well that people know that we are not asking for money for our programs, but also like that we're doing something in this crisis. And that's also what we're trying to weave in in our propositions for telemarketing. Um, again, that depends by market, which markets have started domestic programming around. So it's a mixture of all of that, but the key here is the loyalty to your donors. Mm -hmm. Actually, moving on and on a similar theme, I understand quite a few of you have redeployed in-house face-to-face fundraising teams not just on telemarketing, which are uh, telephone fundraising, as I prefer to call it, but, um, but into other activities. Can you, can you share with us some of the other things that perhaps your face-to-face -face fundraisers are doing during this downtime? I understand some quite creative ideas, as well as using them to build donor loyalty and on the telephone. What else have you been doing with your, your, your teams, presumably in-house teams? Um, so uh, yeah, I mean it's, uh, it's again it varies market by market, but I mean we've got um, around about four thousand face-to-face fundraisers who represent UNICEF um, around the world, and, and we're trying to keep them as active as possible. So um, uh, trying to uh, get them to do TM from home, but we're we're also just trying to keep them active and happy. So um, we've been focusing a lot on uh, engagement and uh, upskilling. So even though we're not out there fundraising, kind of keeping the face-to-face -face, uh, or fundraiser skills sharp so we've been running uh, uh, training after training after training you know sharing uh, inspiring uh, stories from uh, from the field uh, sharing TED talks um, videoing ourselves uh, um, uh, I mean as just just trying to connect with each other um, from from our own homes via social media via Skype via Zoom 
um, and uh, and keep everybody motivated and focused and happy and reminding them that uh, hopefully sooner rather than later we'll all be back out on the field and, and we need to be ready to rock when that happens. Um, yeah. We've uh, we've also had uh, fundraising teams that have been going out in, in some markets doing a little bit of advocacy as well for wash. So rather than fundraising, uh, just uh, encouraging people to, to to wash their hands and 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 stay clean and and uh, and whatnot. Um, but uh, but other than that, I mean, it's it's tricky because obviously in quite a lot of markets it's complete lockdown. So um, you're pretty limited to, to what you can do from your own home. Um, uh, that's 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 pretty much the state of play with UNICEF. I don't know about uh, WWF Save the Children. Danny, can you just explain for our listeners uh, what WASH is? I know probably everybody on this call knows, but uh, uh, just explain what WASH, because it's an acronym, and most yes. people it's just washing hands. It's a lot more than that. Yeah, it's, it's hygiene, sanitation, um, and uh, water. Um, and access to it. Uh, so, uh, so just basically making sure that uh, people are uh, staying hygienic, staying clean, uh, having access uh, to those kind of facilities as well. Because obviously, in the more developing markets, um, that's uh, not so much a given. Um, so, UNICEF are doing uh, uh, supplying, uh, delivering supplies from uh, from our warehouse in Denmark to a lot of these developing markets. So, people have access to simple things like soap. And, and clean running water and actually know how to uh, wash their hands and 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 so it seems like a very basic and simple thing but actually especially in this current climate is incredibly important um does that make sense yeah thanks a lot also, what about you obviously you're covering the same areas but and, and i'll come on to um to roland as well is, is are there other creative redeployments of, of your face-to-face -face fundraisers um, not so much redeployment because as we were all saying like telemarketing is the field that's kind of closest to face to face it's very transferable um, when markets were not in full lockdown yet in some markets we did like uh, Africa scene stewardship and flyering um, at the doors but that's also not possible anymore because most of us are in lockdown now so that was very short-lived <laughs> but you know it was a try um, but while we have in some markets fundraisers at home, uh, we're trying to engage them, just like Danny was saying, by a lot of training, um, by virtual catch-ups, um, by having virtual lunches together. I think South Africa mentioned yeah. to me that they were having a virtual drinks night. Um, but yeah, we're trying to engage them by um, video messages from CEOs to the fundraisers and telling them like how amazing they are and how much we need them, how important they are to us. Um, having guest speakers, so for example, doing a training session on the programs that we run, but then also have somebody who works in the programs doing a guest presentation, um, or having a fundraising director doing a direct address to all the fundraiser, all the fundraisers, like we will be back out there, we will come back to this, and we support you. Um, more guest speakers from different areas, like emergency areas or people that have been to the field, to refugee camps, to any projects that they've been involved in, <clears throat> to talk about that, to really engage the fundraisers. Um, and for me, with my global face-to-face -face community, um, I've set up weekly drop-in clinics where we literally come together. Um, I've got one call in the morning for Asia Pacific and half of Europe. The other half is the Americas and the other half of Europe in the afternoon. Um, to basically together um, talk about how are we tackling this in our face-to-face, -face? like how do we keep our teams engaged. So Italy is doing amazing training programs, so we're sharing that with all the other markets, so other markets can then use that as well. Um, for example, if Canada is doing something fantastic, they discuss that in the group, so we can all share from the best practices. Um, also to have a weekly sort of touch touch base with everybody, see somebody else than your, your regular team that you work in. Um, but it's all about engaging the fundraisers, but also engaging my, my global face-to-face -face managers to work with them on um, sharing the, the best practices across the market. So it's a lot of interactive stuff that's going on. Um, but yeah, most of it is either virtual training, guest speakers, all of that, or moving them into telemarketing. Great, thanks a lot. Roland, what about you and your colleagues? During the early days of uh, the crisis, we had a bit more creative solutions. Um, like in Singapore, we moved some of the fundraisers into back office uh, just to deal with some of the paperwork that was piled up um, before. Obviously, when the lockdown starts, that's no longer an option. And in, the other one was in Kenya, where we 
just before the crisis, we shifted our fundraisers to do some uh, education work in schools uh, about the environment. It's a unique way of fundraising and, uh, and engagement in a, in a quite unique market. And now we're experiencing how to do that digitally in a really not digital market. So that's kind of interesting, but I agree uh, it's only a small number of fundraisers compared with the, with the whole range of fundraisers that we have and should take care of. The other bit is engagement. Uh, we organize a lot of uh, trainings for them. Um, the most interesting is trying to connect them with field, fundraiser, uh, field experts, conservation experts who are somewhere out there in the jungle or at the beach and other remote areas. Talk directly. So it's kind of learning exercise. It's interesting, isn't it? Um, obviously, one of the biggest challenges we all face, and I speak wearing my uh, co-owner of an agency on face-to-face, -face, is actually recruiting and retaining face-to-face -face fundraisers. And that's in normal times. Right now, we're having to not recruit face-to-face -face fundraisers, but retain, motivate, keep them. It's an interesting thought about when we come out the other end, which we clearly will, because we're having that evidence from Asia already, is will it be easier to recruit face-to-face -face fundraisers and keep them, partly because there are less jobs out there, there is going to be an economic impact, and we know in times of crisis it's harder, economic crisis, it's easier rather to recruit telephone fundraisers, face-to-face -face fundraisers, or, and, you're, and this is a, you know, I'd love your opinion on this, or will it be harder because people would say that job involves literally face to face? I don't want to be in such close proximity to people I don't know. Any thoughts on that? Come on, uh, Roland. I think the wisdom of crowd applies here, and people forget. People end up very quick when the real trouble starts, and people forget very quick after the trouble is over. So I would expect. Uh, that meeting people in the future, I mean, once the, uh, the uh, pandemic pri uh, crisis is over, it won't be the real issue anymore. Actually, I believe a lot of people will be looking for in-person touch because they will be fed up with the TV and, uh, and the virtual calls. So they want to meet real people. But then the real question, I think, is what you just raised, uh, whether you want to you wanna keep your fundraisers at all price and preserve them for the, the afterlife, or you just simply look for new fundraisers like you start, uh, start fresh? And I believe the answer is between the two. Okay. Definitely it's gonna be a new recruitment game, but the way you deal with your fundraisers today, it's somehow gonna enter the cognitive mind of the crowd, right? So if you are dealing harsh with, the, uh, with your fundraisers, it, the word will spread out. Maybe it's not the same fundraiser who will say, no, I won't come back, but I heard of someone who has been dealt badly, so yes. I won't come back. Interesting. Thanks. Yeah, I think that's a really, really, really good point. Um, I would also say that, uh, you know, in financial crisis, um, when people are being close to a problem, they're a lot more uh, empathetic towards it. And so, uh, so, you know, if we look at the financial crash, uh, back in 2008, um, uh, actually, uh, I was managing face-to-face -face operations in the UK then. And funnily enough, during the financial crash, we found that people were more giving mm -hmm. um, and uh, and our, our productivity actually increased. So I wouldn't be surprised if we saw the same when we got back out uh, doing face-to-face -face around the world, that people would be um, more open to supporting charitable causes and um, I think the recruitment is uh, is going to be a challenging one there's there's definitely no doubt that we won't be going back out at 100% capacity around the world straight away it's going to be a slow growth back to where we were um, I think that I, I have I have complete confidence in the fact that we will get back to where we were prior to this but it's going to take time and um, and there might be some people who feel disillusioned um, uh, after afterwards um, but there might be some people who feel even more motivated um, uh, to get back out especially if you've spent two months stuck in your living room um, <laughs> you're going to want to you'll be screaming to get out to speak to people and engage in conversation um, but it's, it's going to be interesting to see what happens all the same definitely I see you nodding there Elspeth yeah <laughs> 
Um, yeah, I agree with everything that both Roland and Denny were saying. Um, I think one key thing right now is like how you deal with your agencies, your suppliers and your fundraising staff. Um, we're all in this crisis together. And I think this is also the time to, to be human, but fair. And, you know, we do need, still need to think about the business. But at the same time, um, and I know all of us on the call are doing the same, we're really trying to look after our fundraisers as in what can we do for them? What can we do with them? How can we work best with our suppliers and agencies to help them look at looking after their staff and what are the possibilities? So we're not promising things that we can't follow up on, but at the same time, we are dealing with our fundraising staff, our, our face-to-face -face teams who are of huge importance to us across the world. Um, so yeah, so that's my, one of my first priorities here. Um, going back out there, like both Danny and Roland were saying, I think on one hand, it might be easier to attract more and new staff because possibly, unfortunately, more people will be looking for a job. Equally, people might have also lost their job and will be less um, willing to give. But I think that's also the strength of the face-to-face -face channel. Um, people might not wake up and, and you know, think like, let's go online and actively look for an opportunity to donate. But at the same time, if they see a fundraiser on the street, they have just been through hard times themselves. They have a really good conversation. It will be that personal touch that makes people donate and become a donor. So looking after our staff now, first of all, because these are our staff and we need to look after them. But second of all, as well, like it's the strength of the face-to-face -face channel. It's the people that make it happen. So looking after them now will give us the benefit in the long run and help us get through this all together. But um, I do agree. It will be challenging times. We won't go out there hundred percent straight away. It will be a slow buildup. We will have lost teams in some markets, hopefully not too many, but we don't know how long this is going to be for, how long this will take. So, I am expecting to go back out there, reduce capacity and having to build up in some markets, if not all. Thank you. And picking up on that point, Danny, from 2008, um, I, uh, I spoke at the IFC on that uh, crisis. We had a special almost all night session there. And the experience we had in Spain with our face to face and telephone, as, as you've indicated, is actually those that were in employment, those who had survived the crisis, not just middle class, I'd say, because the middle class were quite hit in Spain from redundancies in that period. Their generosity went through the roof. It was an exceptionally generous year. People were exceptionally open to face to face, which is the preferred channel. I mean, the public actually state that in surveys, the preferred channel to give above anything else. Um, and it was not a crisis for the organizations in the market. And I think we offered then all of us doing face to face an opportunity for those that felt there but for the grace of God go I in work and with an income that they could therefore show this word in Spanish that's used a lot in these times solidarity by giving to a variety of causes and interesting for you Roland I don't think it actually only was humanitarian causes that were rising at that point I think people gave generous the causes that were passionate about that's true, Daryl, but that's a different kind of crisis. I agree. Right? That was that was an only economic crisis, and I agree. If it's a mild to medium economic crisis, which probably happens every decade once, yes. that still leaves a big number of people staying employed, and they feel the the pressure to give because the problems are bigger. This is why in two thousand and eight, I think every single international charity grew its income. From UNICEF all over to WWF and Greenpeace, everybody experienced growth. But this one might be different because here the crisis is actually connected to a single issue. It's a health issue. So we're not only talking about a money problem, but it's also connected with, with, a, with a media topic around one particular subject within the whole NGO scope. Mm -hmm. Could be, yeah. Um, we talked about you very briefly, the agencies um, Elspeth, and obviously largely we've been talking currently about your um, in-house face-to-face uh, fundraisers who, I think to quote the word, uh, part of the family, you were saying, some of you, and I, and I fully understand that. Are there any ways you've been trying to mitigate the situation, help through the crisis, your external agencies? Because they were fragile enough anyway, we've all seen 
decimations of agencies in, in various markets from Asia to Europe, Australia, etc., without a crisis. So anything you've been doing just to, to help them through that period? Yes, um, and I think this is especially the time where we really need to look after the, the relationship with our agencies and suppliers. Um, because it's not just us struggling with this, it's them as well. And especially the smaller ones, I think it's, it's of crucial importance here as well to make sure that they are not all going out of business. Um, because once we do go back out there, it's like we need each other. So um, for Save the Children, we've actively been approaching all our suppliers. Um, with some markets, I have actively approached the ones that work cross markets for us and spoke to them as in, hey, I know you're struggling the same way as we are struggling with our in-house programs. Um, let's talk about this together. What can we do together to help you help your staff? Um, so again, same sort of solutions that we're working on, getting even the agency staff either in our call centers or in um, remote calling options for them that we supply data or in any way that we can help them. So yeah, I think it's all about proactiveness, helping them get through this together with us because in the end, they are also fundraisers that work for us, whether it's directly for us or through an agency, they are still our fundraisers um, with shared responsibility between us and the agency. So I think proactiveness is the key here, looking for solutions together and looking at the long term as well, as in it's not just now for each for their own, it's also after this crisis, like how do we get through this together so then we still have that good relationship. They still want to work with us and we still need them. <laughs> and we still want to work with them as well. And how can we help you help your staff? That's for us has been the biggest key factor of like, being very proactive. Yeah. Danny, any, anything you've been doing in that sense with your agencies? Obviously there's a lot of them out there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, I, I've had some uh, calls from very concerned agency owners uh, from around the world who uh, who obviously um, are scared, uh, as, as I think we all are to a degree, around um, their ability to exist during this crisis and, and come out the other end. Um, and uh, and the same really as save the children. It's it's just trying to work with them uh, as 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 much as we can to support them as much as we can. Um, in in some markets, we're looking to convert uh, as as many of them as possible to working from home uh, call center staff. Uh, doing uh, doing thank you calls, um, doing uh, doing upgrade calls, uh, cash calls, um, and essentially still giving them a job and um, and uh, still being able to represent UNICEF, um, uh, engaging them in in motivation and training, um, and uh, and just wherever possible, I suppose, just trying to sustain that relationship and and show the agencies that we're there for them, we support them. And we want to make sure that we all come out of this uh, together uh, in a, in a positive way. But but it's hard. Yeah, um, yeah. It's uh, it's hard. Roland, what about yourselves? WW. I think at the beginning nobody un understood and accepted the fact that it's going to be a long-lasting crisis. What it seemed first was like a couple of weeks not on the street, and everybody is supposed to survive that. Everybody is supposed to have enough res reserves for that. And in a way, in Asia, it was closer to that, as you heard before, like, like Korea, Japan coming back after a couple of weeks of break. But Europe is very different because if you look at Spain or Italy or now UK coming and France, you can't even estimate how long it will still last in Italy uh, when you can come back to the street, right? So it definitely will be a question of months. And this is the moment I think we have to realize it's not simply a question of uh, use your reserves and then we will all be back as usual. So for us, it's a bit of new to figure out what we can do with the agencies, how we can help them. I think it's, it's a question of the next week to figure out what to do. Maybe while you share um, some of your organizations and clients of ours for our face-to-face -face agency in Spain, is a call was made to all of the people our face-to-face -face agencies serve to say, I know we're all in this together. The one way you can help us from surviving cash flow for a few months is can we hold back on the call to refund those donors that have dropped out within the payback period, the callback period. You know, we all have different languages for it. 
And immediately and unanimously, I know in Spain, all of our clients agree to do that, which means they still owe the money, but it means we at least have money to keep a very limited number of staff uh, available. And then when we come out of this strange situation where we've had to bankrupt, but you can come back, the strange, uniquely Spanish model they've created with the government, we will be able to go back and re-employ people because we have, you know, we haven't actually just drained the account immediately, um, which I think is a generous offer and and one that probably works for everybody. So it's an interesting thing for you to think about with your other agencies, maybe. No, we've uh, we I mean we've seen different things in different markets. So uh, we've seen uh, certain markets absolutely do that and say you know hold off on 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 uh, paying or clawing back the clawback. We have seen certain markets where they're offering uh, a percentage of, uh, of of the base wage to the fundraisers for a period of time. Um, uh, but I think that the, the huge uncertainty is how long is this going to go on for? Because obviously they are all uh, non-profits, charities out there who also have to play the cleaners and the cooks and the and the staff. And, and, and a lot of us also have now increased fundraising targets to to supply our beneficiaries with with support to get through this crisis, too. So um, it's it's a balance, isn't it? Um, but uh, but hopefully um, one that we can all come out uh uh, not as uh, not as hurt. Right. Thank you for that, guy. That was really interesting. I used to run a face to face agency, so it's like I was totally on the edge of my seat for that. Uh, thank you very much to Daryl Upsall, Elspeth Derrida, Roland Xaki, Daniel McDonald, and Peter Steinmeier. Um, thank you to all of you. Really sorry that I probably just messed up all your names, um, but also sorry that we had to cut that session uh, uh, short. Um, it was just a bit long for the slot. Obviously, we're trying to get in a lot of information, but in the downloads and the recordings that you'll get um, after the conference, uh, the full session will be there. There's a little bit more at the end there. Um, and obviously, uh, Daryl, Elspeth, Roland, Daniel, Peter, um, they're available to reach out and contact. They are um, part of this face-to-face -face Congress. It's the first ever face-to-face -face Congress in Austria in November um, from the 17th to 19th of November. Check it out at F2F dash fundraising.com f2f dash fundraising.com uh i i want to go to that but yeah i, I want to go that i want to speak at it and, or if you're doing a virtual version then let's do it here because that's what we do here on fundraising everywhere we help other people put on conferences virtually we help other people put on events so let's chat let's chat um that was really good thanks very much for that so bit of housekeeping we're about uh well we're over halfway through now i hope you're all doing well i hope you're all managing uh, i'm sorry we don't have q a time for the face to faces um but as i say reach out to them i hope you're all doing well the next session is starting in about um four minutes or just over four minutes we're going to go straight into ian mclintock's session uh in about four minutes and then ian's going to be around after that uh for some q a um, Nikki is over on the other stream on, on it. She's in room one. Of course I'm, I'm here in room two. Uh, how's Nikki getting on? Has anyone been over to there? Is she doing all right? Is everything still running? Is she still alive? Um, I would love to hear that. I, I miss her. I can't wait to reunite at the end of this conference. Um, so yeah, I hope you're doing really well. Uh, please continue to, um, have a chat in the, um, in the networking box underneath this video. Feel free to put out any questions. Uh, I saw Daryl Upsall is, is there and a few other people. Um, so, you know, you can ask your questions directly to the speakers there. That's one of the things we love doing uh, with fundraising everywhere is, is we get the speakers in the chat box. Um, we've got our, our uh, conference coming up in May. People like um, uh, Dan Pallada are going to be speaking on it and, and you'll be able to chat to them in the chat box. Um, so that's pretty, pretty, pretty cool. Do you know one of the things I love about this? and. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's kind of like frowned upon to say the positives of it, isn't it? But like um, seeing into people's houses, isn't it amazing? Like where, how, where else can you see into Daryl Upsall's house? And so suddenly it's like all these face-to-face -face people, all these fundraising legends, you're like sn snooping around at all their stuff. I love it. Um, that's all I want to do. It's fantastic. Okay, so where are we? We are coming up now um, to Ian's session. We're going to get it queued up for you now. Um, and so Ian, let me bring up Ian's bio because I don't want to miss anything out. Um, I'm looking forward to chatting, chatting to him um, after this. So obviously, if you have any questions or anything, then please um, 
do go ahead and put them in the question box throughout the session, uh, because as I said, Ian will be coming on afterwards and we'll be able to um, chat to him directly and ask him those questions. So do ask about your own organization, your own situation um, and see what's going on there. So this next session from Ian, um, Ian is from Charity Excellence Framework, who I'm sure you uh, have probably heard of. They work um, um, all over the place, and and their name seems to keep they seem to keep coming up for me. I don't know, um, but Ian is going to be talking about how to build your resilience and create a fundraising recovery strategy, which is obviously um, well needed right now. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to pass across to Ian um, Ian McClintock for his session, and then he he and I will be back here uh, for Q and A. Um, and in the meantime, yeah, just um, I hope you're all doing well. I hope you're all um, uh, um, enjoying this. What's over in Nikki's room? I forgot to tell you. So over in Nikki's room, uh, in room one, oh, we've got Liz, Liz Naganzi. She's talking about digital storytelling and virtual events to revive your fundraising. Um, so take your pick. But we're going to be around here with Ian, um, and I'm going to pass you across to Ian now. I'm Ian McClintock, uh, and my presentation will give you ideas and tools that will enable you to build resilience in your charity and also to create a fundraising recovery plan. Everything you need to do that is in the charity excellence folder in the conference resource base. Rebuilding fundraising is understandably at the forefront of everyone's mind, but that will be difficult and it will take time we currently don't have. The first half of my presentation, therefore, uses Charity Excellence Data Store data to identify how we can build that resilience. This can be done more quickly, will reduce costs to buy time, and make our fundraising more effective in the very difficult circumstances. I've worked at board executive level for 25 years, including numerous turnarounds and startups. But in a previous life, I built several very successful decision support systems for very large organizations. A kind of board digital mentor. Nobody was going to build one for us and they're really useful. So I did. The Charity Excellence Framework enables you to assess every aspect of your charity to drive increased impact and financial resist resilience. You just log in and start using it, and it's completely free. And here it is. This is aggregated data for the UK charity sector over the last 12 months. The overall performance dial is in the middle, governance is on the right, and on the left are individual priorities for action. These are analyzed in more detail in the three tables underneath. On the left, the stakeholder assurance table includes issues such as maximizing impact and keeping people safe from harm. In the middle, core functions such as strategy and income generation. And on the right, governance, the various aspects of the governance code such as diversity. Note that the performance dial is green and only five of the 21 underpinning indicators are amber. Amber means that the majority of charities report they're not performing well in these areas. Given the pressure the sector was under even before the crisis, that's surprisingly good. It shows just how effective charities really are, despite what we read in the media. And there's possibly more. At the outset of the crisis, I modified the system frameworks to enable charities to assess their preparedness to manage the virus crisis and to give them new toolkits I created that would enable them to do that. Initially, all the indicators were red, understandably. But these quickly moved to amber. And this is the current live display today. 28th of March, and it's now better still. There simply isn't nearly enough data yet to say that this is representative of the whole sector. But we need some good news, and this is perhaps an indication 
the charities are using their very limited resources and in very difficult circumstances, but responding very quickly and effectively to the crisis. Going back to the dashboard, you can click on any number to drill down into the underlying data. This is income generation. The help column on the right links you to people who can help you for free. And the resources icon gives you access to the huge resource base. The system indicators across the system show that a lack of funding is a key issue. But the majority of alerts don't relate to that, but rather to how we manage the resources we do have. Now, how does that help us to increase our resilience? It helps us to answer three key questions. What are the challenges we face? And how well placed are we to respond to those? And in light of that, how can we build our resilience going forward? So where are we right now? Well, as you probably all know, the lockdown itself is expected to last for about a month. The epidemic for three, with the impacts being felt obviously much longer than that. But even before the crisis, demand for services was increasing and some 20% of charities were already struggling financially. Last week, a new NPC report assessed the potential impact of the crisis on our income. The areas of most immediate concern were events, individual giving, trading and contracts. It's been estimated that the UK charities could lose up to 4.3 billion of our income over the coming three months. Hopefully that's a worst case scenario and our funders have been responding spectacularly well. Just today we've had an announcement that 300 million of funding from the lottery will be diverted to support the crisis. But now let's look a bit beyond into the longer term. <clears throat> the UK experiences a recession about every 10 years, the last one being the banking crash in 2008. The coronavirus could trigger the next, but outside that, Let's not forget about Brexit, US-China global trade disputes, and the growing impact of climate change. It's not if, but when the next recession comes. And we're now very much less resilient than we were in the last one in 2008. When it does come, it will impact all income streams. The March budget was the largest since the Tony Blair years. And that was before the 350 billion rescue package was announced. Somebody will have to pay for that. Then there's the DFID 14 billion budget, which the government already wanted to realign before the crisis. And then the potential Brexit risk around the substantial EU grant funding. Any very deep cuts in these would impact international, educational, and research charities and potentially increase funding competition for everyone. The first step in your strategy should be to review the outside world to identify those risks that are specifically relevant to you, be they global, UK, regional, or even local. There will be opportunities too, and I'll touch on those later. These are the threats and opportunities in your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats analysis, the classic SWOT. Turning now to the sector's resilience in the face of these risks, three of the dashboard AMBER indicators are of particular concern. Strategy. Too many charities appear to be not responding to or in some cases may even be unaware of the wider strategic risks. 
A recent report found that charity CEOs consider strategy to be less important than previously. Perhaps the triumph of the urgent over the important. But strategy is now more important and it's not something we're doing well. Secondly, sustainability assesses our ability to respond to external risk to survive and succeed. Half of the 30 indicators are at AMBA. Thirdly, the system reports charities' assessment of their ability what they, to deliver what they plan to do. Many report that they're committing scarce resources to plans and targets that may not be realistic. We could be setting ourselves up to fail. And what does that mean for resilience in the sector? Even before the virus, we faced major challenges. Yet at the same time, we may have been overcommitting our limited resources. And there are substantial other strategic risks. Too many are simply too hard pressed to identify and respond to these. Nobody knows if these additional risks will happen. And nobody knows it may be that the world would respond extremely well and deal with them. But that's a to toxic cocktail of risk. I feel the only way to respond effectively in a sector already hard pressed and very short in resources is to get more out of the limited resources we do have. That is a huge challenge. But I believe we can and will. We have tremendous talent and passion. And based on the data, there are six main areas of opportunity. Be strategic. COVID-19 will fundamentally change the world in ways we don't yet know. Perhaps home working will become the norm for many. That could lead to less reliance on expensive office space. Perhaps it will allow decentralization of the London centric charity sector or lead to new and more effective ways of supporting our beneficiaries. The causes that are most popular may change. And the way donors give and even work with charities may change. A crisis is often a catalyst for new ideas and better ways of doing things. We need to identify these and we need to exploit them. By tapping into the huge expertise in the sector, sharing and collaborating more with each other, not competing. Ensure your planning is robust. Ambition is another admiral hallmark of the sector. But when it comes to committing very scarce resources and great need, be hard headed in your planning and assess activities to deliver maximum impact for our beneficiaries. Be prepared to make unpopular but impact driven decisions. The weakest governance indicator is board effectiveness in delivering its organisational purpose. Our passion is a huge asset. But it's not about delivering services that we're personally passionate about, but having clarity on the unmet need and structuring what we do to best meet this for our beneficiaries. Change is always very difficult, but our world is changing very rapidly and fundamentally, and we need to be able to change in response to that. Manage cost to drive impact and value for money. Cost cutting can be a race to the bottom. Often it is. But it doesn't have to be. For example, each year we fail to claim 600 million in gift aid alone. There are different types of gift aid, lots of other charitable tax reliefs. And you can claim up to four years retrospectively. That could be the cash inject you're looking for. The biggest refund I ever found was quarter of a million pounds. It's almost always quicker and easier to manage cost than it is to generate new income. Even small savings accumulate and they pay you back every month forever. 
We need to make sure that we're using our resources as efficiently and as effectively as we possibly can be. But we won't be able to tell that without the processes and scrutiny in place to make sure we are. Check those too. Managing cost will pay back in spades. Exploiting the power of digital. The vast majority of people, including the vulnerable and old, are now online. 41% of over 75 year olds now have a social media profile. We need to see this for what it is, a fundamental shift in society that will impact all charities in all areas in a large scale. The virus will almost certainly accelerate that. Social media is easy to use, very low cost, and has the potential to reach far more people. And online fundraising is likely to become much more important and few of us do it well yet. More on that later. I know many are not used to social media, but there are a huge range of online resources and even people who will help you for free. Building fundraising effectiveness. Funding was already scarce, but the data shows that the majority of charities reporting fundraising and the allied comms function is something that they're not doing well yet. Changing that has the potential to make a very big difference. Which brings me to fundraising strategy. Based on the seven modules of the CEF fundraising strategy toolkit, this part of the presentation gives you a framework to adapt and use to create your own effective, sustainable fundraising strategy. We cannot control events in the outside world. So effective strategy isn't about deciding what we like to do, but rather understanding how what is or may happen might impact on our work and focusing our resources to exploit the opportunities and mitigate those threats facing us. That's strategy in a nutshell. However, there are potentially a huge range of factors, many of which may well be both critical and highly uncertain. Here's a way to manage that. Assess, manage the strategic income risk. Then create your fundraising strategy. Move on to consider and selecting the options you will use to deliver that. And then, often the hardest part, actually implementing your strategy. So how are we going to do that? I'll give you a process anyone can use and then can be adapted to meet your needs. It doesn't have to be complicated, but you do need to have a logical structured process, challenge your people positively, be prepared to think about new ways of doing things, critically to take your people with you, and make decisions based on the available evidence, don't just make assumptions. Your aim is to deliver the funding your charity will need in the future. But you can't plan how to do that without first knowing what your income targets are. This can be as simple as rolling forward your normal income and expenditure numbers and then adjusting these in the light of major factors. You don't need to worry too much about the detail because things are so uncertain. For example, building in the need to replenish your reserves, any capital campaign or building costs, or the beginning or end of a major project. In most budgets, people are by far the greatest element. So think about losing or adding staff and how that will impact your income. This gives you your income targets. But wouldn't it be safer to just do what we do now? Maybe, but maybe not. 
Operational risks and pressures in the immediate term are obvious and urgent. Whereas strategic risks tend to be less obvious and a bit more nebulous. So it may feel safer to sit tight. But if you're wrong, it may be too late by the time you find out you're wrong. Here's a way to assess and manage those risks. Your aim is to deliver the funding your charity will need into the future. But you can't plan how to do that without first knowing how much you need. And with all the changes going on around us, that could be less. It may even be more. This can be as simple as rolling forward your normal income and expenditure numbers, what you're doing now and then adjusting those in the light of relevant key factors. For example, building in the need to replenish reserves, any capital campaign or building costs, or the beginning or end of any major projects. In vast majority of charity budgets, something like 80 to 90% of the cost is staffing. So that's the one area to think about. Will you need more staffing? Or will you be switching more to things like contracts or something similar like that? So you need to think through those issues. Doing so will give you an estimate of your future income targets. But wouldn't it be safer to just keep doing what we do now? We know how to do it and there's less risk in changing. Maybe, but maybe not. Operational risks and pressures in the immediate term tend to be obvious, urgent, and clear. Whereas strategic risks tend to be less obvious and more ambiguous. It may feel safer to sit tight, but if you're wrong, it may be too late by the time you find out. So here's a way to assess and manage those risks. Income diversification is often talked about, but less often done. Should we? Well, over-reliance on limited income streams has two potential implications. Firstly, there may be limits on the extent to which this income can be grown, and you may need to grow your income. Secondly, a major unforeseen future event may lead to a significant reduction in critical income streams, like the virus just did. However, Diversifying your income usually requires often scarce resources, it takes time, and inevitably developing new income streams carries more near-term risk than relying on your existing methods. So diversification may not be the right option. An ANSOF matrix is one way to work out a good way ahead. This version has been reworked for fundraising and it assesses two dimensions, new and existing donors and new and existing fundraising techniques. The lowest risk option, the top left, is to grow your income using your current techniques with your current donors. The second option is medium risk. That is to use existing techniques with a new donor. For example, if you only fundraise locally but deliver services more widely, you could target fundraising in areas that you currently don't. The third option is also medium risk. That is to apply a new fundraising technique to your existing donors. For example, there may be those who are able to give more or in different ways. You could perhaps identify regular givers who are potential major donors or legacy donors. The fourth option is the highest risk. That is to use new fundraising techniques with new donors. For example, if your fundraising was primarily trust-based, but you had a national remit, you could consider online giving using Google Ads. This option has got much more potential to do really well, but also to fail. But whatever you do, 
having a robust strategic process and thinking through these issues will enable to minimize the risk for you. The second part of your SWOT analysis is an objective analysis of your internal strengths and weaknesses. Many find this the most difficult aspect of strategy. Talking about weaknesses almost always makes people react defensively. Instead, I prefer to think of it as finding ways to achieve even more. The data store results show charities reporting that how they manage the fundraising process is an area in which we can do that. Here are a range of issues you can think about. Think through each area, finance, supporters, communications and marketing, other assets, systems, capacity and capability. Now, this isn't a compliance check. It's a search for opportunities. Ask yourself at each stage, is there anything we could exploit more? or something we could do better. The next step is to match these internal strengths and weaknesses to the external opportunities and threats from earlier to create your fundraising SWOT analysis. In this worked example from the CEF, I've identified the linkages between the various factors and highlighted those that I thought would be particularly important or urgent. You know your income target and you know the risks around growing new income. Bring these together with your SWOT analysis to identify the best way forward. For example, using your strengths to exploit opportunities in the outside world in yellow and or Use these to address weaknesses in purple and or to mitigate or to avoid threats in green. Or better still, see if you can turn a threat into an opportunity. You now know what you're going to do, so it's time to work out how you're going to do that. <clears throat> Start by considering all the potential methods you might use, not just the current ones. Go through each to identify those that you want to assess in more detail, some that you'll come back to and consider later, and those that are not suitable and are not worth pursuing any further. An obvious one is digital because we know we're not good at it. Online donations have been growing year on year. And with the virus, it's now more critical than ever. In 2017, it was estimated that charities lost out on 1.5 billion in donations due to a lack of digital effectiveness. The recent CEF Digital Fundraising Insight report had all nine indicators at AMBER. You could consider setting up an online shop such as eBay or Amazon. You might consider virtual events or text donations or Facebook fundraising or contactless. Then there's your website. Virtually all of us have them. The CEF Insight Briefing on Sector Website Effectiveness has all six indicators at AMBER. Reviewing your website could be an easy win for you. If you're a member of the CEF community already, you simply run website in the query system and it will give you an assessment and links to the resources you need. Google Ads. These are the ads that appear at the top of your screen whenever you run a search. If your charity's got national reach, the Google Ads grant is a free £90,000 a year in advertising. It's an absolute gift. It's not a quick fix, it is a bit techy, but once it's set up, the workload of maintaining it is low and it's free.
testing and selecting the options that you've chosen to go into in more detail. Test each in turn, assess them, and select those that best meet your needs. Here's a list I've drawn up, but you can use your own. Return on investment. How much do we get back for how much we spend? Donors. Resources, people and capabilities. The amount of income it will bring in and also the type, restricted and unrestricted. And don't forget to look at the risk. For those that you decide to take forward, assess them in terms of the estimates of income they can bring in, the budget you will need to allocate to fund these properly, the timescale, and the key actions that need to be taken to deliver this. Next step is to build these into your financial projections to see what you get. It's often an iterative process, so you might not get the numbers you want first time round. However, don't inflate the income figures simply to make the numbers work. That changes nothing but the spreadsheet. Instead, revisit your planning to identify where additional investment, management time or resources might realistically increase your income. If it can still not be made to work, then the board really needs to consider scaling back its plans to reduce the costs and bring your strategic costs and income in line. However, as long as you can be realistically confident that you will remain sustainable and at least the medium term, what you've done is buying time to develop alternatives. If you need to, you could create a contingency plan with cost reduction options. Once you're there, input the year one costs and income into your budget, the actions and objectives into your business and operations plan, the risk into your risk plan and any additional capabilities you will need into your staff development. Don't overlook staff development. Our people are our greatest asset. Developing them is an investment in your future not a cost. Without your people, you'd have a strategic plan, but strategy isn't a plan. It's what an organisation does, and that involves everyone, ideally from the outset. Engaging your staff and volunteers helps to test your thinking, you may identify opportunities you've missed, or problems that you weren't aware of. It also makes people feel part of the process and helps them to understand their role in delivering it. And once you've finalised it, ensure it's communicated to everyone in clear, plain English. The best place for big glossy, glossy plans full of jargon is usually on the shelf, which is where they tend to end up gathering dust. The last thing to do is to step back from the detail and ask yourself, is my strategy realistic and deliverable? And here's a way to do that. To be confident in your strategy, you should be able to answer yes to each statement below. Your charity's financial projections work. Your fundraising plan and budget. Donors fundraising techniques, capacity and capabilities, delivery plans and timetable, key risks, threats and opportunities, and flexibility. Having done that, you have created a sustainable, realistic fundraising recovery plan for your organization. Bringing that all together, a year ago, Humentum commissioned the video about myself and the Explains framework. And in it, I specifically flagged up the potential of a perfect storm for the sector. No, I didn't predict the coronavirus. That's the crisis. The perfect storm is what may or may not be coming. 
And we can't control those external risks, but we can respond to them in a sector very hard pressed and with scarce funding. The only realistic way to do so is to achieve more with what we have right now. There are six opportunities to do that. Strategy, planning, impact, cost, digital, and income. In terms of your fundraising, you've identified your income targets, understand the risk, have identified the best way forward, selected options that will enable you to do that. Input these into your planning and engage your people. But that will be difficult, take time we don't have. Consequently, we also need to build resilience. We can do that more quickly. It will reduce cost and buy us time to bring, bring up our fundraising. And it will make our fundraising more effective. So we'll bring more in. The sector will get through this. We don't have anything like the funding we need, but we've boundless talent and that's a huge asset. But as in any time of change, there will be winners and losers. Which your charity will be depends on what you do about it now. Whatever you do, don't do nothing. Good luck and thank you for listening to me. And thank you, Ian. Very good. So that was really helpful. Um, and as someone pointed out in the comments box, that's definitely a session to go back and watch again because there's so much in it. Um, and I think the the framework that that Ian's talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, and that he provides, yeah, I think that's something that that we all need a deep dive into because there's a lot there. But that was that was great. Thanks very much. So I'm going to bring on Ian in a second. Um, Ian is back backstage. You should see backstage. It's lovely. Um, so Ian Ian will be on in a second. So if you have any questions. Um, then please do uh, feel free to jump in there um, and write them in the question box, and, uh, and we'll I'll pass them across to Ian. Um, but yeah, we've got about uh, eight minutes until the next session, so I'm going to pull in Ian now if he's here. Hello, Ian. Hi. How are you? It's me and Dinger the Rabbit. <laughs> it's nice to see. And and your familiar curtain after the last session. Yeah. How are you doing? How are you getting on? Uh, it's absolutely manic. Absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah, lots, lots of people reaching out to you. I, I had um, paramedics on this morning getting advice about how to do things, and there was a young lady who's just been appointed as fundraiser in a charity, and the yeah. senior team have asked her to come up with a fundraising rescue, uh, and she's never done fundraising before. Uh -huh. That was two hours. Mm, okay. Yeah, it's, it seems like there's maybe some, um, you know, unrealistic expectations being put on fundraisers. And I know people are kind of getting stressed, you know, even more stressed than they were. Um, and you you talked a little bit about cost cutting. And for a lot of charities, the first cost they cut is fundraising because it's, it's easier than cutting the cause. Um, but obviously, it's not necessarily the right thing to do at right times. Are you seeing that? Are you seeing fundraisers being um pushed out already or, or fundraising services fundraising programs being the first thing to be cut well certainly i was talking to a recruiter and and he was saying to me the fundraising jobs have evaporated but actually in any kind of turnaround um you need more fundraisers mm. or you need more fundraising um not easy to do but cutting your fundraising efforts at this point is is not a good way to go about it no and, and it. i'm not a professional fundraiser so i'm not shouting for the um for the profession but right now we need them well you're you're just a sensible gentleman which uh, i mean it does seem to make sense you know money doesn't necessarily come in unless we ask for it and if there's no one out there asking for it then it's going to hit us down the road um, and, and we're going to have to change the way we operate so it, it, it's not a case of just running the same old systems in the same old way. Mm. We're going to need to think how we position ourselves and what's changing. So you you don't need your fundraising team. You need your fundraising team and the extra fundraising capacity to enable you to do that. So the job for the fundraisers has gone up. Wow. You, you talked a bit about risk. 
Um, and obviously, you know, a lot of your work is is around risk or controlling risk and balancing risk. Obviously, you know, a lot of people think of the charity sector as very risk averse. Um, we we can be quite slow to adopt things. We can be extra cautious, and maybe sometimes that holds us back. What? Where should charities and boards and fundraisers? Where should their head be at, at the moment? Is this kind of go for broke and risk whatever you need to risk, or should we batten down and be as safe as possible? What, what do you think? It comes back to the matrix. I mean, I, I, I chair a grant making board, and we've just got a bunch of money in the in, in the bank, and we spend it. So in, in terms of our operations, the only question for us is, is how much more money are we going to spend and who are we going to give it to? But we're not mm. under threat. Other people may be. I mean, in my experience in, in boards and turnarounds, um, we're risk averse but take too many risks. So you, 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 you get a board that says, you know, let's go and do that. And, and they will not assess the project. They will not think the way through it. They will just go and do it. And they're actually taking substantial risk that don't know it. Yeah. That's, but yeah. if you go to them and you put a proposal to them that's anything out of the norm, no matter how robust it is, they say no because we've never done it like that before. So what, what they actually need to do is to be very objective about this. Mm. They, they need to positively challenge people. They need to start asking questions. And they need to be prepared to change. Um, mm. Many, many charities, and, and I, th this is the wrong way to put it, there are some outstandingly innovative charities out yeah. there. Yeah. Some of the fundraising I've seen is just spectacular. But by and large, your average charity chuntering along, they're risk averse. They do the same thing in the same way. I often hear things like, we're too small. Mm -hmm. We can't do digital. Well, I mean, I open my garden for the church every year and, and, and everybody goes round in the rain and puts the posters up and, and hammers them in. And I said, well, look, would you like me to do some social media for you? Mm -hmm. And I went online. It took me five minutes, some nice pictures of gardens, a little bit of this and that, dropped it into all the local Facebook pages and reached an audience of 30,000. Yeah. And when we had to get together afterwards, we broke in through a thousand pounds for the first time. Everybody was really excited about it. And they were going, I wonder why all those people turned up. I mean, it can be that simple. Yeah. Yeah. It, it doesn't have to be complicated. Yeah. That's a fair point. The, um, your framework, um, you put out a lot of stuff for free and a lot of it is, is available to use for free and things like that for people who, who maybe haven't heard of you yet, what's the first thing they should do? Um, they go to your website. Should they get, do you want people to get in touch with you? You want people to sign oh, yeah. up? Yeah. Um, everything's free. I've done it all myself. Yeah. Uh, well, it, it was, I was either buy the Harley Davidson, get the 17 year old <laughs> girlfriend. Yeah. or build the framework and the framework was one that wouldn't get me killed by my wife so yeah I went and, and, and your harley davidson it'd just be sitting in the garage now so you wouldn't even be able to go out on it so you, you made the right choice i think no she no. did <laughs> very good well, um, yeah, so, so your what's your web address where do people what what what's the website Char charity excellence framework charity um, excellence framework.com yeah, uh, dot uk. Sorry, charity and excellence works works for anybody, um, and it, you don't need any IT skills or charity skills to use it. My yeah. background has always been in in frontline charities, and so what I try to do is I try to produce stuff um, that works for people. So yeah. the presentation today is now a toolkit on on the conference folder. That's amazing. But I've expanded it, and I've dropped a whole range of resources into it. And you just go through and pick out the bits for you. You could do, you should be able to do it in two hours. Just go yeah. straight to it and do it. And it's all free. That's amazing, Ian. And um, and you you've offered your time today for free, and you pulled this all together really quickly, and you got all that stuff up in your framework really quickly. So well done, and um, really appreciate it. Thanks for that. And 30, I'm, 30 I'm, I'm, that video took what thirty, 30 days. days. Yes. Yeah. I yeah. I am not a digital millennial native. Yeah, well, this is you. You're trying things new, and now there'll be no holding you back. That's good. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna say goodbye to you and finish with your words. I love this. Whatever you do, don't do nothing. Um, and yeah. I think that's great advice. Let's let's get stuff done. So, 
look after yourself ian thanks a million again for coming on and uh we'll see you again soon thank you thank you that was Ian McClintock. Do go check out the uh, Charity Excellence Framework. So much free stuff there. Really useful, really helpful. Uh, okay, we're starting the next session in less than a minute. This is uh, Rebecca Davis, my friend Rebecca Davis, coming up uh, from Canada um, and from Save the Children. And she has huge amounts of experience. And she's going to be setting up, uh, talking about setting up a response task force. So this is going to be, you know, I picture this being like the A team with Rebecca Davis kind of leading it and just. Um, doing amazing stuff around there, but I'm sure it's gonna be much more sensible than that. So we're gonna go over to there in 30 seconds, uh, across in room one with Nikki Bell. She's hosting uh, Zoe Amar. So Zoe is going to, you must know Zoe if you spend any time on Twitter or digitally minded, she's amazing. So she's gonna be talking about becoming digital focused. So digital focused in room one, if you wanna head over there, or Rebecca Davis setting up a response task force. And then Rebecca is hopefully gonna be joining me after this um, and we'll be able to answer uh, questions, chat through anything with her, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm going to hand you over now to Ms. Rebecca Davis. 100 days. It's been a mere 100 days since we first heard of the novel coronavirus. For some of us, like me in North America, the profound disruption to our life has only been a quarter of that. More in Europe, of course. And our lives have been disrupted in ways that we don't know. Uh, the outcome of our societies, our families, certainly, and in the worst cases, uh, ill health and, and loss of life. I'm Rebecca Davies, and I'm head of international humanitarian fundraising at Save the Children International. And at Save the Children, we're used to responding to disasters, and we've been responding to COVID-19 for nearly all of those 100 days. To a large extent, Emergencies are business as usual for us as they are for so many other INGOs. But this one's different. And we're also like the arts, hospitality, and many other sectors trying to figure out how best to adapt to this new reality. For the past three weeks, I've been on Save the Children's Global COVID-19 Task Force. And I'm also currently leading an international group of fundraisers on an initial $30 million appeal for seed funding for our program prepare, uh, preparation uh, and response for the inevitable. And I've been asked to speak to you today about setting up a response task force. And so I'm going to do that. I'm going to apply it to fundraising and take from what I've learned over the years from critical incident management, crisis communications, and even lessons from a military commander. And first lesson of five is preparedness. Ideally, setting up your response task force is easy because you have a plan already. Having a plan lets you respond quickly because the worst thing you can do in an emergency is nothing it's nearly always better to make a wrong decision about getting going because you can tweak as you go if you've made a little misstep here, a little misstep there. We call this no regrets action. Having said that, you do want to make sure you know what you're dealing with and whether you're a first responder or a fundraiser, it's important to quickly gather and analyze the information that you happen to have at hand and also simultaneously initiate decisions. When I was working at MSF, I asked one of our doctors, how do you react? How do you respond when you have so many people who need critical emergency care all at once? And this is what he said exactly. It's testing and treating wrapped together. When we have sick patients and a serious emergency, we act first and think second. The thinking is of course there, but it evolves as the action occurs. In the emergency, I treat, examine, and then take the history. Also reminds me of what Dr. Mike Ryan of the World Health Organization said recently about the containment of outbreaks, COVID-19 specifically. He said, perfection is the enemy of good. 
speed trumps perfection. And so if you're prepared and you have an updated and accessible emergency fundraising plan, you buy yourself precious minutes, which, whether measured in medical action or fundraising dollars, absolutely saves lives. And a good plan, a good emergency fundraising plan will describe your emergency fundraising objective, which of course will be determined in each crisis. A good plan will identify your task force leader, the person who's responsible for delivering the objectives. The group, the, a good plan will also identify the person who's accountable for all sign off and they're different from the task force leader, this person. A good plan will absolutely identify and insist on a support person or people because without wh whom this project will not function. A plan will talk about who needs to be informed, CEO, board, any other dependencies, that kind of thing outlines a budget, uh, it might go into some detail and a roster of people on call, uh, especially out of hours, and will contain other useful current information like budget codes, contact info, action plans that you'll need as you, as you get into what you're going to do. Good preparedness activities for fundraising could also include pre-positioned, pre-prepared assets, especially digital create those generic emergency uh, templates, pre-printed stock, email templates, uh, pre-preparedness activities could also include scenario planning, outlining maybe what channels to launch and timelines to work against. And I like to as well have uh, emergency appeal donor segment selections if they're not already pulled the data queries are all set up and ready to run digital preparedness is especially important the first week in emergency fundraising is crucial and as you know usually half of total donations are acquired in the first seven days and so the key there is to be the first organization be first be fast to launch fundraising email search so social, paid and organic, and display campaigns. And in your digital plan, you want to have everything pre-approved, so you're, you're good to go. Pre-approved digital paid media, budget, donation page copy, Google AdWords, campaigns, copy keywords, email copy, paid social and display templates, SMS. Uh, if you're going to do a Facebook fundraiser, have that set up. Um, and always, of course, give a thought to how you're going to do your social listening. It's very, very important. And I will say it here, uh, an emergency digital plan, uh, again, should have all your contacts and the coordinate, the coordination process with your digital agency. That's really, really, really important. Agencies are our partners all the time and always, and especially in emergencies. So if you don't have a plan in place or it doesn't feel like the right one, we'll get more into that after, um, don't panic. You do already have systems in place during peacetime. You'll just need to adapt them to the new reality. Okay, so it's impossible to have face-to-face -face acquisition during a pandemic. What can you do to mitigate the financial risk? There's DRTV, there's digital. First response, is using what you know and applying it into a completely different situation. That's really it. Um, yeah, so point two, leadership. Because of course, um, forming your response task force, you need to have a leader. Leaders will be the ones to communicate how, what, when will happen. And in a crisis, it really, must be understood this is top down. That's sometimes difficult for nonprofits to internalize uh, in, in cultures, especially as they are getting increasingly more healthy as we're all working on, on that and wellness. But it is one of the biggest paradoxes of, again, I come back to humanitarian action that so much of the language is militaristic, missions, operations, et cetera. But aid delivery 
most often takes place in high risk, high security context. And the reality is some of the principles of a military operation can apply in an emergency fundraising situation. Central command and control, yeah, discipline and obedience on the part of the team, clear lines of communication. And again, that command to create a culture of all for one. These are, of course, lessons learned from uh, military. Problems start um, in an emergency or in a crisis when people start taking action arbitrarily and in an uncoordinated way with no clear direction uh, from a task force leader. So get your task force leader in in place. And the leader of your response task force uh, isn't necessarily going to be the most senior person of your organization. Uh, in fact, they're probably uh, that person, that CEO, the most senior person is probably not the best suited to do it and likely need to be focusing on business continuity and, and core mission. Your response task force leader is someone who's good for the role. Typically, they're, they're quick thinking. They're able to make quick determinations and decisions based on the information that's available at the time. And you're nearly always operating uh, with only half the information. Um, and you need to be comfortable with that. Your response task force leader should be confident, but not ego egotistical. They'll have some tactical knowledge and they're good at solving problems. And I think this is the most important point uh, in my experience, along with being comfortable in the absence or dearth of information, they must be comfortable and confident to act without consensus. And these leaders typically are calm, level-headed and not overly sensitive to criticism or debate and collaborative. When you're a response task force leader, you are uh, considered a constituent representative and you do need to work across all departments and represent your own. And as a task force leader, your, your goal is simply to establish an incident driven management structure, uh, establish immediate control and priorities of action, eliminate the chaos that way and maximize the opportunities. Uh, also to identify and leverage resources you're the one that needs to stand back once in a while and get the big picture because everybody else is going to be doing the, the important work. You're gonna be the one that scans the landscape, gets the big picture, confirms facts and activities. And then you wanna to move to points of resolution quickly. This is an emergency. And when the time comes and that time should be articulated right from the beginning, you want to, your goal should be to transition back um, to your role and transition primacy of the command back to your, uh, the person taking over from you. Lesson I've learned here, um, is that you also, uh, I'm going to sneeze in my elbow. Wait for it. <laughs> Excuse me. Just a bit of allergies. That was excellent sneezing hygiene, as I would say to my eight-year-old. I hope you agree <laughs> with me. Um, what was I saying? As the response task force leader, you need to know that you're not going to accomplish all your goals. And again, you need to be comfortable with that. I said before, you have to accept you're not ever going to have all the facts and that things will change. So you need to be flexible and agile. And something else I've learned uh, along the way is someone's panicking don't don't sideline them don't sit them out give them a task give them a task that is very very grounding and will get them back on 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 track on leadership uh as a response task force leader always look like you're in control even if on the inside you're thinking this is not manageable teams will gain their strength and their calm from you and if you're not in control show that you have a plan. I think your biggest role as a task force leader is to help people manage ambiguity. 
your job again in a crisis is to ground your team so that they can be effective um, and help them through the swirl of what ifs, what ifs, what ifs. People who are well-versed in emergencies can go very easily from first to fifth year. Um, and if it becomes a pathological trait and uh, part of your psyche, it really does. And so as a task force leader, it's your job too to coach the team to, to get them to come quickly to a similar space and pace. And the reality is um, not every person um, as talented as they are, uh, belongs on a task force. Not everybody has uh, a temperament that can cope or thrive um, with the ambiguity and uh, the command and control structure, that kind of thing. So leadership is extremely important. Point number two, after preparedness uh, in creating your response task force, Point number three, I point to communication. I think it's very, very, very important. Um, give regular updates, even, and especially if there's no new information, people are comforted by a schedule, a cadence, a rhythm. And this works well for donors too, actually. Uh, after the Haiti earthquake, we did a test and we sent out right at a very, very uh, um, uh, regular interval um, updates to donors on the situation uh, right from right from day one. Uh, even if the subject line said uh, nothing new to report at this hour, boy, did the donations come in. I think our donors really felt they were part of the story and, and a real stakeholder in real time. Um, yeah, it was a, I would do that again, that's for sure. Communication. Uh, in this crisis with our fundraising task force, we've um, developed something new that I will also do again. Uh, one of my colleagues came up with the idea uh, to make sure that people we're getting their questions answered very quickly um, and that there's one source for the answers uh, and that everyone's emails, uh, email inbox wasn't getting absolutely uh, overflowing. Um, and we also had an issue with document control. So we put everything on uh, SharePoint or Google Doc where anybody could go in and ask their questions. We, were, we would monitor them and we promise answers uh, at least twice a day we would uh, timestamp the answers and also uh, invited people to um, uh, crowdsource themselves the answers uh, with each other and, and we're able to learn uh, information and have visibility in parts of the organization we hadn't before and it's worked really really well. So point three communication. Point four, action time. So your response task force, you've got it set up, you've identified your leader, you've talked about communications and ways of working, you've got your preparedness plan, it is time to act. And this, this is with your emergency fundraising task force, which could include and actually should include other departments, especially communications, probably advocacy, content media, external vendors, as I said, especially telemarketing, digital and print. Um, and because you're all prepared and you all have that document, you're able to get yourselves off the ground and seize opportunities. And I use that in a, in a, a, a I use that word opportunity um, as I would the word responsibility. I do believe as fundraisers, it is our responsibility to seize opportunity. So what will you do? Um, for me, I like, a good checklist. I printed one here for you and that was really dumb because I could also email it to you and I will. I have a checklist um, for nearly every scenario in an emergency, whether there's sudden onset. This is just one checklist. This is my sudden onset emergencies, uh, natural disasters dr or dramatic surges and conflicts. And what it does, um, it serves as an action plan. Yes, um, because 
when you are in the moment, um, the body and the mind react differently to stress. Um, a good shot of cortisol in the body makes people not think as clearly. It's certainly the case with me. So I love having a checklist. It's very different from a preparedness plan. It's that next stage. It's in the moment. What are you going to do? Um, such as a pilot or a surgeon would use. It helps me to move through planning options uh, and their uh, timings um, towards a, a real swift action that I know uh, could work and could also be iterated on. So yeah, you, you do that. Um, typically in peacetime, in a peacetime emergency, oh boy, has, how has the world changed? You would use this probably to create a clear fundraising proposition. What do we want our donors to do for, for children and say the children's case based on the scale of the disaster, the scale of need and say the children's um, appropriateness to response. And once you've done that, you, you know this, create a call to action that's simple and tangible. Uh, and you ask clearly and, and often uh, that's a solid, just fine fundraising appeal. And that's what you do, ha, BC, before Corona. Um, but this pandemic has us all throwing out the playbook. And so what I've seen at Save the Children um, is that for so many of our national members, their action is literally following the curve as they experience it uh, and at once try to flatten it. So again, in normal emergencies, you'd lead with your case for support with the stuff you're doing with what you're giving. Oh, this earthquake happened, we're, we're there, we're providing medical care and food and water sanitation. This is how much it costs. This is the impact it'll have on kids and their families' lives. And please, would you give this much? That's kind of so 2019 now that what I've seen come out of Save the Children and probably I can't speak to any other agencies really because we've just been so immersed um, in our own ability to um, respond appropriately both on the ground and in fundraising. But uh, I, what I know of Save the Children, uh, the domestic response is the primary communication now is is about education hand washing influencing providing advice and support to people not beneficiaries whether they're in our own countries certainly overseas but our people our own donors the action we're taking is so program led it's what we can offer to our supporters it's giving them uh, trustworthy information right from the beginning, valuable resources for them and their families. Um, yeah, about my eight-year-old, I was a bit lost in the first few days and then I found Save the Children. It's very simple. It's like my checklist. It's a schedule and we printed it off and she's just absolutely proud to keep to that schedule. That's what kids need. And I mean, there's so much more, but I, you know, I am essentially the beneficiary in this case. So many say the children markets are leading with their offers and programs and not leading with their asks. That's my point here. The donor is now the beneficiary and this is a new and next level of donor centeredness. And it's absolutely authentic. And in, the, and in so many cases as the pandemic moves around the world. I've seen it now in the US with Save the Children. We're seeing what we can do for the donor rather than what the donor can do for us. We're serving the donor first and asking for money next. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a huge shift. There's been a few times in philanthropy where I've seen things shift um, and this is this is this is one of them so yeah i think i'll leave that point there um, 
but it's about how we're positioning. Our action is how we're positioning ourselves and, and what that is. This is what I'm trying to say is we're living our case for support together and at once with our donors and the kind of messaging we've shifted to or some members have shifted to is that we're all in this together. You have heard that, but it is so very true. Families and communities are taking care of their vulnerable relatives and neighbors. And now we have to pull together to protect those who are gonna be hardest hit. Save the Children is there with families and communities at this time. We've been developing innovative ways of working with children and families right here at home right here at home to ensure they continue to receive the support they need. At the same time, we're not letting our donors forget about our heartland case for support and, and communities. And once we feel a market is over their own national pandemic peak, um, so when day by day, there are fewer, fewer new cases, we're going to take them to Yemen and Syria and the Horn of Africa, Colombia, where, as we all know, the truly most vulnerable are in resource poor settings have even half a chance, uh, less than half a chance as we do uh, where we live to, to survive this really. So COVID-19, we remind them, will be devastating for children living in fragile places like conflict zones, refugee camps, urban slums, where people are already struggling to survive. And the situation only is going to get worse and unless we do something to help these communities now, which in turn will help us because we're in it together. Fifth and final point um, on setting up a response task force is to, from the very beginning, think about your after action review. Uh, I prefer a real time review. So rather than hearing from me, I'm gonna point you now to one of the very, very best um, cases of this in articles. And this is a very, very recent article, uh, March 27th in the Harvard Business Review. Please look it up lessons from Italy's response to coronavirus. In it, it says, learning is critical. Finding the right implementation approach requires the ability to quickly learn from both successes and failures and the willingness to change actions accordingly. And that's so, so very much, um, I hope, part of what you've heard me stress today and, and so much better here. Um, your after action or your real time review, do link it with your preparedness plan. Know from the very beginning what you want to track because you don't want to get in a situation where you've just been in a absolutely head spinning um, period and think, oh, wouldn't it have been nice that we had tracked that? So after action review, real time review, help your team learn, quickly apply learnings in real time to improve current performance of continuous improvement. So please do read the article. Um, it will take you through an understanding of real-time reviews, learning about how to find key insights, how to ask what was supposed to happen, what actually happened, what were the differences, what went well, what could be improved and how, most importantly, what can we learn and do differently right now. Uh, this article is a fabulous case, case study and in a, at a national level of a response task force. Again, have a read of it and, and reflect on how you say, you know, how you see yourself um, as part of a task force, how you would feel and behave. More urgently, I'm asking you to read this, a plea from Canada, um, because it is also a fantastic lesson in infection prevention and control that so many of our countries need right now, mine included. So thank you, thank you for all your work and I wish you continued successful physical distancing as you're doing and as much social cohesion as we're sharing right now. Thank you, be well. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Um, 
very good of you to come on and, and dedicate your time. I, am, I mean, if there's a busy person in the world right now, it must be someone like Rebecca who's uh, saved the children, you know, dealing with, with all these changes all over the world. And, um, and that's rough, so. Okay, um, so Rebecca, um, we're hoping will be on for q and I'm not 100% sure if she will. When you are responsible for a response task force, that's what happens, you have to respond. Uh, and so I imagine she, um, there's every chance that she's been pulled away for something. So you might be stuck with me for a little bit. Um, but if she manages to get in, uh, then we will certainly bring her in. I have a couple questions to ask her. And I just want to catch up with her because she's lovely. Um, we have about 15 minutes uh, until the next session. Um, there's a few things I want to go through. Firstly, on Rebecca's um, uh, session, she I think she must be the only speaker to sneeze during this conference, is she? Which is, um, yeah, that's kind of embarrassing, but fair play. Um, some of the things I really liked in her, you know, um, when she repeats that phrase, and I, I heard it before because there was, um, you know, there was that viral video of the Irish, Irish person um, around emergency response, and he was saying, act first, think second. Um, and that, you know, that's obviously a big thing for uh, medical responders and things like that. And I think that's really true. And it goes back to kind of what we were talking about earlier about being afraid to make mistakes in virtual events and being afraid for things to go wrong and stuff like that. Um, but we have to do it. You know, there's nothing, things go wrong all the time. Um, you know, I, I speak, I do presenting all the time. Things always go wrong because I'm not very smart at all. Um, but once you're open and honest and, and kind of um, uh, straight with people about it, People are very understanding. People are very um, good about it. So there's nothing wrong with charities being a bit clumsy at the moment. You know, it's okay to be clumsy and set up for virtual events. It's okay to be clumsy in the contact of our um, of our donors and support supporters and volunteers and staff and everything like that. Clumsy is not a bad thing. It's a human. It's a human trait. In the same way, uh, failure is not a terrible thing. And you know, Nikki. Uh, over in room, run, room one, she's always talking about failure with her pizza for losers project and stuff like that. Failure is about learning. Failure is about everything. And and fundraising, you know, if you're if you're a fundraiser, you know, ninety percent or more of our time is spent getting rejected. You know, that's that's part of the job. So um, that's not a failure. Someone saying no to you is not a failure. It's a lesson in um, what they will do or what they're interested in or why. It hasn't connected with them, or, or you know, it changes how we ask for them. So no's are no's can be a positive thing as well, um, and and problems can be a positive thing, and these kind of opportunities um, can be really really good. So I thought that was I thought that was a lovely phrase, as she had a whole lot of um, of lovely phrases coming on. Um, I'm gonna I believe Rebecca has joined us, so I'm gonna pull her on in a second. I just need to ask, can it, can someone answer this in the question box? I buy oranges, you know, little easy peelers from um, from Lidl. Um, and there's always one rotten. I've just had an orange. You, you need to go get some fruit to like get keep your energy levels up for this this thing. But there's always one rotten orange. All the oranges are fine, and then there's one rotten orange. So please answer in the comment box if you know uh, why that is. So I'm going to pull in uh, Rebecca now, and I'm going to say hello to my friend Rebecca Davies. Hello, Rebecca. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you perfect. And you've got a lovely kind of like um, blurred focus camera. You look, you look like a model. I think my daughter, Vaseline and my phone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how are you doing? You all right? I haven't seen you in ages. Oh, and you won't for some time yet. I know. I know. I know. <laughs> my, my answer to that is uh, I am fever free at the moment. Yeah. So, yeah. But like, yeah. watching that video, man, I could see the anxiety come through that. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, I think somebody else said it. it's hour by hour. Um, yeah. Completely. Yeah, and I really commend you for the opening plenary on resilience. I think it was an absolutely perfect way to begin. And I appreciated it in that hour. And I will return to it uh, later today. So thank you very much, Simon and Nikki, for, for that. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think I'll go back to it. You know how, like, if, if you're a conference person like you and I are, opening plenaries are usually like, come on, like really fired mm. up and stuff. But I, I don't think that's what you need right now. It's mm -hmm. everyone needs to kind of like, you know, let's just get it together and then let's figure out what we're doing with this. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so Save the Children, I mean, obviously, Save the Children is genuinely, genuinely one of my favorite charities. Um, and you deal with so many, so many, like so much unbelievable stuff all the time. You were already dealing with so many challenges and your beneficiaries and, and children around the world dealing with things like war and famine. Um, 
it's almost like this COVID stuff, how much impact does it have on some of the people you work with? Because they're already going through so much. Do they even notice that this is going on? Uh, in terms of program staff or? Yeah, uh, yeah. well, in terms of, yeah, well, people who are changed. really in the heart of it, program staff and beneficiaries, how, how much is it affecting? Every, every everything, program? everything. Everyone it's, else? it's, yeah. um, every, everything, um, we do from here on in is, has that COVID lens. It has to, I, I mean, from very tactical program delivery, um, the, uh, the, the clinical guidance for COVID is social distance, of course, or physical distance better. The clinical guidance for uh, malaria uh, or pneumonia, uh, some of the same symptoms is to go get treatment immediately. So mm -hmm. how do we do that? How do we, um, we are adjusting all of our programs to be able to um, keep as much of the core service delivery going but under the the new reality and the, and the and with the primacy of protecting our healthcare deliverers uh and our program deliverers uh help themselves it has to be you yeah. know there's there's no point in having ventilators when there's no doctor or nurse able to use it right yeah yeah fair point so um but so I, I kind of garbled my way a bit through the uh, the action point, but um, all at once, um, this is a very domestic story as well. And the most vulnerable um, could be in Italy, could be in Toronto mm. right now. We acknowledge that as well. Um, mm. And so in a very, very authentic and real way, the, the programs that we are delivering, whether they're, they're overseas or in our own backyards, um, we're also taking donors on a donor journey Mm -hmm. um, that's about, uh, you know, three or five weeks behind their lived experience. And that's working well, uh, wow. right now. That's what I was trying to say, but I had had no sleep in two days when I did that video. So yeah. I apologize. Yeah. Well, you're very, you're very hard on yourself, Rebecca, cause you say it's garbled and stuff, but I thought, I thought that was great and really well paced and I understood the whole thing. It was yeah. good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one thing, one thing that, um, uh, you did talk about was social listening. Um, now for people who... You know, obviously I know what that means because I'm really smart and everything, but some people are not quite as smart as me. So maybe you could explain to me like I'm an idiot. Uh, what does social, what do you mean by social listening? It's about um, uh, lurking. I don't want to say lurking. It's about engaging where you, uh, engaging mainly through social media, of course, but, uh, and engaging exactly where our supporters donors heads and minds and hearts and mm. fears are so um i heard it so much uh, wayne said it before this is no time for old school uh organization led communications and fundraising this is uh time to uh sit back uh all together and all at once and keep the conversation going. I um, I hosted a webinar yesterday, just a, a global webinar, and the amount of people that came to it, uh, even I was surprised. And I um, learned through the questions um, and the response afterward, both from donors and from our, our own staff, is what people want right now is to stay socially cohesive and connected um and and yeah so that's it mm. it's like keeping your finger on the pulse but on a, on a very more heart to heart base like really understanding what people are feeling yes exactly mm. and if uh you want to do an appeal right now for the refugee camps of africa uh because it's real we know what's coming there terrifying but your donors are equally terrified and this is mm. one thing i've learned a lot in emergency response to is relativity um your it's like a, that whole goldfish in a bowl uh metaphor your fears and anxieties will grow to the capacity that you have for them and if you're in a first world country and you've not experienced the financial hardship um, or a threat to your health or your loved one's health mm. um your fears and anxieties and grief response are absolutely every bit as valid and acute as someone who's already dealing with malnutrition and 
whatever, mm. child marriage and HIV, TB, plus Corona, um, it's absolutely valid. So that's what I mean about social listening. Uh, that's not the time to give those donors an appeal for Africa for yeah. hand washing. Uh, no, they're not there. They're there. It's a time to meet those donors with information and programming uh, for themselves, yeah. let alone the more vulnerable in uh, their first, maybe second world uh, countries. Yeah, not being tone deaf to what what they're actually going through, and I think it yeah you know, that applies to fundraisers themselves as well because I think fundraisers are very hard on themselves. Um, and the first time I ever saw you speak, I don't I don't know if you remember, um, but you were talking about mental health around fundraising and and the challenges we go through as fundraisers, how we cope with that. That's when I fell in love with you, Rebecca. Um, but it, at, at that um, at that uh, um, thing, you know, you we put a pressure on ourselves to do this, and I imagine there's fundraisers who almost feel guilty for feeling anxious and stressed because they're looking at their beneficiaries and thinking well they've got it much worse than we why am i even complaining and, and we sometimes hold ourselves to kind of difficult difficult standards that i mean think? yeah um well I, yeah i know i do but um yeah yeah you hold yourself to impossible standards well, I, don't, I don't want this to, to turn into therapy but <laughs> um it's okay to feel all the feels it's okay to be scared it's okay mm. to to be vulnerable and be authentic because uh and that's it that's the sweet spot if you as a fundraiser can express and live your truth uh and your vulnerability uh, authentically at work um you will raise more money and you will be on a better path to wellness i fully fully believe that as you know yeah yeah i mean you're you're big into vulnerability as um i mean wayne talked about vulnerability i've talked about vulnerability i referenced a conversation with jen love yesterday she's always talking about vulnerability Stephen screen it seems to be a, like a rising subject matter where it's like we've tried to be gurus we've tried to be professional we've tried to be yeah, like no, no, no. and it's not and now it's i mean the, the word guru is banned now but it's like um there's nothing wrong with opening opening up a bit and showing your heart, showing your vulnerability, and people respond well to that. I found in my life, you know, if you if you put yourself out there, people catch you, people help you and support you, and that's the same for charities, isn't it? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I hope so. I hope so. Um, yeah. Yeah. All Thank right. you for uh, uh, advocating for mental health. It's um, it's everything. Yeah. Well, it's it's mainly selfish because I have massive depression issues myself, mm. so and I'm on medication, so that's that's ba it's all selfish stuff. Um, I, I don't so, think so we also we had requests in the chat box for you to play French horn. Um, I don't think it's appropriate for this conference, um, but I believe you're coming back to one of our events in May, and you're going to give us a little French horn. Play. I will. I will. Yeah. You know, I'm going to take the horn away from um, these things. Uh, you, know, do these, you know why? Because I, this is my own grief response right now. I'm not sure yeah. anything to do with what I've been asked to talk about, but I realized this uh, the other day, you know, working in humanitarian and development, I mean, absolutely uh, horrifying by what's going on, what's going to happen. Um, my other life, my other identity is as a musician and, and the art sector is being absolutely decimated and hollowed out right now mm -hmm. so um i what i do appreciate is the power of um being a fundraiser um and being able to uh do something practical and uh in the moment and mm -hmm. also uh forward thinking for both of these sectors mm -hmm. um so yeah yeah, I, I, all this to say, um, there's another great article. I think it's gone around a lot. Uh, it talks about the grief response that we're all having and that yeah. weird feeling that you may not I uh, recognize um, probably is a grief response to, to something. And I know I'm having it. Um, but uh, as so many of, of the speakers have said today, it's time to throw the playbook and pivot and uh, move forward and through. And we will. We will. Yeah. Good on you, Rebecca. All right. Well, thank you so much. I know you must be so busy. Thanks for giving us your time um, today. Important work. Session. And lovely to see you. And we'll see you again soon. Bye. Bye, Thanks. everybody. Thanks, Rebecca.
That's Rebecca. Uh, follow her on Twitter, actually. She's RebsD, R-E-B-S-D. Um, she's really interesting, really fascinating person, and she's great. So we're going to go over to the next session now. Uh, the next session in this room, room two, the Harrison, uh, is changing plans with funders. Uh, this is with Rachel Stevenson Chef and Emily Collins Ellis. Uh, Rachel, I've seen speak before, um, and she was amazing. She was 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 really good speaker. Emily, I haven't seen speak before, so I'm looking forward to this. So they'll be talking about changing plans with funders. How you know talking about that co a conversation you might be having with funders right now about what's going to happen. Um, and then over in room one with Nikki Bell is Chris Hall, and he's talking about fighting crisis with content. So he's talking about producing content and the type of content we might put out, um, and that looks interesting. So if you want to head over to Chris Hall, you can. Just click on the link above. Otherwise, stay with uh, me, and we'll have Rachel and Emily coming up now talking about um, uh, ch changing plans with funders. Um, and then I believe, again, they'll be coming in for Q&A, so feel free to jump in the chat box, throw in some questions there, um, and I'll keep an eye on them, and, and hopefully we can go through them after the session. All right, so here we go now uh, with the next. Hi, everybody. Hi. Welcome to our session on changing plans with funders during COVID-19. Um, we know that you have a lot on your plate uh, to be worrying about um, during this weird time that we're all living through, so we appreciate you spending your time with us and hopefully we'll be able to add some inspiration and insight uh, that might help you with your funding relationships whilst we're all navigating this crisis together. Um, so I'll just start really quickly um, by giving you a little bit of an introduction to IB so that you know who we are and why we're all qualified to talk to you about this. Um, so IG is a London-based but globally focused consultancy uh, and we work for social and environmental impact. Um, we do that broadly um, on kind of the two sides of the funding fence, so to speak. So we work with um, individual philanthropists, their families and trusts and foundations on their giving. Uh, we also work with businesses on their giving and also using their business models for good. And then on the other side of the fence, we work with charities and social enterprises um, on growing their impact. And oftentimes that comes down to fundraising strategy and fundraising skills. Uh, but also kind of programmatic impacts and, and sometimes, you know, more operational things as well. Um, so <laughs> um, now on to um, who we are. Um, and, and of course, we've listed our Twitter accounts on here, both for IG, but also for Emily and myself. So if you do have any questions or thoughts or things that are coming up in your mind as you're going through this presentation, do tweet us. Um, we love to receive those and we can certainly chat with you directly through that. Um, so I'll start. My name is Rachel Stephenson Chef. I'm a senior advisor at IG. I've been with the firm for almost four years now and my background prior to joining IG and, and working across all of our services as Emily's just described is in fundraising and, and major gifts fundra fundraising and communication specifically. So um, definitely have a lot of empathy and uh, compassion and, and also knowledge about the kind of in-house considerations um, and challenges that you all might be going through right now. And it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, and hi, everyone. I'm Emily Collins Ellis. I'm the Managing Director at IG. I've been with the form firm for about four years. And again, uh, like Rachel, I work across all of our areas of work. Um, but before joining the firm, I was working um, in a number of small and medium sized charities, um, mostly in London, uh, in a few different cause areas. And um, those cause areas were quite controversial, um, human rights, asylum seekers, refugees, um, and also stigmatized mental health. Um, and I was fundraising during the financial crisis. So I feel like in terms of um, <laughs> fundraising in weird economic times and, and working with funders through, you know, austerity and, and, and similar crises that um, between Rachel and I, we've got some, some good expertise to bring to the table as well as um, some insights from what IG is seeing with their donor clients and how they're responding at this time. Mm -hmm. um, so we're just going to start with um, the the kind of what 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 kind of funders you might be working with and how changing plans with them um, might come about. So for, from our perspective, really funding relationships can fall um, funding relationships when you're needing to change plans can fall into two very clear categories. One is the unrestricted funding or the cost cost side of things where donors are really more bought into your mission and they're kind of giving you money to achieve what, what you would like to achieve and there's, there's fewer restrictions on how you can use that. Uh, and then the restricted funding side of things. So that might be restricted grants, it might be um, local authority contracts, where a specific result is expected by virtue of the money that's being given. And also you're restricted on specifically what you can spend that money on. Mm -hmm. So from our perspective, um, the way that you need to approach um, 
changing your plans with these funders is obviously slightly separate. Um, so starting with the unrestricted funding, um, on both sides, you really need to start by assessing what your actual needs are during this crisis and really having a clear answer to that, and also what the risks are. Obviously, there are quite a few risks at play at the moment, just, you know, depending on the, the type of organization you're working for. Uh, but in both cases, really, you need to have a solid answer um, to those questions before you move into any other stages of changing any plans with your funders. Um, next on the unrestricted is, is developing your strategy. So you, you actually, you, you're in a position with unrestricted funders to go to them um, with a specific uh, plan. We don't, you don't have to necessarily consult them. And in a sense, going to them with a specific plan probably would be more beneficial for you. So then it becomes a little bit more about informing them of what your strategy is and requesting support from them for that, if that's appropriate, um, rather than what we're suggesting as an alternative on the restricted side of things, which is consulting your donors before you get to that developing strategy phase. So on the restricted side, we're suggesting you start by assessing your needs and risks and then going to your donors and consulting them, um, not just on um, what they would like you to do, but also on what's possible, um, because they'll obviously be fielding lots of different um, requests and, and things will be changing quite rapidly for them. Um, so on both sides, it's kind of a, a similar journey, but that key difference is really whether you are developing your plan and then telling your donors about it and asking them to join you in a similar way as I imagine you did when you were fundraising for unrestricted support from them in the first place versus um, consulting them on how the plan might go and, and asking what options you have um, in your partnership with them. Mm -hmm. So uh, thinking about this, kind of taking a step back and having a bit of a bird's eye view on, on what's happening at the moment. And we, we just wanted to emphasize and have a, a quick conversation on the fact that this is a not just about fundraising. This is about so much more than that. And of course, fundraising is the mechanism through which we can deliver our work and impact and missions. Um, but this is a question about strategy, about your organization as a whole, you know, thinking through the various elements and considerations. Um, it's, a, it's a question about relationships as well and kind of partnerships and really what kind of relationships are already within your grasp and your network and what kind of partnership working are you used to and, and what could that look like in a crisis situation but also perhaps in the future as well and then the final element about systems thinking you know this this crisis in particular and of course in your various unique contexts it's about something so much bigger and about systems so much bigger than any of us individually or individually as ourselves or as an organization so it's really about understanding where your unique position is from both an impact and fundra fundraising perspective in the wider context of all of us in this charity sector ecosystem at this very challenging and also at this very competitive time as well mm -hmm. And I think um, just it's a little bit tongue in cheek for us to say this isn't about fundraising because obviously that's what we're here to talk about. But mm -hmm. um, so much as fundraisers, I think we're used to approaching um, fundraising in quite a siloed way or a transactional mm -hmm. way or a marketing way. So it's about selling, it's about thinning, it's about, um, you know, getting the right kind of case for support at a specific time. But right now, um, donors won't be wanting to know your vision, your mission, your 12 month KPIs. They want to know what you're doing tomorrow uh, or possibly yesterday um, and so right now it's less about um, acting as a fundraiser and much more about making sure that your funders are connected with the people it might be you it might mm -hmm. be your CEO um, who are able to speak to the ever evolving and you know rapidly evolving I would imagine um, strategy of your organization and speak to that with credibility it might also be about um, connecting them with your board as well so just thinking mm -hmm. about um, it's just a slight shift from the typical fundraising thinking um, to being a little bit more um, of a unit as an organization and engaging with funders in that way. Yeah, and, and also it's a good opportunity to start, um, sorry, just to break down silos within your organization, with, which often happens where the fundraising department is, you know, in one area and down the hallway, there's the more impact or programmatic department and the communication between the two isn't always the best. So this is a great opportunity to break down some of that within your organization, but also to then use that and leverage that for better fundraising and kind of external communication as well. Yeah, for sure. Um, so just going back to that, uh, that kind of flow chart that we had at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, first, we're going to start with start with need um, and what that looks like. What what answering that question really looks like, and what you need to have in place in terms of your thinking before you start engaging with your donors in this process. Um, so we split these questions, um, and obviously you can have these slides afterwards, so um, you don't need to furiously write down all of these now. Um, but we split them into kind of three main um, main buckets of questions that we think need answering. 
And it's really important at this weird time when people are fundraising and making um, really urgent asks with lots of different lenses to distinguish between the ones that you're talking about. So the first mm -hmm. one is the impact lens, the impact bucket. And that is really about um, the communities that you're serving or the impact that you're striving for as an organization. So for a lot of organizations, uh, coronavirus is, uh, is affecting the communities that they usually serve. Uh, and so thinking about what those communities normally need, so just obviously you, you, you would be or, already familiar with that, but then also anticipating how this crisis might be changing their needs. So for some organizations, that's really clear. If you work with people who are homeless or people who are living in food poverty, then coronavirus has a very, a, a very obvious effect on, on the needs of your communities you're working with. But other charities could not so clear cut might need, need some time to figure that out you might need to speak to some beneficiaries it might be a little bit less tangible than that environmental organizations for example um so thinking about what the normal needs are how this crisis changes them what the needs might be in the aftermath of this so once the crisis is over what what your communities might look like and how you might need to serve them differently in that context as well um and thinking about how you normally meet those needs and if that is possible for you right now if it's not how are you going to change your approach? Um, and also thinking really honestly about which of those needs is just simply not possible for you to do right now. So we have some clients um, who, whose work has to be face-to-face. -face. There's no way to do it digitally. They, they work with people on a face-to-face -face basis. Um, and so for them, they simply cannot meet those communities' needs right now. And they have to be really clear with themselves and their funders about that. Um, and then they're also asking themselves the question, um, in that case, if we've got you know a team that is used to working face-to-face -face and they have certain technical skills, um, which other communities or which new approaches um, can we do to meet the more urgent needs that are happening right now? So for example, some care providers who are literally not able to provide um, the face-to-face -face services that they're used to are um, supporting other NHS services right now, mm -hmm. for example. So there's, there's ways of kind of looking for innovation around those. So that's the list of, of kind of impact need questions that we would suggest starting with um, in, in articulating your needs for your donors. Then shifting to the second lens, which is your organization. And this is this is one that we're not actually that used to using as fundraisers. We are used to just fundraising for um, impact. But right now, actually, a lot of the urgency that people have in going to their donors is that ah, we, we, we're doing good work with our services, but we might not be here next month because of the way this impacts our fundraising, the way this impacts our cash flow. Um, and so actually going with an organizational need mm -hmm. to a donor is, is unusual, um, but it, it, it's almost a, a kind of unique time um, for thinking through these questions and speaking honestly with your funders about them. Um, so genuinely trying to answer the question, what does your organization need to weather this short-term crisis? It might be cash, it might be a release of restrictions, um, it could be a whole bunch of things, but honestly answering that question, because that's the first thing that your funders are going to be asking, and it's the first thing that funders are asking us as well, like what the charity mm -hmm. needs. Um, what might you need if this stops being a short-term crisis and turns into a slightly longer-term crisis, i.e. the health crisis continues, the lockdown continues, the economic slowdown continues? Um, what might you need to navigate the aftermath of it? So if it were to just remain short, short term, but the, the shocks of it will fall afterwards, what might you need then? What goals did you previously need to meet, maybe for your funding obligations or some other reason that you simply won't be able to? So thinking about um, need in that sense as well. And then also when you're framing this with funders, making sure to distinguish between the needs on this list that are met by the government response, i.e. your ability to furlough or pay staff if they're sick, Mm -hmm. um, versus the needs that aren't going to be met by the government response. And they're obviously the ones where philanthropy um, and other funders have a role to play um, in the biggest way. And then finally, just thinking a, a little bit about your donors' needs, not to censor them, but to make sure that you're thinking about their needs and their priorities uh, in the way that you're, you're talking to them and that also you're, you're practicing or you're demonstrating empathy for, for them because obviously they're in this crisis too. Mm -hmm. um, so firstly, just being clear, and you probably will need to do this across your whole, whole portfolio, about what your donors and your funders are usually needing and expecting from you. So that can be everything from reporting through to, you know, regular check-ins through to specific KPIs and impact goals that they want you to be meeting. So getting all of that clear on the table, what is usually expected of us and which of those needs will we simply not be able to meet during this crisis? 
Um, there's a lot of donors that have already come out and been very transparent about the fact that they don't expect you to submit your six month report while this is happening. So um, it's not to freak yourself out necessarily, but just to be really clear about um, you know, which, what donors have said that they want from you and that they need from you, um, which of them have already said, hey, we, we actually don't need that right now, don't stress about it, and which ones you, know, you still need to address that point with. Mm -hmm. um, thinking about how their needs might be changed or rapidly changing during this crisis and how you might meet them. So for example, if you're a health organization and your donor is usually funding you for kind of longer term health work, probably their time horizons for impact is, are gonna be really shortened by this. Um, research funders are another example that are, are operating um, in, in, in really rapidly moving ways. So thinking about how their needs might have changed and, and maybe how you might help to meet them and that could obviously have positive funding implications for you too. Um, thinking about what goals they need you to meet. So for, for example, they might be answerable to a larger funder that's funding them. They might be answerable to their board. Um, they might be answerable to a partnership that they're funding as part of. So thinking about what goals they have um, that you won't be able to, to meet for them uh, in this context, and obviously being very upfront and very clear and very prompt in your communication about that. And then also, this is a system thinking point that Rachel made, thinking about what needs others might be communicating to them so you might be going to them and saying hey um we would like you to release extra funding or we would like you to um add us to your zoom subscription so we can use your conferencing facilities whatever you're asking them for or whatever your needs are um others might be going to them with similar needs and it's just important to think about um how overwhelmed they might be with that and, and how you can um to think about what you want to ask for given the fact that they probably are oversubscribed um, but also how you might be helping them to assess the needs of the sector by saying the same thing as others. So if you have a group of um, charities or NGOs in your area that are working on similar issues, making sure you're all singing from the same hymn sheet when you're speaking to donors about what the need is on the ground so that the donors can get a sense of what is needed. We've, we've, we've had a lot of funders asking us um, to help them to do needs assessments, rapid needs mm -hmm. assessments, so um, that there's a value in you being clear and transparent about that and also being consistent with the needs of others in your sector. Mm -hmm. All right, um, so continuing on with that kind of first bucket under the, the unrestricted, unrestricted pathways. So there's the idea of assessing your needs. Um, there's also the idea of assessing your risk and doing that in a kind of a full and in a rapid way, which can be quite difficult under time constraints. Um, so definitely want to acknowledge that. But there's a few key buckets um, that we've outlined here that we want to walk you through, which is about how you can assess your risk as an organization, as a fundraiser, but also what donors might expect you um, to have assessed by the time that you are engaging in conversations with them. So there's a bit of a donor centric lens on some of these re recommendations. Um, but they're useful either way. So the first one is what is your financial watershed? And by that we mean the kind of tipping point or the breaking point after which the lights will go out. You know, what is that kind of cash flow projection and timeline where if you don't have enough money in the bank by this date, you're going to really, really be in trouble. So it's important to get pretty clear on what those figures look like and also what that timeline looks like. Mm -hmm. The second one, and also, sorry, Rachel, just to add oh. to that, um, obviously, um, funders will be used to speaking to you about your financial position um, in terms mm -hmm. of your reserve and your resilience in general. Um, but there's a few different ways to cut the cash flow projections on the financial watershed thing. And one of them is no more fundraising at all. And then another one is, I don't know, the London Marathon's been postponed to Octo October. So assuming that that actually does go ahead assuming that this event that we have in November mm -hmm. does go ahead, then this is what that might look like. Making sure that when you're answering that kind of watershed question that you're you're factoring in your reserves because they will be doing that and that you're factoring in um, kind of a plan A, plan B, plan C scenario that, that's giving them an idea of, of, of the, the point at which, the point of no return essentially for your finances and how they might help you to, to shift you to, towards the, the, the rosiest looking scenario. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it could be quite interesting to see how um, how coronavirus has, a, has an effect on fundraising for reserves, which is often quite a challenge. Maybe this will help that case, fingers crossed. Um, but, but for the moment, it's definitely about balancing that and having those transparent conversations because it's something everyone's thinking of. 
Um, the second one is about your impact watershed. And that has a little bit of two ways to think about it. So again, we mean the tipping point after which you're really in trouble. And that could be in two ways. So that could be A, um, the, the volume of people or communities or services that you're providing if they're related to coronavirus. And if that volume gets too large for you to manage based on your current organizational capacity, what does that breaking point look like? Um, there also could be another way to look at it, which is if your services or if your work and focus is not related to coronavirus, at which point is it not relevant at, anymore to continue with business as usual? And at which point would you kind of have to pivot or pause your focus? The third one, um, speaking of that, is where does your typical work sit within this crisis? So it's it's really important to reflect on that and, and to do that honestly. That, you know, there's a lot of organizations who are very directly relevant to, to COVID, you know, people working with elderly populations or homeless populations, you know, as Emily just mentioned. And, and it's really important to understand um, from a risk perspective, how relevant and contextual your work is, you know, in, in this current environment. Is it absolutely necessary? What is the risk to your communities if you do not continue? Is it high because they're so affected by the crisis? Is it medium to low because they're not? Um, speaking of which, again, which stakeholders might block or slow your adaptation? So if you do need to pivot or, you know, rapidly scale up or kind of change direction in any way from an impact perspective because of coronavirus, what are the external stakeholders that you'll need to get on board? Is it something within your local council? Is it governmental? Is it, you know, um, different corporate partners within your network? Essentially, what are the actors around you that you would need to have buy-in and support from in order to get the things done that you need to get done? And how can you work to influence those relationships and do that in a positive and fast kind of quick way? Next up, we've got how, de how dependable can you commit to being during this? And that's a really important one, which oftentimes can be challenging for fundraisers and charities to really um, sit in and, and you know, can manage expectations around because, you know, it, there's so much uncertainty out there. So it's really important to manage expectations, both internally and externally. And so how much can you commit to doing during this? How dependable can you be to your external partners, to your donors, but also to your community? Um, the answer may be not very, and that may be okay, but getting really clear on, on what the risk of that is. It's also about not overcommitting um, in response to increased needs, um, because obviously mm -hmm. everybody wants to help and everybody um, you know, has something to offer. Um, but from a financial perspective, when you're engaging in, in risk-based thinking with a funder, um, it, it's not it's not advisable to say the sky's the limit. Sure, we can we can do it all. Just give us the money for it because um, th th this is a crisis where we this is a crisis where we don't know if it's a sprint or a marathon. And mm -hmm. um, if you commit to really really big pieces of work at the beginning of this crisis, um, and then you hit financial trouble, um, or you know you you basically you get to a position where too many people are relying on you but you can't service them. Um, that that's going to cause an even bigger problem for the sector as a whole, as well as your organization. And funders will be thinking strategically about how to make sure that doesn't happen across their funding portfolio. Um, mm -hmm. And so just being really clear with yourselves and also be, having an answer to that question um, and mm -hmm. how you're thinking about that with your funders. Absolutely. And finally, um, the slightly controversial one of who might be more in need of support than you. And what we mean by that is, you know, of course, that this is not to create a hierarchy of need or, you know, of, of organizations. But at the same time, this probably isn't the most appropriate climate for everyone to be fundraising at the same rate or velocity that you're used to. You know, thinking of funders, our, our inboxes are full of emails from every organization we engage with, from the tech companies to our banks to, the, you know, our local cafes. Our in email inboxes are essentially full. Our asks are full. Um, donors are going to be very oversubscribed during this time time and there are going to be other organizations perhaps with a greater need than you. So it's just important to be strategic about what kind of asks and cultivation strategies you're using during this time, not to appear too demanding or too insensitive or just making sure you're being compassionate and, and contextual and thinking again in that in that systems change framework. Mm -hmm. um, so just quickly want to um, share a quote from a, an interview we did with, uh, so we have a podcast called What Donors Want. Um, which is where we interview donors on what yes. they want. Uh, it's really a kind of behind the scenes um, look into to how donors think about their giving and, and obviously advice straight from the donor's mouth and in, in, in what they want to see from, from fundraisers. And so this one um, I think is, is relevant to a few of those risks 
um, that we were just mm -hmm. describing and, and how you communicate to your funders about them. And this is from Nick Jenkins, who I uh, was one of the dragons on Dragon's Den, who's also a philanthropist. Uh, and he was saying um, on the interview that an awful lot of the pictures that he sees from charities are really glossy, uh, promising, you know, big, perfect things. Mm -hmm. um, and he was saying, you know, that I'm a smart person. I know that the problems that, that charities are dealing with are quite complicated and they really want to deal with the truth. I really want to understand, um, you know, how they're going to fix the problem and what the challenges in that might be, not uh, just get the kind of perfect answer. And I think that this is a really good time when funders really do need to, to know the risks, the challenges, and, and hear from charities that honesty is probably also a, a good opportunity to, to establish that dynamic in a funding relationship if it doesn't already exist there. 100%. All right. Um, I'm also keeping an eye on the time. We've got a little over five minutes, so we'll make sure that we that we get through all of the recommendations. We have a lot to say on this topic, so um, uh, we, we will speed through the next few minutes. And then, of course, we want to make sure you have enough time for the Q and A. Um, so the next point is, you know, super brief. It's essentially about defining your strategy. Okay, so you know you need to change. You've assessed the risk and the need. So what are you going to do next? And in kind of defining your ideal strategy and then workshopping that with donors as appropriate. So there's four key situations or, or um, scenarios rather that you might find yourself in. So the first one is canceling. If you need to cancel or, you know, an event or a certain part of your work, um, that's okay. It's being, it's happening a lot, as we all know. Um, make sure you're not burning any bridges with any of the key stakeholders within that and that you're also protecting the most vulnerable. And if there are vulnerable people that depend on you for this service or event or whatever it is that you're canceling, just making sure that they're protected in, in some of your other services or that care for them is incorporated in some way. The second one is postponing. Again, we're seeing that a lot, and particularly in regard to events. Um, so just be realistic with your timelines and, and ensure that you're managing expectations around when you might postpone this particular thing to, and, and also recognizing that pretty much every event um, of the spring and summer is being postponed. It's probably not a good idea to postpone something to June because we don't know what it's what's going to be happening then this is really much more of an autumn winter or even next year scenario um, but also keeping in mind that a lot of other charities are postponing their activities and events so just as much as you can thinking strategically about what that might look like for you um, next up, we've got adapting. So if you do need to pivot, adapt, shift some of your services, approaches, events, strategies, um, be realistic with your impact goals, you know, not not over promising or, or, or kind of burdening yourself with those expectations and influencing stakeholders um, when you can to make it possible. Again, those external stakeholders that we spoke of um, in a few previous slides. And then, of course, if you're starting something new, um, really, the, the big point here is ensuring collaboration. Don't reinvent the wheel. Don't bet on new money. This is not the time to do that for sure. You know, there's a lot of people and organizations and charities out there doing a lot of amazing work. And so the more you can collaborate, the better you are going to be in terms of impact, but also the easier uh, you will, uh, the easier time you will have with fundraising because collaborative approaches and that kind of um, communal and community accountability is very attractive to funders. Mm -hmm. And so we would recommend framing whatever strategy you discuss with your funders, um, whether it's kind of canceling something that they're funding, postponing something that they're funding, or kind of adapting, or starting something new within the context of your funding relationship, um, to have these focuses, foci, focuses, um, but also kind of frame your strategy in this way, because they will be flooded with lots of different requests. And so if they can understand whether this is mm -hmm. a right now urgent, we're, put, we're kicking a can down the road, or frankly, this is never going to happen discussion, uh, that, that that framework um, we're finding is, is really useful for our, for our funding clients um, in thinking that through. Mm -hmm. So in terms of evolving your donor relationships, and we put evolve because we know that changing plans with funders can sometimes um, be quite daunting. It might be something that you've had to do before and so you're fine with it, uh, but it's still gonna be an evolution of your relationship with them uh, in this kind of current crisis. And I think everybody's relationships with everyone are evolving um, as we work through this together. Um, so again, just splitting between the kind of unrestricted side where we're informing them about it and restricted side where we're consulting them on it. Um, just mm -hmm. some key points here um, quickly on, that we would recommend um, bearing in mind. So on the unrestricted side, and this goes for both actually, but um, prioritizing who you're spending your time on. Um, obviously, your biggest and your longest standing donors um, would be our advice. But you don't have to be you know, accountable to every single donor that you've ever had in, in how you're responding to this. Um, just making sure you're focusing your time, especially your relationship managers and your leadership um, on the most important donors, the ones that you need to have these conversations with. Being clear about your needs. We've already spoken about how the questions to assess for that. 
going in as the authority on the solution. So not going in and saying, hey, what do you want to do about this? But going in and saying, hey, this is what we think we should do about this. How do you, how do you feel about that? Definitely no apologies. Everybody's facing the same crisis. Everybody should understand that this is um, really challenging for everybody. So don't go in saying, oh, no, I'm really sorry. We won't be able to meet our goals. Go in and say, this is something that's meeting our goals. And here is how we need to pivot in order to you know, protect our communities. And think outside of money as well. Foundations um, are kind of just building back up their war chests after needing to mm -hmm. um, to deal with the financial crisis. I'm not saying that you know tiny violin moment, but uh, in terms of how <laughs> they're thinking about their portfolio and what money they're able to release now for a crisis versus keep long term to keep grant making for the future, um, they're they're probably much more likely to be able to um, to give support outside of just cash. Um, so if you need money, ask for the money, but think outside of money as well. If there are things that would add value to your work, other than that. And then on the restricted side, the consulting discussion, make sure you're being proactive about it. Do not wait for them to get in touch with you about this crisis. Make sure that you are going to them um, with your solutions that you have prepared. Um, so definitely not a full strategy as with the unrestricted side, making sure you are going to them with a consultation and a discussion, but being ready with what you think the right solution for you are and not just going in and asking them um, for a ruling, which is the next point. Make sure you have options in mind not going to them and saying, okay, what, what's our fate? Uh, tell us whether or not you're going to continue funding us. Go in with a kind of proactive solution that you think is the right way for your partnership to continue. Um, bringing partnerships working into the dynamic if it's not already there and making sure you're standing alongside them, looking at your impact goals together and discussing how your shared missions are going to be affected by this crisis rather than going in kind of with the begging goal and, and thinking in that kind of transactional way everybody needs to be using this room bed relationship but our timer yes <laughs> okay we're going to speak quicker and then finally this one's um self-explanatory but make sure that you're going you're agreeing with them upon bc and b um, because things are so fast moving and fast changing in this context um, um super this is just another super quick say, quote we don't need to read it out probably we can yeah. just say look at the slides afterwards or listen to our podcast plug exactly <laughs> <laughs> um I'll just give a quick insight on this, um, Rachel, you can jump in if you have anything yeah. else. Um, so we work with a lot of donors, as we've said, um, advising them on their giving strategies. And I just wanted to say some of the ways that donors are thinking about their responses to COVID-19 so that you can think about how you might, what you might ask them for. Mm -hmm. Some of these are obvious, others are not so much. Um, first one, creating new emergency funds, literally money that did not already exist or wasn't already being given, being cut out to organizations in this crisis. To removing funding restrictions, so grants that have already been committed, um, removing the restrictions on those so that they can be spent on anything that the organization needs them to, needs in this crisis. Three, um, allocating grant, reallocating grant budget lines, so grants that have already been committed saying, you know, okay, fine, if you can't fund this service, you can, you can put that cost onto this other thing that you need during this crisis, so not fully unrestricted, but allowing some flexibility. Uh, completely writing off or adjusting KPIs, so saying, yeah, we get it, you're not going to meet your KPIs this year, we're just going to consider that money lost, we're still going to give you the, we're still going to give you the grant, uh, or adjusting the KPIs that, to account for the fact that things are happening differently right now. Um, pausing or shortening grant timeline. So the pausing one is um, saying, okay, right now we get that you can't do the work that we're funding you for, so we're just going to put the grant on hold and then put, get, start giving it to you again once you're able to deliver your services. Um, shortening grant timelines is okay we see that actually you're doing much more right now and you need the money right now to do more than we agreed in the next month <laughs> than, than you were going to do the whole year so we're going to shorten that grant timeline and also potentially bring the point at which you can apply for more money forward as well uh, and then finally this kind of more than money grant plus support and services so providing additional um, support outside of just cash um, for organizations and so we've seen people um, paying for like ergonomic workstations for their workers at home or paying for um, safety equipment uh, if people need to be around people who potentially have COVID-19. So um, thinking about those needs um, outside of just money. Mm -hmm. Another um, quick but important slide on communication with donors because it's one thing to know all this and then it's another thing to communicate and, and interact with them. So um, quickly, um, communication when it should be now um, or yesterday, <laughs> if uh, if we can say that. So obviously this is an urgent matter. It's rapidly evolving. So um, this is a communication of the now and regularly, more or less for supporters, probably once a week, um, depending on what kind of change you're navigating with them. 
In terms of who, it should be, of course, the relationship manager or the key point of contact for that donor that they're used to speaking with. But at the same time, if that key point of contact is not the senior leadership of your organization, that senior leadership, that person, CEO, whomever, needs to be brought into those key supporter communications because it's really important um, that any key changes are communicated from that person as well. In terms of content, um, of course, always setting the scene, you know, acknowledging the current climate and being compassionate with how you're setting that scene. Don't ignore it. Um, it's, it's relevant. It's in all of our minds. And then explaining um, and consulting on the approach. So really what we, what we mean by that is being an expert at that table, sitting there as an equal partner with ideas, coming in with a solutions focused mindset um, and really kind of explaining in a thorough way and consulting them in that appropriate boundary donor management way, um, but making sure that you that you come in with that kind of boldness. And then, of course, um, finally, tone, definitely confidence, that kind of bold and, and unapology, as Emily said, empathy, again, recognizing that all of us are affected by this in ways that we might not even know yet. So just really, really being compassionate and bringing empathy into this solutions focused, as I said, and clear clear, concise, this is not the time for anything too long or, you know, walls of text. This is the time for bullet points and really clear action focused communications. Mm -hmm. um, also going to skip over this quote. You can listen to yeah. the podcast if you want to hear it in person. Um, so quickly, it's kind of hard to find silver linings in such a horrible situation. But um, in terms of fundraising, there probably are some to be found. Um, virtual coffees is something that we're having a lot of success mm -hmm. with with our clients um, as well. Um, so just making the most of that and, and kind of reaching out to offer those as you would a, a normal coffee. Um, taking advantage of the fact that some donors have a bit more time um, at home mm -hmm. with a bit less to do and possibly um, slightly easier logistics to, to arrange that kind of virtual coffee with them. Um, taking advantage of the fact that funders are very focused and you know what their priority is right now. You can answer that question without having to do any prospect research. Everybody's focused on the same thing. And they're really kind of laser focused on ensuring that um, mm -hmm. this thing doesn't affect their portfolio too much. So you can kind of, you know what to talk to them about. Um, and then there's a few kind of um, kind of thinking, uh, the ways that people are thinking uh, that come into play here for fundraising as well. So collectivism is obviously, um, you know, this idea that we're, we're reliant on each other and interdependent um, and interconnected uh, is obviously literally taking the four by virtue of the fact that we, we with our survival <laughs> depends on everybody thinking that way and so that can bring you can bring that sense into your fundraising as well uh, working with your funders to imagine what the new normal could look like after this crisis um, is uh, is a really kind of inspiring and positive prospect for a lot of people and, and especially in social justice context there's, there's quite a lot of potential there um, and so making sure you're bringing that into your conversations with donors as well uh, and then also just understanding that everybody has a sense of urgency and that might mean that more money is on the table faster, that decisions happen more quickly um, and that you can you can probably move a little bit faster with your with your donor relationship from the kind of identification and cultivation stage um, if, with new fundraising, but also into the grant renewal phase with your existing funders as well. Mm -hmm. And finally, um, this is a pretty self-explanatory graphic but we want to just emphasize that this is about bending not breaking and the kind of bringing them to the to the forefront the idea of organizational resilience which is important at any time but particularly important to have in place during times like these so of course there's the kind of uh, typical journey um, that we're all on in, in our various contexts but the idea of that you know the surviving do what you need to do to keep the lights on don't worry about it just get get it done um coping through to recovery. Um, of course, that's when kind of the, the fire might simmer a little bit or the pressure decreases. Learning the idea that this is an opportunity, of course, for reflection and, and refinement and changes in the future. And that leads into the ultimate stage of transformation, which is all going to be relevant for us in our different ways. And the last thing I want to highlight on this slide is as well, you see the, um, the, the balancing or the kind of scale, and it's a little bit tipped over to the side of organizational sustainability. And it's a really important point, as Emily said earlier, the idea of assessing need from an organization perspective is actually relatively unique in the context of fundraising with COVID. Of course, you know, it's, it would be great if we lived in a world where donors always wanted to fund our organizational resilience and overheads, but that's not always the case as we know. However, in circumstances like these, there's a really compelling case for that kind of investment and that kind of unrestricted and operational support. Um, so because that's, you know, that's the world we're living in. It's, it's the reality of it and it's directly tied to impact in a way that's much more visible than it perhaps ever was before for certain donors. So really making sure to understand where the scale is tipping in your unique context for your organization 
and fundraising in a way that's working to balance it out without apology for the misalignment or for the scales tipping in a way that you didn't expect or anticipate because we're all in the same boat together. Yeah, for sure. And I think that um, kind of resilience um, flowchart from survive through to transform is um, is, a, is a common way of thinking about uh, personal recovery and um, mm -hmm. you know organizational resilience. Um, but that is the journey to work with your funders on on articulating. Um, right now, you're in survival, and that's what you'll be asking them for. But as you start to come out of this, as we all start to come out of this, um, helping to see, helping to um, helping them to see how you, how you're planning to move along that journey and how they can support you with getting through each stage. And, and helping them to think about that for themselves probably as well in, in the process um, will be really uh, essential and also plan to do a really good stead for a longer term relationship as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank Sorry you. we went we over we... time. I know. <laughs> Please let us it's, know your um, questions. <laughs> exactly. I think we'll still have a few minutes for Q&A. So now we're going to go into the live version of us, not the pre-recorded. Uh, but thank you so much for your time. What's that? That's three three times I've got to turn my mic off today, I think. Oh my god. When like Yeah. Thank you very much to Emily and Rachel uh for that session. Really helpful. Very strange times uh overall. But yeah, I mean dealing with funders is a strange times and, and everything they went through there seems seems a lot more manageable. Um I like them talking about plan A, B, and C, which is something we, we talked about earlier, I think, with Wayne maybe or someone. Um, but it's about you know being able to show what happens if if this what happens if we can't move for six months if we if if um, you know funding gets cut everywhere except for here um, so all those kind of uh, eventualities those are exercises our organisation should be going through but it just instills confidence back in the funders if they can show that we we've, we've mapped that out um, so that's great um, they Rachel and Emily were going to come on for live Q and A. Uh, I do not believe they've arrived in the um, in the green room room backstage. Maybe they heard about the rotten oranges and they've decided not to attend. But I did see them in the chat box below. So um, you know, do feel free to seek them out at the chat box below and and ask them questions or find them at their website at impactinggrowth.com. Um, and their their podcast is really good if you're into podcasts and many people are. Um, if you're into podcasts, their podcast is great because they talk to actual funders um, and they talk around those conversations and, and it's good to hear it actually coming out of, um, uh, from their point of view um, and they delve into that. So it's a really good, really good podcast that I recommend you check out. You'll find links to it at impactinggrowth.com. If you only listen to one fundraising podcast, make it mine. But if you listen to two, then also go on to that one. There's a lot of good fundraising podcasts out there, aren't there? Um, so we're, we're nearly at the end. We're nearly at the end. Can you believe it? I mean, it's not the 12 hour conference we did last year um, with fundraising everywhere, but still this is intense, two streams, great speakers from all over the world, some amazing stuff in there. Uh, a lot of people chatting in the comment box, a lot of people getting in touch, really, really appreciate that. You can find me on Twitter there, to, at Toast Fundraiser, if anyone wants to follow me. Um, or please feel free to reach out to me afterwards. We only have um, our closing plenary left. So we have an amazing closing plenary speaker coming up. That's going to be in this room and the other room. Um, you might call it a simulcast, although I'm not sure I want to call it that. Um, but that's going to be streaming in this room and, and the other room um, um, together. Um, and that's coming from Alistair Frost. Uh, and I've seen him speak, and it's great. It's really good. Um, so do stick around for that. That's starting in three minutes. Um, after our closing plenary, myself and Nikki um, are going to reunite live on camera. So you have to stick around for that. Uh, we're going to we're going to try and get into each other's rooms at the same time. Um, th you know, if the internet was breaking already, this is definitely going to crash everything when we try and do this. So stick around and see how badly this goes. It's going to be amazing. Um, so yeah, so myself and Nikki will be closing off. We're going to try and get a special guest or two from Salesforce to pop in. We've got some cool stuff for you um, to fl flag what's coming up ahead. Uh, you know, on fundraising everywhere, we have lots of events coming up. Um, you know, some are cheap and affordable. You know, our conferences go at 55 uh, euro. Um, but then we also have lots of free events. So we have karaoke coming up. 
uh, virtual karaoke. We have virtual uh, drinks and virtual events. Lots of cool training from people like Alice Ferris and um, and John Lapp is coming up, and I'm doing one. And then we have you know other stuff coming up. And we're led by our members. We run a membership program, so members suggest what topics they want to see covered, and then we get some of the world's experts in to uh, to do that uh, in a really affordable way. So if you want to keep your professional development going, if you want to keep your networking going through all of this. And um, then please do follow Fundraising Everett. Do keep checking back. Me and me and uh, Nikki are working our little butts off uh, to try and bring as much affordable and free education and socializing and stuff virtually uh, to all of you. So please, please um, check it out. We have a couple of open networking rooms uh, that are open all the time with video chat. So if you go to, which we're upgrading soon as well, but if you go to fundraisingeverywhere.com slash rooms, you can just pop in and chat to other fundraisers, other nonprofit people around there. Um, think of it as a networking event that's always on. So you can keep up your networking. You can keep up your visual networking uh, with other people in the sector, and, and we really recommend you do. We've got some other cool stuff coming up. We also run events for lots of people, or we host events on here for lots of people. So charities and umbrella organizations uh, will also run stuff through here. So you're going to see things like I wish I thought of that coming up, the virtual version um, and other events coming up. And if you have a, an event coming up that you want to turn virtual, um, then please go, do get in touch because we're, we're loving it. Whew. Okay, let's have a look in the comment box just before we head over to closing plenary. I can see people are still chatting. Some lovely messages from people. You're all so lovely, aren't they? Yeah, aren't people in our sector just so nice and lovely? Like I used to work like when I started, I, I know none of you care, but when I started, I, I was going to be an accountant and I worked in a bank and it was horrible. It was just like such a bummer. And someone told me it was like there wasn't casual Friday. And then I went in on my first Friday and everyone was dressed casually. Yeah. It's like banks. And I work for pharmaceuticals and they're awful as well. I love this sector. People are so generous with time. Everyone today has been so generous, uh, so helpful. Everyone I've spoken to, you know, during all of this and in my whole career in the nonprofit sector, people are just so generous and lovely. I'm going to shut up now. Um, so we're going to take you over to um, the closing plenary and the closing plenary um, again is from Alistair Frost. Here we go. It's amazing. There's nothing new about change. Its arrival is sometimes unexpected, but change is perpetual. It's happening all around us all the time. And you'd think we'd be better at coping with change, but history tells a very different story. Back in the 1990s, I remember to watch a movie at home, we used to rent DVDs from high street stores. And there were a couple of guys who were really frustrated with these late return fines. So if you took a DVD back late, they penalized you. So they started a DVD rent by post business. And you could keep the DVD for as long as you liked, but could only rent a new one after returning the first DVD. So meanwhile, on the high street, movie rental giant Blockbuster thought this was absurd. With over 9,000 retail locations, there was, there was frankly no need for change. A few short years later, Blockbuster filed for bankruptcy. 84,000 people lost their jobs. Today, people don't rent DVDs, we stream. And, and Netflix, that DVD delivery company started by those two smart guys back in the 90s is now one of the world's leading entertainment platforms. And the same is happening with Uber. Uh, love it or hate it, there's no denying that Uber has no qualms rewriting the rule books. When Uber started up in London, I remember that the drivers of our famous black cabs started a protest. They, they were arguing that Uber was taking their business, had an unfair advantage, was not playing by the rules. The black cabs blockaded some streets to protest, bringing traffic to a halt across London. And what happened? Well, more people signed up to Uber's faster, cheaper, easier, smarter service that day than ever before. You see, Uber looks at the status quo and sees all its imperfections and tears up the rule books. And change like this from Uber and Netflix is everywhere. Maybe it's not so prevalent in the nonprofit sector, but there's nothing new about change. Change is perpetual and unrelenting. And it's those of us who get in the driving seat who come out the winners. Because I believe that change that's happened to us over the last few weeks and in the difficult weeks to come is simply our opportunity to rethink ways of working and to embrace exciting new possibilities. Over the course of today's special event, I hope you've taken the opportunity 
to listen to many of the great speakers and the ideas that have been shared. And I hope you've taken loads of notes and are starting to formulate a plan in your mind for where your charity goes next. No charity on earth has the deep experience of fundraising during a pandemic on this scale that will be needed. So you're not alone. And there's no point being frozen by uncertainty or mourning the loss of that carefully planned activity plan. You know, that calendar that you spent months creating. It's gone, people. It's history. It's time to rebuild. And so now is your moment to take assertive action to guarantee a positive future for your charity and to shift your mindset from, I don't know, business as usual to whatever the new normal will be. It's yours to create. Hi, everyone. I'm Alistair Frost, and I'm a marketing and change specialist, formerly of Microsoft and Kimberly Clark. In my day job, I'm a keynote speaker and trainer, helping organizations cope with change. And at this precise moment right now, I'm here with you to share some thoughts on how you can cope with the tsunami of change brought upon us by the global coronavirus pandemic. Now, thinking back on my career, I remember the day when I first joined Microsoft. I had a ton of meetings. You see, prior to joining Microsoft, I'd been a head of marketing for Andrex Toilet Tissue. I knew all about Labrador puppies and soft toilet paper, but software was, well, a very different beast. And on my first day, I remember having a ton of induction meetings and being bombarded with acronyms and abbreviations. None of it made any sense. And I'd, I'd scribble notes all day long. And then and I found myself working late into the night at home trying to make sense of it all. It was exhausting. A few weeks in, and I'm in a big team meeting. We're all seated around the big table. And yet again, I'm there with my feverishly writing notes down. And the boss is babbling on about, APIs, how we, we need to adapt our messaging to leverage APIs, how, how the API will give us a competitive advantage. And everyone's nodding and writing things in their notepads or typing on their laptops. And that's when it hit me. I can't go on like this. What on earth is an API? So I put down my pen and rather anxiously asked the question. Uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, what's an API? And I'll never forget the quizzical looks around the room. The boss turned to a colleague and asked her to explain. Um, it's, uh, it's the program that allows our program to talk to another program, I think. And another person pipes up. No, no, it's, a, it's an interface that um, enables external functionality within our software. Now, finally, I get some sense. Our API stands for Application Programming Interface. Uh, but that's as far as the explanation went. Now, it turns out that everyone in the room kind of knows what an API is, but very few people know what it stands for, and even fewer can coherently explain what it does. It's just a shorthand we're all using for a feature built into some of our software. And you see, that's the day that I realized in a world that's moving so quickly, where change is perpetual and unrelenting, it's okay not to have all the answers. It's okay to admit your ignorance. And unless you have the courage to ask, oh, what is that thing? Oh, what does it do? Or why is all this happening? You're admitting to yourself that you don't know and may never know. Because today, the change happening in our crisis riddled world is coming at us so quickly, we can't wait to have all the information before deciding how to act. We've got to learn to thrive in this ambiguity, to start seeing new constraints and restrictions as wonderful opportunities. Like me, you're going to have to learn to delight in the magical thrill of change. The good news is that we humans are expert at coping with change. We've been evolving all our lives, yet few of us realize how much we're changing all the time. These days, now, I can't imagine going out without my smartphone. In fact, to be fair right now, I, I can't imagine going out, but that's another story. But even within my house, I keep my smartphone with me when I go from room to room. Yet a few years ago, I used to have to carry a few coins in my pocket in case I needed to make an emergency call from a phone box. Similarly, it seems perfectly normal 
for me to be sitting here in my home office talking to hundreds of people around the world. Yet a few years ago, I'd have needed to book a giant conference venue to reach such an audience. The phrase I use to describe this universal truth is ready already. We are ready already for any change that life throws at us. And the latest changes imposed upon us by the global crisis are simply the most recent opportunity for us to think differently and to do better. I think it's fair to say that in truth, most of us are lazy. We get set in our ways. We do the same things the same way because it's good enough and it kind of works, right? But change, of course, is something we fear. It's hard, it's risky, it's tiring. But the people who will succeed tomorrow see today as their opportunity to reinvent. They see the change as an invitation to reinvention. They see and seize new possibilities with an energetic willingness to try something new. You know, look, well, we can all sit around and feel despondent, or we can grab the challenge, kick it firmly up the backside, and start creating our new reality today. Still not convinced you're ready already? Well, look, here's a simple question. What would you like to be able to do while driving? Now, you're probably scratching your head thinking, what else could you do in your car, you know? And, and you might struggle to come up with some radical ideas, even though radical, arguably, is exactly what's happening to the driving experience with modern cars today. And when asked, unprompted, what they'd like to be able to do while driving, most people come up with quite simple, often pre-existing ideas, like, oh, I'd like to be able to listen to podcasts, or I'd like to be able to talk hands-free on the phone, you know, stuff like that. But in a recent study by Global Web Index, and full disclosure, they are one of my clients, but you know they're a great company. Uh, Global Web Index did this study and, and when prompted with possible feasible new capabilities, most people are super keen to try out new things while driving. 61% of people said they'd like their car to be able to find them a nearby parking space. That would be amazing, wouldn't it? Not having to drive around aimlessly finding that space, but to actually have it pointed out to you and to drive you to it. 57% wanted to be able to use voice commands to talk to their car to change the music. 52% thought it would be great to be able to pay for fuel in advance. Now, technologically, all of those things are possible. And when unprompted, we wouldn't think about having that ability. But when offered the option to do those things, we leap at the chance. I remember from the study, a further 38% said they'd like to be able to do their weekly shopping while driving. Uh, personally, I'm not sure that one will catch on. I mean, surely driving is complicated enough without having to try to remember what's left in your fridge for dinner tonight. Yeah, but anyway, you see, when we show people new possibilities that make their lives easier or better or more positive or more meaningful, they're often really eager to embrace them. They are ready already for whatever changes life throws their way, just as you are ready already to make the most of the challenges presented by the coronavirus pandemic. Another of my rules is that the opportunities you must pursue are already close at hand. Please don't make the rookie mistake of thinking that everything needs to change to make a new thing possible. Many organizations today when faced with this urgent need to find new ways of functioning may feel the need for radical outlandish reinvention. They'll think they need to do a Netflix when now, frankly, they're barely a blockbuster today. So you don't need to reinvent everything, but you do need to very quickly make small things better. So think about some of the best responses to the constraints imposed upon us by the pandemic. Many of them are joyfully simple and easy to implement. Uh, here in the UK, all the pubs and bars are closed to visitors. They're closed for health reasons. But many pubs are now reinventing themselves and operating as home delivery food providers. Some are selling great beer via click and collect. The gyms also had to close, but many personal trainers are now offering private training sessions over video conference calls. My local butcher, get this, my local butcher is now selling healthy fruit and vegetables. Who'd have thought? All of these changes happened because of sudden necessity. These businesses were faced with an urgent need to find fresh ways to serve customers to keep their business alive. And perhaps, like me, you're now wondering why it was that we couldn't get fabulous home delivery food or beer from the pub before. 
Now I'm asking myself why I always had to go to the gym to work out and I couldn't video conference. I'm not even sure why shops needed to be open seven days a week. When good change happens, the radically different can become the new normal in the blink of an eye. So don't be afraid of making changes to your operating model. As long as the changes you introduce serve your donors, your volunteers, your staff well, you may be surprised how open the rest of the world will be to your reinvention. So where do we start? Well, I would begin with your purpose. Remind yourself, as if you need to, why your charity exists. What's the core purpose it serves? What positive difference does it make to the world? And now you know why you're important, here sadly is the kicker. The way you delivered your remarkable service before the crisis was designed for a way of living that no longer exists. It's gone. In-person fundraising events are out of the question. Street collections are outlawed. Even getting volunteers to help the people we strive to serve may prove impossible. But our purpose, our mission, our reason for being hasn't changed one bit. So now is the time to double down on passion that burns inside you, to make a positive difference to the world. You know, so many people deprived of their normal existence are crying out for meaning in their lives. And sure, they may be worried about their financial position, their job, their family, but a sense of purpose and an opportunity to help others can bring immense meaning to people in distress. You see, you can be that meaning. You can be the agent that brings meaning to the lives of people experiencing radical change and turmoil. Your purpose, your activism, your heart, your passion can be their guiding light in a time of darkness, anxiety, and worry. But let's not bet the farm on just one big change. We need to be smart here. We need to be agile. We need to be prepared to test possibilities so we can find out what works. The best changes are the ones that can be implemented easily and so and quickly so we can rapidly learn if they work or not. So spread the risk of change by running lots of little tests. Host an online coffee morning. If it works, do another. Great. Run a charity auction over video conference. If it works, do it bigger next time. Replace some in-store collection boxes with contactless payment terminals. If it works, get some more. It's like, it's like when you go for an eye test and the Optician, no, that's not the optician, ophthalmologist, I think they're called. The people that do the eye test. They make you wear those, those, those crazy glasses and, and they, they find the right prescription for your eyes by trying one lens and then, and then another. Is it better? Is it worse? And some lenses improve your vision, some make it worse. But in a very short space of time, after doing enough little tests, they find the perfect corrective treatment for your eyesight. It's test and learn. Test and learn. That's how we evolve. And Coca-Cola gives out a brilliant annual Celebrate Failure Award to one lucky employee. The winner is the person who, tries, who tried something new and frankly crashed and burned in the most spectacular fashion. But more importantly, they, they didn't just fail, they learned. They emerged from the wreckage a better person. They, they shared their story and they helped others to avoid similar mistakes, gifting them the courage to try something new for themselves. In the charitable sector, Many of you will face similar challenges. Perhaps as a collective, you can help each other through the difficult months ahead by sharing your learnings more openly. It's far more efficient to make a mistake once than it is to make it once inside every charitable organization. And just as Coca-Cola does, I invite you to celebrate your learnings, not just your successes. That's how we make change a way of life. The true measure of a successful day of work is knowing how much you learned to ready you for what's coming tomorrow. I'd like to invite you today to see the changes and challenges we face as wonderful opportunities to stop lazily repeating what we've always done. Maybe this is just a much needed moment of recalibration, as some people have said, where we have a chance to rethink what we do and to come up with better ways to pursue and deliver our purpose. It's like that time your teacher or boss told you you had to work harder to raise your game. It felt rough, didn't it? Maybe a little unfair, but you know, you learned from that experience and you came out the other side a stronger person. One of the greatest truths in life is that we humans tend to massively overestimate the significance of events happening today. And for all the horrors of the pandemic, 
Some years from now, few of us will remember today's short-term anxieties and problems. We will, God willing, adapt and evolve and move on with our lives just as we've always done. And similarly, a few years from now, we won't remember the strange ways our organization functioned before the pandemic. We've, the fear that we felt when this change suddenly happened and was thrust upon us, it won't haunt us for long. We'll get over it. We are, all of us, ready or ready to cope with everything we need to do. All that's left to do is to go do it. I wish you every success as you reinvent the work of your charity. I encourage you to joyfully abandon outdated ways of working, to share your experiences, and to race towards new, exciting possibilities. It won't be easy. You've got this. Stay happy. Stay healthy. Be awesome. Lovely. From Alistair Frost. Do you, do you know, I thought my mic was off. So it, it's not. So that's good. Um, thank you very much to Alistair. That was great. Um, I, was, I was totally into that. I was really into that. Actually, every session today I've been really into it. You know, sometimes things are kind of hit and miss, but I've been really, really into that. Um, so thank you very much, Alistair Frost. Do check out uh, Alistair at alistairspeaks.com. I, I saw him uh, chilling out in the chat room below. He was he was there earlier. I'm not sure if he's there now, but um, but seek him out. Um, and I will say that about all our speakers. They've all been really generous with their time. They've all kind of welcomed questions, welcomed other people coming in. Um, and so, you know, if there's something you want to delve into a bit deeper, uh, especially if uh, as you review the downloads, as you review the um, recordings, uh, do reach out to the speakers because everyone's been really good about it. And if they, you know, if they're not able to um, to get back to you, they're not going to get back to you because you know we all have stuff on. So do make the most of that. Right, we are coming to the end. Uh, very shortly, what I'm going to do is I'm going to in introduce or I'm going to invite uh, Nikki Bell. Uh, the co-founder of Fundraising Everywhere. She's going to come in with me. She's over in room one. She's just wrapping up the closing plenary over there, which is also Alistair. Well done, Alistair, for speaking in two rooms at once. That's pretty impressive. Um, so shortly after she finishes up, I'm going to bring her on here, and we're just going to have a little chat with you guys um, and start to wrap it up. I just want to remind you. Uh, actually, no, let me just um, let me talk to you about the speakers, uh, the sponsors. I just want to bring the sponsors up um, and just say once again, Thank you so much to them. Um, let me see if I can find them. Where are they? Here they are. Um, so yeah, so obviously Salesforce have been really, really um, good to us around this, um, been really helpful in getting this and worked so hard themselves to bring this out. Um, you know, I criticize companies a lot, um, but Salesforce are one that with, with the programs they put into their employees volunteering, with the, the money they contribute and with the stuff they do like this, um, you know, I actually think like they their CSR, they seem to get it when it comes to CSR. Um, so we're really grateful uh, for them. Uh, and then obviously like the Resource Alliance, Institute of Fundraising, the Fundraising Association of Austria, the Chronicle of Philanthropy, um, Third Sector Magazine, EFA, that's the European Fundraising Association, Michelle Flynn Coaching, Charity Digital, um, and then that first international face-to-face -face fundraising congress. Um, and thank you to everyone um, who contributed material and thank you to everyone who, who came for this. You know, we had, um, last I checked, it was about 4,000 people registered. Um, which is the big, obviously the biggest event we've had on our platform, um, and people were still registering um, when they when they went through. Um, so it's been it's been um, it's been really good. Um, so thank you very much for coming through, uh, coming into our um, onto our production, uh, onto the event that we put on in Salesforce, and um, thank you for everyone doing it. I hope you've benefited from it. I hope you've gotten something out of it and you've enjoyed it um, because we've certainly enjoyed um, putting it on. Um, although it was really stressful, and and I'll say this, I'll say this about Nikki before she comes into the room so that you know it's genuine. Um, but Nikki has just worked ass off on this to get it all ready um, for the last um, last week, really. You know, she just pulled this all together in a week with some help from Salesforce, with some uh, help from me. Um, but obviously, she does most of the work. Um, and so just a you know really huge appreciation for Nikki. Do seek her out. She's on Twitter as Charity Nikki, at Charity Nikki, um, or go to charitynikki.com. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to run fundraising everywhere with her, and so we're going to be hosting a lot of events coming up. Um, and if you want help with your event, um, then, then do come on. Um, but actually, I'm going to bring Nikki onto um, the screen now.
Oh, whoops. Now I'm going to take her out of the wrong screen. So let's see what she's up to. We're going to sneak in and see what she's saying to her guests. To inspire yeah. fundraisers. I'm looking at Simon because he's just in took me room. off the screen. Stay in your own room. Know, um, so thank you, everybody she's who has joined us um, for today's right. conference. It's so been epic. Right. 4,000 people have joined us online today. Huge around. thanks yeah. to Salesforce for making it possible. Together, I'm gonna now, we're gonna now try oh. this. Hello. Am I, I think I'm in Nikki's room now. I can't hear you. I can't hear you either. You can't hear me. Okay, do you want All to right. just go? Let, uh, at okay, least we we'll got a glimpse off. of each we'll other. Off. It didn't work. Work. We tried. We tried. There you go, Alistair. Like you've been we hanging out in my room all day, then um, you've missed an opportunity. Already. That's what you could have been listening to and looking at instead of me. Um, so there you go. Anyway, let me let me begin to wrap this up. I'm just going to tell you what we have to do. I, I want to say um, um, a huge thank you to Salesforce again. Rob, who's been our main point of contact from salesforce.org, he's going to be over with Nikki now. Nikki's going to have a little chat with him. So do pop across to, to room one if you want to see Rob. Um, but I want to say a personal thank you uh, to Rob for everything he's done for us and 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 how, how involved and how engaged he's been with this. Um, so that's been awesome. Um, I want to thank all of our speakers who have been fantastic. I've got some amazing sound bites. And even in that last session with Alistair where he's talking about recalibrating, I feel like that's just kind of ticked a box with me. And it's like, yeah, we just have to kind of like readjust this as humans have always done. And do, do you know what I was reminded of? Is that, are there any Beatles fans watching this? Any Beatles fans listening? Oh, look, people are saying they could hear us both. Okay, so we couldn't hear each other. Ah, yeah, okay, I get it. See, when you're doing new things technically, you like plan it all out in your head and you're like, okay, that's gonna work. And then it, it doesn't work. Um, and then you figure out, so you see, this is it. Try your virtual things. You'll mess it up like I just did, um, but next time we'll know and we can get me and Nikki on it. Um, so that's a good, but thank you for letting me know that you could hear us both. Okay, if you want to carry on the conversation, we have lots of events coming over, com coming up. We have always open networking rooms, uh, video networking rooms. I'm going to pop into them um, after this and see who's around. So if you go to fundraisingeverywhere.com slash rooms, fundraisingeverywhere.com slash rooms, you'll see our two open networking rooms. So if you want to go chat to fundraisers, I'll pop in there in a second and I'll say hello to anyone anyone who's there. Um, but I hang out in there sometimes. Sometimes when I'm working, I just have it on in the background. So if you ever get lonely, if you ever feel isolated, if you ever feel totally bummed out, um, then do come come in and see if we're around or, or set up a call with someone else. I always feel better when I chat to people, you know, people who I look up to and people who I have love for. And um, I always feel better from connecting with people. So so we have to work a little bit harder to connect with people in this situation. Um, but at the same time, we have to work less hard, if you know what I mean. So that's, that's um, really good. Um, so coming up, uh, within 24 hours, you'll get an email about all your downloads and about all the um, recorded sessions. Uh, and what I would say is um, go ahead and um, check that out. That'll be coming within 24 hours of the finish here. You'll get all the sessions in room one and room two and the plenaries uh, that we had today. You won't get the opening plenary, I'm sorry, but you'll get everything else. Um, you'll get that closing plenary, you'll get the two streams, you'll get loads of downloads. Uh, most of them will be available this weekend um, and then we'll, we'll have some more coming uh, across to you next week. Uh, so you'll continue to get them. Please do stay in touch with Fundraising Everywhere. Get on the fundraisingeverywhere.com mailing list um, and we'll update you with other events coming up. We've got things like social events and karaoke and stuff like that. Um, we'd love to have you at them. A lot of them are free um, and the ones that, you, that we uh, charge for are pretty cheap. Um, so our big conference in May, we have a big conference in May and November. In May, it's only 55 euro, which is about 60 US dollars or about 50 pounds. Um, and there's, there's, that's five days worth of material. Uh, you get speakers like uh, Dan Pallotta, uh, Scott Harrison, who's the CEO of Charity Water, um, the CEO, Asha Curran, CEO of Giving Tuesday is going to be with us. Um, so we've got loads of speakers from all over the world. Uh, you are very welcome to come to that. I hope you will do. You will come to that. Um, so check out fundraisingeverywhere.com to buy your tickets or become a member. Members pay 20 euros per month and they get access to all of the events for free. Um, including the festival and stuff like that. But they also get access to myself and Nikki for, we have private members clinics and private members events. Um, and you get invited to those if you become a member. So do check out fundraisingeverywhere.com for everything we've um, we've got lined up and what we've got planned. Uh, do you know what I'm gonna do now? I'm gonna try and pop over to, to Nikki's room and I'm gonna like just break in. 
Um, and so I'll go over to Nikki's room. I'll be in room one if you want to follow me over there. And then after that, I'm going to the networking rooms, which are at fundraisingeverywhere.com slash rooms. I'll be I'll be around there. And then I have to go get dinner because I'm starving. Um, and I have like chores to do and stuff. I've, I've been doing this all week. So um, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's been it's been really magical to see so many people from all over chatting in the in the um, comments box. Really appreciate it. Um, but that's the end now, so I'm going to say goodbye. Thank you.